I would hear him saying all these nice
consent request. That email address has been provided to your staff. I would remind all members that they must verbally request unanimous consent separately from sending the document or written UC request to the email address. Our first order of business today is consideration of the Labor, Health, Human Services, and Education Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2023. I first want to take a moment to recognize my partner and friend, Ranking Member Cole. Unfortunately, Tom is not with us today. He's recovering from COVID, but we wish you very good health and a quick and easy recovery. And I want to say a thank you to you for your dedication, commitment to the American people, to your constituents, and to those served by this bill is admirable. You and I both believe deeply in the power of this institution to get things done and to be able to make a difference. And I would just say to you, uh, Congressman Cole, that you know why you came to serve. Um, and while we may differ in our approach to doing so, it has been a pleasure to work with you over the past several, several years. We have passed bills, and we have had some outstanding accomplishments. Let me also take a moment to thank Ranking Member Granger for your partnership, your leadership, your commitment to the work of this committee as we make sure, as you help to make sure, that it works for all Americans wherever they are in this country. I also want to thank my colleagues on the subcommittee on both sides of the aisle. Included in this bill are the critical priorities that will continue to improve the lives of working and middle class families. Not possible without you, all of you. Your passion, your advocacy would also not have been possible without the nearly 16,000 requests that the Labor HHS subcommittee has received from Democrats and Republicans. Especially impressive are the more than 1,300 community project funding requests we included in the bill. They impact, they impact the lives of working middle class families. They are investments that go directly to our constituents and the, and the projects that matter to them. I'm proud of the bill builds on historic investments that we made in 2022. Um, uh, we know that uh, uh, Americans are looking for a lifeline, that pay is not keeping up with inflation. Hardworking Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Women are having trouble re-entering the workforce because they struggle to find good childcare. And good employment and education opportunities for people, uh, they often feel unattainable for so many. And this bill, gives them the lifeline they are looking for. We held nine hearings. Uh, we discussed the need for sustained investments in social, emotional, and cognitive development of our students. We heard how best to address the teacher shortage that threatens student learning and success. And as we support Americans in every stage of their lives, we consider how to strengthen the independence, well-being, and the health of older Americans. Um, we met to discuss the President's budget for labor, for education, for the NIH and, uh, and, 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 and other areas. Um, uh, that uh, we heard directly from our colleagues um, about the areas of interest to them, and we heard directly from as many people as possible on their uh, priorities with outside groups. Um, the, bill, uh, the bill that I present this morning provides $242.1 billion uh, in investments. It's an increase of 13 percent above 2022. It supports early childhood education and child care. $7.2 billion for the Child Care and Development Block Grant, $12.4 billion for Head Start, $350 million for preschool development grants. We fund greater educational opportunity, $20.5 billion for Title I grants to local educational agencies. We strengthen federal support for public education and for high poverty schools. Strengthen K through 12 education, we support babies, children, young adults with disabilities with $17.8 billion for special education programs. Um, education is a great equalizer, but only when it is affordable and accessible, which is why we commit ourselves to historically underserved students. The bill provides minority-serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, and other uh, under-resourced institutions at $1.1 billion to serve its students. Uh, Post-secondary education includes a $500 increase to the maximum Pell Grant, the foundation of our student aid system. Uh, we looked to try to enhance our workforce, $11.8 billion for employment and training. Uh, we doubled the funding for strengthening community college training grants. 
and dramatically increase funding for registered apprenticeships. Uh, proud of the programs created uh, from this committee, it needs a growing demand for skilled workers, uh, and it includes uh, those with significant barriers. It helps them to find good employment opportunities. We also protect our workers' paychecks and benefits and the health and safety of their workplace. Uh, it's $2.2 billion for worker protection agencies, $319 million for the National Labor Relations Board to ensure that workers have a voice in their workplace and to protect their rights to collective bargaining. Um, we provide $139 million uh, for the International Labor Affairs Bureau, ILAP, to protect against the most abusive labor practices uh, abroad. Um, uh, the maintaining a strong workforce also requires investments in public health. Uh, in the past two years, it, it, uh, we have taught us anything that making health care accessible and affordable keeps us all safer. Therefore, we have done $10.5 billion for the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It's a $2 billion increase to help them build their public health uh, infrastructure, modernize public health data, develop emergency preparedness programs, strengthen the public health workforce initiative. At the same time, we make investments in uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration, $9.6 billion for HRSA. Um, and there we expand contraceptive care, maternal and child health, school-based health centers, behavioral health workforce training, and ending the HIV, uh, and supporting ending the HIV initiative. We strengthen the commitment to biomedical research, strong funding for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we provide the NIH with $47.5 billion. It's an increase of $2.5 billion. Uh, we also include efforts for the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, Alzheimer's Disease, HIV Prevention, Treatment, Universal Flu Vaccine uh, uh, Development. We also provide funding to deal with urgent health care crises, maternal health, opioid misuse crisis, um, and we look to try to reduce the unacceptable ethnic and racial health disparities that in impact underserved communities with an increase of $100 million for that research. ARPA-H, that's $2.75 billion to accelerate the pace of scientific uh, uh, breakthroughs. Um, mental health, which was a big issue uh, for the, for the uh, subcommittee, we increased funding for substance use and mental health services, uh, money to SAMHSA by $2.6 billion dollars. That includes the 988 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, mental health resources for children, um, and uh, recovery support services and opioid prevention and treatment. We address gun violence by increasing funding for gun violence prevention research at CDC and the NIH. Um, the, um, uh, in, in terms of public health emergency, the bill strengthens our support for women's rights, women's health, and expands access to reproductive care, especially some of our most vulnerable, instead of some of our vulnerable women. Uh, it eliminates the discriminatory Hyde Amendment, provides $500 million, an increase of $214 million for Title X family planning programs. We will continue to advance equal treatment for women, even as the Supreme Court um, ruling tries to take control of women's health care decisions out of our hands. Um, I want to conclude by thanking the staff for their hard work. From the majority side, a thank you to Stephen Stegleiter and your team, Jennifer Kama, Jackie Kilroy, Lori Mignon, Philip Tizani, Cassie Bowles, Kaya Green, Alana Paul, and Robert Baron Saka. On the minority side, a thank you to Susan Ross and Catherine Salmon, and the staff in my office, my personal office, Becky Saley, Jack Rayburn, Caitlin Peruccio, Marie Gualtieri. With that, I'd like to again say thank you to Ranking Member Cole and uh, 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 yield to him for opening remarks. Mr. Cole, you're muted. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Okay. I think I'm unmuted. Is that correct? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, it, uh, obvious, I wish I were there with you, but frankly, all of you should be glad that I'm not. This is the last day of my uh, quarantine in my spacious 600 square foot apartment in Alexandria, so uh, 
I'm looking forward to this evening uh, with a great deal of anticipation. I want to begin, Madam Chair, by reciprocating your very gracious personal remarks. Uh, it has been a pleasure to work with you and your staff and your team and, frankly, our colleagues both sides of the aisle uh, over these, uh, frankly, many years now together. And I'm proud of what we've been able to do in partnership and look forward to, uh, for us being able to continue to work together as we go through this process. Madam Chair, I want to congratulate you again for your hard work uh, on the Chairman's Mark. As I said last week, I want to thank you for incorporating so many of our shared priorities in this bill. You and I agree on the need for continued investment in biomedical research, public health infrastructure, and preparing the nation for the next pandemic. We also agree on the importance of funding early education, special education, and programs like TRIO and Gear Up, which help first-generation students complete college and change the trajectory of their lives. Thank you for recognizing the importance of these shared priorities. You've also been fair in including community project funding requested by members of both sides of the aisle. For that, I thank you as well. Despite these many areas of agreement, I will be opposing this bill uh, in it, as presented today. Right now, Americans are experiencing the highest inflation uh, <clears throat> rates and consumer prices seen in four decades. Even more concerning, a recent report published by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office found that this inflation is unfortunately here to stay well into 2023, despite Democratic claim that uh, it was only going to be temporary. Additionally, a severe worker shortage still exists. In fact, according to the latest Bureau of Labor Statistics job opening and labor uh, turnover survey, small businesses are uh, still looking uh, to fill roughly 5.5 million job openings, nearly two job openings per one job seeker. Americans are struggling to feed their families, fill up their gas tanks, and pay their rent or mortgages. Yet the Biden administration and Democrats continue to ignore this crisis and fuel the inflation fire by proposing more wasteful and out-of-control spending. Unemployment was incentivized for too long by the Biden administration, and the government spent too much on things unrelated to corona, the coronavirus response. Yet this bill continues to exacerbate our economic problems by pumping billions of dollars in additional spending into programs that cannot absorb it and creating new controversial programs of dubious value that will be of little, uh, that will be, that will do little beyond adding layers of bureaucracy at federal agencies. Our economy cannot sustain this. Additionally, the bill once again removes long-standing bipartisan amendments that have been uh, protected taxpayer dollars from funding abortion or forcing health care professionals from participating in abortion. As my colleagues know, these protections need to be reinstated in this bill to move for, for this bill to move forward. The majority of Americans support them. And my colleagues acknowledged this when this language was retained just a few months ago when we completed work on the omnibus package for fiscal year 2022. It was the right thing to do then, and it's the right thing to do now. I hope my colleagues will adopt an amendment that is co-sponsored by every Republican on this committee to reinstate these policies today so that this bill can continue through the process uh, with this issue already resolved. Finally, this bill contains many other policy and spending provisions that I find objectionable and that will need to be modified to get to a final deal. I'm hopeful that the same uh, that some of these issues can be addressed through the amendment process today. We have a number of issues that, that will be raised by members on our side of the aisle and are helpful. In closing, while this bill does fund many good things, I will be opposing it today. The price tag is too high. The bill contains many poison pill policy writers uh, finding uh, funding for unauthorized programs and uh, frankly bows to a liberal agenda that is out of step with the American people. I want to thank the gentlelady and her staff uh, again for all their hard work. And I do pledge to work with you in good faith as the year continues. Working together, you and I have passed this bill through Congress and avoided a continuing resolution time and time again, seven in a row, if memory serves me right. We've been able to pass it 
no matter which party was in the majority, no matter who was president, no matter who controlled the Senate. I hope we can do that again. It's my sincere hope uh, that as we work through this process, Madam Chair, we will find consensus as we have so often in the past. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman, and now I recognize Ranking Member Granger for her opening remarks. Madam Chair, thank you for yielding. First, I want to thank the Chair and Ranking Member for their work on the Fiscal Year 2023 Bill for Labor, Health, and Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies. I also want to acknowledge the committee staff for their efforts. While this bill funds many important programs, it is based on a funding level that passed the House without Republican support again. In addition to my concerns about excessive spending, the bill includes controversial policies that I strongly oppose. First, this bill once again drops longstanding bipartisan language that prevents federal dollars, tax dollars, from being used to pay for abortions. It also removes, removes language carried for the last 17 years that protects American doctors and nurses from being forced to participate in abortions. In addition to the abortion provisions, there are many other highly controversial items included in the bill, such as language relating to labor law, excessive spending on new unauthorized programs, and provisions relating to immigration enforcement. For these reasons, my Republican colleagues and I strongly oppose this bill. Until the pro-life protections have been rest restored and the other controversial issues have been addressed, we will not be able to vote for it. Just a few short months ago, we were able to come to an agreement and enact the fiscal year 2022 appropriations bills that continued longstanding riders and dropped new controversial provisions. I'm hopeful we will be able to do that same thing this year. Madam Chair, I look forward to finding common ground and finishing our work in a timely manner. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the general lady. Uh, before I ask about others, I couldn't get blankets, but we have hand warmers. So if anybody <laughs> needs a hand warmer, please, or we can get them distributed if anybody would like them. So get the staff to distribute hand warmers. You know, let's try to be warm during the day. <laughs> Are there other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Ms. Roybal Allard? Madam Chair, I rise in support of this bill, and I commend uh, you and Ranking Member Cole on an outstanding FY23 Labor HHS education mark. It has truly been an honor to serve on this subcommittee for almost 20 years with so many dedicated public servants who responded to the needs of the most vulnerable among us. Representative DeLauro and Representative Cole, whether as chair or ranking member, you are the most resolute champions of this people's bill, and it has been my privilege to serve with you. Over the years, you both have been very generous in funding so many of my priorities, including robust funding for my Stop Underage Drinking Act, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives programs, and nursing education. And I thank you both for your gracious inclusion of my breastfeeding and chimpanzee language in this year's manager's amendment. I'm also grateful this bill includes my request for the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division to produce a report on work-related injuries and deaths of children working in agriculture and for the National Academy of Science to study the health impact of pesticide use on children working in agriculture. These are important studies because our children in agriculture are the only children not protected by our nation's child labor laws. This results in these children being exposed to dangerous pesticides and working with dangerous equipment with no restrictions on the maximum number of hours they work. A GAO study I commissioned with Chairwoman DeLauro found that 50% of work-related child fatalities occur in agriculture. And the National Children's Center for Rural and Agricultural Health and Safety found that every, 30, every day, 33 children employed on U.S. farms are injured, and it estimates that every three days, a child dies working on a farm. The reports requested in this bill are an important first step toward addressing these tragedies. Madam Chair, I also thank you for your remarkable commitment to strengthening our public health system. This mark will bolster our public health infrastructure, data surveillance capabilities and workforce, 
and make significant investments in immunization systems, climate change, safe motherhood, and the elimination of health disparities. The FY23 bill also supports many maternity caucus priorities my colleague Jamie Herrera Butler and I have fought for. This includes investments in midwifery education, maternal mental health, stillbirth prevention, and an interagency committee to coordinate HHS maternal health activities and promote optimal birth outcomes. There are also significant investments to support our teachers, parents, and students after a devastating three years of the COVID-19 pandemic. My district is home to the highest percentage of DREAMers and DACA recipients in our country. DACA recipients are among our finest researchers, military personnel, entrepreneurs, teachers, nurses, doctors, and the essential workers who were so critical at the height of our COVID pandemic. Language in this bill recognizes their talent and the valuable contributions DACA recipients make to our country and our economy. In closing, let me say how amazing the last two decades on this subcommittee have been, and it's been an honor to have worked with so many conscientious, conscientious colleagues from both sides of the aisle, including on this full committee. I also extend my sincere appreciation and thanks to all the outstanding Labor HHS subcommittee staff for your good humor, your responsiveness, and many long days and late nights of hard work to produce such a strong appropriations bill. I yield back. Just listening to you, Ms. Roybal Allard uh, tells us about what we are going to miss in terms of your commitment and your dedication. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Mr. Valadeo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the committee for including language in the manager's amendment to highlight the importance of trafficking prevention activities within the Department of Education. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal enterprises. All of my local law enforcement agencies have voiced their concerns over this escalation in disturbing criminal activity. To quote one law enforcement official in my district, selling humans is quickly becoming more profitable for gangs than selling guns or drugs. Tragically, many of these victims are just children when they fall prey to the physical, psychological, and emotional coercion from traffickers. I have children in high school and junior high. In the stories and statistics I'm hearing from law enforcement terrify me. So much of our life is virtual, and today's hybrid learning environments have only increased our children's online presence, putting them all at greater risk of encountering predators. It's unfortunate that these are conversations we need to have with our children, but educating our youth to recognize and safely avoid exploit exploitation is a critical tra uh, trafficking prevention tool. I applaud the committee's efforts to address this critical issue, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and the Department of Education to further their human trafficking prevention initiatives. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to take a moment to thank uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and all of the members of the subcommittee for their strong support for three important issues in the FY23 Labor, Health, and Human Service Education and Related Agencies Appropriations Act. First, I'd like to thank you for the tremendous mark for Job Corps, a $50 million increase over the previous year. I'm the co-chair of the Friends of Job Corps Congressional Caucus, along with my colleague from Kentucky, Representative Brett Guthrie. Uh, we proudly led the Job Corps um, appropriations, dear colleague, earlier in the spring. And the appropriations letter and the funding level showcased the broad bipartisan support for Job Corps and its students, staff, and the various campuses. I'm fortunate to have the Turner Job Corps campus in my district in Albany, Georgia, which is one of 121 active campuses around the country. Uh, I've seen firsthand the impact that the Turner Job Corps Center has made on thousands of my constituents. Uh, and in addition to the Job Corps program, I want to applaud the subcommittee for its strong but necessary support of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and its public health programs. Uh, our experience with COVID-19 over the last two years reminds us that to avoid the substantial human and economic costs associated 
of current large-scale emergencies and future public health concerns, we must be willing to make sustainable, long-term investments in our public health system. I'd be remiss if I failed to point out uh, that the CDC also is one of the crown jewels of the Georgia economy. The CDC has almost 10,000 employees in Georgia, making it one of Georgia's top 15 employee, employers. 60% uh, of CDC employees have a master's degree or higher. And if the CBC were a public, a public company, its annual operating budget would rank 107 on the Fortune 500 list and would place it among the top five largest companies in Georgia. CDC also has 5.3 million square feet of office and lab space in the state, and it uh, purchases $218 million uh, worth of uh, goods and services from Georgia businesses each year. Finally, I want to thank you for your help on trying to communicate to HHS the necessity for low-income medical patients uh, to have alternative non-emergency medical transportation uh, to life-sustaining uh, uh, dialysis treatments. Uh, these patients are losing access to ambulance transportation under CMS innovation model, uh, but the agency is doing nothing to make sure they have an alternative ride. I have been working uh, very hard uh, with um, on the issue for several years, and I'm very disappointed that the agency has not responded with any action to my letter uh, to the secretary, nor to the report language in the FY22 House bill or the statement of the manager just a few months ago. Of course, dialysis patients uh, very rarely are so sick or frail that they need an ambulance, but they need appropriate alternative transportation. Uh, the patients affected are three and a half times more likely to be African-American or Hispanic uh, than all Medicare patients. Uh, we now, of course, uh, all recognize uh, the vital necessity of transportation as a key non-medical social determinant of health. So again, I applaud the chair, the ranking member, and the entire subcommittee uh, for your continued support of Job Corps, the CDC, and the non-emergency medical transportation. I look forward to the bill's passage by the full committee and I thank you and I yield back. Ms. Lee, I'm gonna, let me just say this to you. I, I know I want people to have the opportunity to speak and say what they want, et cetera. If we could uh, just keep in mind uh, that we're trying to get through two bills today and I know people are trying to get out as well, and I'll keep that in mind for myself as well. So, I promise. Ms. Lee, you're recognized. Good. I'll be very quick. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Let, let me thank you, Rep, uh, Ranking Member Granger, and our subcommittee member, uh, Mr. Cole, for your leadership in putting this bill together. Given uh, the current threats to reproductive rights for women across the country, as co-chair of the Pro-Choice Caucus, I want to thank the chair for once again removing the Hyde Amendment in this bill. I'm proud to support the various provisions in the bill that ensure that contraceptives are accessible, affordable, and covered for all women. And I keep reminding you, systemic racism is woven into every crisis that we face today. The Fiscal 23 Labor Age Bill responds by providing $10 million to address the structural racism in public health under a National Center on Anti-Racism and Health Equity, working with community-based organizations. The bill also provides $10 million for the development of a patient advocacy program to fill the gaps in coordination across the inpatient and outpatient care continuum. Madam Chair, I want to just say a couple of things about this, because you were such a loving caregiver um, for your mother. I was a caregiver for my mother. I have a 101-year-old year, aunt now who I'm the primary caregiver for. The gaps in the healthcare system in terms of the continuum of, continuum of care and how certain um, aspects of one's care just gets dropped through a system that is not coordinated is, could be deadly and could have very negative health outcomes. So this $10 million for the development of a patient advocacy pilot program is extremely important. Because for many of you who know the system, the healthcare system, you know with your loved ones, 
you have to stay on top of every single day, every single aspect of their care. So hopefully this will begin to help close some of those gaps. Also, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for adding the language as it relates to HIV and AIDS that uh, really put through now increasing access to uh, PrEP, which are support services that we need to achieve an AIDS-free generation by 2030. And also the Minority AIDS Initiative, which Congresswoman Waters, myself, started in 1998, actually. Uh, thank you for the various cannabis provisions in the bill that allow researchers to conduct research. And also for the Children's Interagency Coordinating Council and the inclusion of a $2 million for a pilot program for a food as medicine pilot project. Thank you again, Madam Chair, for a bill really that addresses some of the gaps in our country as it relates to black and brown children. Uh, and looking at the school to prison pipeline and what this means for black and Latino students and also for investments in the teacher training program. So thank you again. This is the people's bill again. And uh, I think the provisions of this bill represent that we truly are working for the people. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, ma'am. Act together here, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very appreciative of your leadership and your passion on this comprehensive bill that is before us. Just as the Biden administration has reignited the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, I'm thrilled to see that this bill prioritizes cancer prevention, screening, and early detection. This bill increases funding for the NCI and continues to support survivorship programs within the NIH and CDC to one day eradicate this disease once and for all, in addition to prioritizing research into mRNA for cancer vaccines. As a breast cancer survivor, I'm thrilled that the bill includes a vital funding increase to almost $9 million for Early Act activities, an initiative I was privileged to pass into law to promote and fund breast cancer awareness and grant funding for young and at-risk women. It also continues a moratorium and on the outdated and harmful USPSTF recommendations on access to breast cancer screening, mammography, and prevention through 2025, as well as addressing coverage for digital modalities, more advanced screening techniques that help detect cancer early. The bill also includes language directed at the USPSTF's shortcomings, addressing the need for comprehensive reform to ensure the recommendations further, pu further public health for all Americans and address health inequities. And I welcome anyone to join me in looking further into the USPSTF's deficiencies. After cancer screenings fell dr dramatically during the pandemic, I'm very proud that this bill increases funding for the Alcee L. Hastings Program for Advanced Cancer Screening in Underserved Communities by $10 million. The HERSA, this HRSA initiative recently launched to assist health centers increase access and address barriers to cancer screenings in partnership with NCI designated centers. Mr. Heads Hastings was a cherished friend and mentor, and I'm proud to see this program save lives in underserved communities. The bill also encourages the NIH to boost polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS, research, which affects up to 15% of women and is a major risk factor for cardiometabolic conditions. Additionally, the bill provides $10 million for Holocaust survivors and helps address their exposure to traumatic events, including emotional and psychological harm due to historical violence and oppression, systemic abuse, and other injustices. This is a rapidly dwindling population that is extremely elderly, and providing for their care is critical. Madam Chair, this bill also aggressively protects our youth with increased funding for the CDC's Office of Smoking and Health, which combat the e-cigarette epidemic, an important increase that reinforces the FDA ban on jewel products and nicotine regulation efforts. The bill also directs $2 million to drowning prevention efforts, which for one to four-year-olds is the leading, though preventable, cause of unintentional death in this country. With resources and education, we can add layers of life-saving protection when supervision lapses. And I'm also glad this bill reaffirms our right as members to conduct oversight through access to ORR facilities for migrant children. And as the next year's school year approaches, I'm proud that we continue to push forward with my initiative on school climate and safety. It will enable states and local districts to build and implement evidence-based plans to tackle a range of issues from bullying, seclusion, and restraint to school violence, including gun violence. And finally, Madam Chair, in closing, I want to thank you for protecting women's basic rights with this bill. The funding in this bill actually protects women and provides education, opportunity, and fulfillment without erecting barriers to care. When women are supported and empowered, our families and the entire nation are stronger. Sadly, too many forget this basic truth. I thank the chair for her work, and I look forward to seeing this bill come to the floor, and I yield back the balance of my time. 
Ms. Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank you and Ranking Member Cole, um, as well as the subcommittee staff for all of your hard work on this incredibly important bill. Um, what I'd like to focus on is social determinants of health, the factors that are in all of our everyday lives that impact our health outcomes. In the congressional district that I serve, uh, the community that lives in the 61605 zip code in the city of Peoria, um, it's a vibrant and a beautiful community filled with vibrant and, com and, and uh, beautiful people, but they face these challenges that um, in this zip code that is considered the most distressed zip code in America. Uh, the families there live in a food desert, which means they have problems finding fresh fruits and vegetables uh, on their, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, they lack many of the adequate transportation needs that are easy for the rest of us. And even though this community is one of the oldest in, in Peoria, many of its, its uh, neighborhoods lack the basic amenities, like things like sidewalks, um, which allow their children to be able to walk uh, to uh, a, a neighbor's house or, be, or be, to be able to walk um, to go visit friends. So it's, it's why I uh, wanted to make sure that I fought to get $2 million in community project funding just for sidewalk installation in this zip code. Um, and the upgrades that, that they need. And the committee and um, Madam Chair, you were nice enough and um, uh, responsible and uh, res uh, respectful enough to put that in the bill. So the struggles of this 61605 um, zip code that, um, that they face is, um, you know, it, we see this in other communities, in rural and in urban communities, and it's way too common. So for far too long, there hasn't been that coordination to address these issues at the federal, state, and local level. And that's really been a disservice to our communities. Um, it's really why I've been so proud that we've been able to work together over the past two years to be able to develop grant funding through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to address social determinants of health. Um, this year's appropriation bill allocates $92 million in grants for social determinants of health. So our communities, whether they're uh, rural towns or big cities, can have the tools at their disposal to be able to develop tailored programs to lift up their most vulnerable populations. This funding represents a critical investment in addressing health disparities, giving local communities the opportunities they need to grow and prosper. Um, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like also to express my appreciation for you, Ranking Member Cole, and the hardworking staff in producing the Labor Age Appropriations Bill. As a member of the subcommittee, I am proud to support this bill that prioritizes the kitchen table issues faced by Americans every single day. Just one of those issues addressed in this bill is childcare. This bill provides almost $20 billion in relief for families struggling to find and afford care. This is a struggle in districts that are red, blue, purple, and everything in between, urban, suburban, and rural. This funding will go a long way to helping families find those early learning and care programs that enable them to get back to work and allow their children to thrive. This funding includes nearly $600 million for a cost of living adjustment for the Head Start workforce. This is a critical step in our ongoing work to improve early childhood educator compensation and ensure early learning care programs have the resources they need to recruit and retain staff. Across the country, Head Start programs and child care providers are facing a severe labor shortage. The lack of staff is closing classrooms and adding to already long wait lists for families. I look forward to working with my colleagues to keep this momentum up and invest in new solutions that can address this critical issue. Again, thank you for your support and partnership on all of the issues represented in this bill. I urge my colleagues to support it and I yield back. Ms. Watson-Coleman. 
Good morning, and thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Delora, for recognizing me. I want to thank you and I want and Ranking Member Cole and the entire staff on both sides for all the hard work um, in this bill, which I wholeheartedly support. I am so grateful to continue serving as a member on this subcommittee because it is committed to protecting families, workers, and our most vulnerable populations. And I'd like to acknowledge the hard work that went into drafting this year's bill and the inclusion of many of my priorities. I'm pleased to see that the FY 2023 bill provides 13% increase over the FY 22 levels, making targeted investments in children, education, health equity, and workforce programs. I wanna highlight the inclusion of many of my priorities in this bill included in the FY23 bill and report our programs that impact my district and the country, including recognizing the need to provide social and emotional support for COVID-19 uh, bereaved children, continuing to improve diversity at the NIH and address the disparities in this, this workforce and grantees, prioritizing youth suicide and mental health, particularly for black youth whose suicide rate is increasing faster than any other racial ethnic group, as well as including $30 million to increase the number of health service psychologists to provide services to the underserved populations. Acknowledging the critical shortage of quality school-based mental health services and $200 million for training and reintegration activities for justice-involved populations. With the inclusion of the community project funding request this year, over 3 million included in this bill will directly fund important projects across my district. They include funding for pediatric health resources, communities burdened by food insecurity, mental health services, training and employment services, and mentoring services. Once again, I wanna thank the chair and the ranking member for, for the working with me to get my priorities into the bill. And specifically, I wanna thank the chairwoman for working with Rep. Lee and myself to ensure access to PrEP. This is truly a statement of our values. The measured increases to these programs were done thoughtfully to make a real difference and uplift the lives of the people who need our help the most. While there are significant advances towards equity, there's still more work to be done and I plan to continue working with my colleagues as we move forward and deliver real results for the people in my district and in this country. With that, I thank you. I look forward to supporting this bill and I yield back. That, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may borrow an expression from Mr. Newhouse. My, 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 this is one terrific bill. <laughs> All right, Th thanks to the leadership. Uh, I wanted to, uh, for, for, and the staff, and I want to do a shout out to uh, Representative Rebel Allard, it's been such an honor to serve with you. We're gonna miss you. So look, this, as I said, this is a terrific bill. It does so much to advance education and health research and childcare, but you know, uh, members often bring personal experiences uh, to their job. And I just wanna talk about my two favorite constituents that really helped me uh, crystallize on something very important to my constituents. First is my 96-year-old mother. Uh, last year, she, she was living independently. I have to say, she's got a quicker mind than me. I guess that's not difficult, but she does. And uh, she fell one, day, one night, broke her leg. Uh, I watched her in, go through hospitalization and re rehabilitation, and now she is in an assisted living facility. I mean, the doctor said she was one of the lucky ones because she recovered, although she has lost her independence. And uh, I, I think if you, if you go back home uh, and you just talk to your constituents, you, you are gonna find so many people who have fallen and have had either injuries or real changes in their life because of their, their fall. So I, I started to do a little research. Uh, falls are, the, the biggest, the most uh, frequent injury to people over 65, 36 million falls a year, 32,000 lead to death, uh, and millions to injuries, and a lot of very psychological effects and 
changes in their activities of daily living, even people now not wanting to even leave their, their home. And the medical expenses uh, related to falls is an astonishing $50 billion on our health system, $50 billion. And as we heard in the hearing, I thank our chair for, for holding a hearing on the, this issue, there are many, many preventative actions that can be made. Uh, and, uh, and really, shockingly, the federal investment in fall prevention, despite the fact of the huge impact on, on the, cost, the cost of falls, the federal uh, investment has been minuscule. So I want to, uh, again, uh, th thank this committee, our subcommittee. We, we are making new, uh, large investments to support, to support and scale up fall prevention programs. And uh, I'm not gonna, I won't go into the details of them, but hopefully it's, this is going to save a lot of lives and, uh, and a lot of sadness. And yeah, my mom is doing well. She's doing well. Now, my second constituent is my son, Ben, uh, who was a United States Marine War. He was in Afghanistan and Iraq. I watched him come home after eight years. I watched the transition. It was a little nerve-wracking, but I will say this, he's fine. He's an adult, he's got a family, he's successful. But here's the point. Uh, uh, what I realized is that, that these young people who are coming home from the military have to go through a transition. And this bill also now inv invests again in student veteran centers at colleges and universities. And, and these are centers where uh, veterans coming out of the military uh, can go to and it helps them with mentoring and financial counseling and tutoring because they go through a lot of different experiences than someone who's just coming out of high school. So I want to again thank our subcommittee for, for putting uh, this in and uh, I, I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Espayat. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I rise in support of this year's uh, education, health, and labor bill as the nation still grapples with the detrimental effects of COVID-19. <laughs> pandemic has really uh, taken a toll on many districts, including my district, the 13th Congressional District, who've seen uh, some of the worst zip codes in, in the country in regards to uh, thefts and those that fought for their lives in hospitals and ventilators during the pandemic. Uh, we must have sub substantial funding to rebuild and enforce uh, these essential systems. This bill includes $124.2 billion for the Department of Health and Human Services. Funding will invest in our nation's depleted nursing workforce and ensure that our most vulnerable low-income residents have access to quality Medicare services. The funding ensures that safety net hospitals and federal qualified health centers, and many of them are, Madam Chair, are in my district, Harlem Hospital and Metropolitan Hospital. Of course, uh, Montefiore, and even some of the most prestigious uh, hospitals like New York Presbyterian, Mount Sinai, among others, uh, are safety net hospitals as well. They're in very poor communities. So we must ensure that they can continue providing uh, care for medically underserved communities, critically important to uh, the Bronx, uh, where I represent a good portion of the Bronx. Harlem, of course, which is uh, an iconic neighborhood in, in New York City, and uh, Washington Heights. It also helps lower the cost of outpatient drugs while providing funds to help combat the devastating opioid crisis that has touched every state and every one of our districts across this nation. I was also pleased to see significant investment in our nation's students through the $86.7 billion allotted to the Department of Education. Among other groups, this funding targets the expansive needs of English language learners. I was an English language learner at one point, and I'm happy to report that now I speak Shakespearean English. Um, investment in essential programs like the teacher quality program 
which ensures schools are, are producing teachers that can provide adequate services for uh, English language learners and the Every Student Succeeds Ad, which provides funding specifically for ELS, shows Congress commitment to one of our nation's most vulnerable populations. Additionally, I'm grateful uh, for the investment in Hispanic serving institutions and other MSIs, which can uplift the next generation of Hispanic leaders. Finally, I was glad to see the Department of Labor provides $15 billion to ensure that Americans have access to the workforce and increase nationwide prosperity. These funds will go to important programs like the Reentry Employment Opportunities Program, which allows justice-involved individuals to have a pathway to the workforce, greatly assisting with reintegration into our communities. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back the remaining part of my time. Ms. Kaptur. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank you especially uh, and Ranking Member Cole as well as uh, Ranking Member Granger for, this, for your work on this very important bill. I'm grateful to see many of the priorities that are important to meet the needs of the region that I represent and the whole country included in the bill, including several agencies that will receive vital increases from strengthening worker protections to historic investments in quality health care and education uh, this bill delivers consequential changes that will improve the quality of life for all Americans. And I completely identify with statements that Congresswoman Lee and Frankel made about the disaggregated nature of care for people who are homebound or institution bound, and uh, that pilot study being so important. I want to thank the committee staff that stayed up uh, many nights to get this done. And in my view, throughout the pandemic, the work of this uh, committee and subcommittee has distinguished itself to restore our nation to some level of normality and well-being. We're far from that, but even looking at the number of our own members that have just gotten COVID, uh, it just tells us that uh, more work lies ahead. The labor, HHS, and education programs funded under this bill, including especially for regions like mine, workforce development, Pell Grants, and quality affordable health care coverage are critically, critically important. Uh, many of the hardworking and retired people that I de uh, serve depend on Medicare and Medicaid coverage, and it's essential that we strive to improve health outcomes, lower costs, and expand accessibility in a very confusing health care system. I'm pleased the bill provides necessary additional funding for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, $9.9 .9 billion, which is an increase of $2.6 billion above uh, the enacted level for this year. It is so vitally needed. Our communities, uh, affected often by the dual behavioral health and opioid crisis, rely on us to do more and require immediate funding to provide much needed mental health services, substance abuse treatment, and prevention initiatives. Thank you, Chair DeLauro, for directing funding uh, for SAMHSA and HUD to create a pilot program for supportive housing for people with mental health illness that can't be cured in three weeks. And they need shelter, a shelter plus care model based on the success of the HUD-VASH program working with our vets. Inadequate transitional housing and support systems severely harm people who are living with serious mental illness, leading to an inhuman cycle across this country of people entering and leaving hospitals, jails, shelters, homelessness, and then the cycle repeats. This cycle significantly burdens public budgets while robbing people of effective avenues to receive proper care, diagnosis, and treatment. The pilot will serve as an important role in reimagining re how we care for one of our most afflicted, vulnerable populations. And finally, I'm pleased we're directing NIH to continue expanding its relationships with the Department of Energy and its national laboratories to work together more closely in more strategic ways to leverage the Department of Energy's vast research capabilities in high performance and high frequency photo imaging, supercomputing, to further push the boundaries of health research, imaging, drug discovery, brain research, and other high science, biomedical, neurological research areas. Again, I appreciate the chairwoman, ranking member, and the committee staff for their hard work and for incorporating these priorities along with many others. I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Seeing no other members wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recommend, recognize myself to offer a manager's amendment, which is at the desk. 
Um, and without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, members submitted nearly 16,000 requests to this bill. We were able to accommodate the vast majority of those requests, either fully or partially. Over the last few days, uh, we've worked closely with the minority, with Mr. Cole, and have a manager's amendment making a number of non-controversial and technical changes to the bill and report for programs that are of interest to many of the members of the committee on both sides of the aisle. I appreciate the close collaboration I had with Mr. Cole and his staff in putting this amendment together, and we are in agreement. I urge the adoption of the amendment. And now I'd like to recognize Ranking Member Cole. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We support the amendment and urge its passage. Are there any members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Yes, Mr. Molinar. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank you and Ranking Member Cole and the committee for their work on the amendment that uh, bans HHS from using taxpayer dollars to purchase crack pipes. I'm grateful that this amendment has bipartisan support and has been included in the manager's amendment. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I rise in support of this uh, manager's amendment, and I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for including this provision on Seoul Community Hospitals. Uh, this provision encur encourages CMS to provide a transition period for these Seoul Community Hospitals that have fallen out of compliance with CMS eligibility requirements during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Seoul Community Hospitals like Flagler Hospital in St. John's County are eligible for higher Medica Medicare reimbursement rates because they're the uh, only source of care in that geographical area. However, during the last two and a half years, some of these Seoul Community Hospitals, including Flagler, are, are at risk due to new hospital construction that's come into the area. And while I support competition and construction of new hospitals, Without the flexibility of this transition time, these sole community hospitals are going to face some very difficult financial decisions. And so the COVID-19 pandemic has been a challenging time for our hospitals across the country. And we must give these hospitals, which have single-handedly served their community for so many years, uh, the flexibility as they transition out of the sole community hospital program. So my language included in today's manager's amendment will provide a step-down period uh, that minimizes the disruption and allows prudential uh, or prudent financial planning for these very important health care providers. So uh, with that, I urge adoption of this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? I uh, no? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments? Madam Mr. Chair? Cole? Mr. Cole is recognized. Thank very much, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk, <laughs> and I would ask it to be dispensed with. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized to speak. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, like last year, my amendment is straightforward. It restores the language carried in this bill for over 45 years to protect life and prevents federal tax-funded abortion. Uh, since it was first enacted by an overwhelmingly Democratic Congress in 1986, it's estimated that this provision, known as the Hyde Amendment after its original author, the late Congressman Hyde, has saved more than uh, two million lives. This language has been supported by lawmakers and signed by uh, president into law by presidents of both parties every year as part of the appropriation process. And every Democratic member sitting in this room today has voted for it passed as recently as last March. When President Biden was in the United States Senate, he supported including the Hyde Amendment and appropriations bill and showed support for the provision as recently as just three years ago while campaigning for president. He has since flip-flopped on this issue under pressure from the far left wing of, uh, that now controls the Democratic Party uh, and proposed the removal of this protection in his budget request. This bill also dilutes conscience protection language uh, added 17 years ago by 
then Congressman Dave Weldon, which protects American doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals from participating in or providing an abortion if they have a moral objection. This is an essential right of every American, and its removal is a danger to all of us. Last year, 22 state attorneys general sent a letter to the congressional leaders, leadership <clears throat> outlining in detail their objections to the removal of the Hyde Amendment in the president's FY22 budget request. Repealing the Hyde Amendment would impose a pro-abortion funding policy on states that have decided against it. Uh, <clears throat> they stated that the Hyde administration or the Hyde Amendment allows states to choose uh, to fund elective abortions or not with uh, state taxpayer dollars. And the people and elected representatives of 34 states have voluntarily chosen not to do so. I will always come down firmly on the side of protecting and saving lives uh, of unborn children, as well as defending the conscience rights of American taxpayers. I do recognize that these issue, that the issue of abortion is emotionally charged and that many Americans have differing points of view. But even for Americans who consider themselves pro-choice on this issue, mo many don't believe that tax dollars should be used for abortion. In fact, 60% of the American public oppose taxpayer funding for abortion. Madam Chair, I know you appreciate the fact that this bill cannot become law until these provisions are restored. You wisely agreed to do so just a few short months ago, and this decision enabled us to complete work on the fiscal year uh, 22 omnibus bill. Uh, as the, mark, uh, the makeup of this body and the, the other body remain the same uh, as they were in March, everyone in this room knows that these provisions must be restored once again to allow this bill uh, in fiscal year 23 to move toward completion. I would strongly urge you that we make this modification now, this committee room, uh, so that negotiations are not unnecessarily bogged down later in the year. We know this needs to happen, so let's do so sooner rather than later so that we can produce a final bill before Congress adjourns later this year. With that, Madam Chair, I urge the passage of my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Granger. I support the gentleman from Oklahoma's amendment. The Hyde Amendment has been part of the Labor HHS annual appropriations bill for more than 40 years. It reflects a long-standing compromise on a deeply controversial issue. Estimates show that more than two million people are alive today because of this provision. The removal of this provision from the bill is deeply troubling to me. It will have to be reinserted if votes are needed from members on our side of the aisle. I urge a yes vote on this amendment and I yield back. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. The Hyde Amendment is discriminatory. It is a discriminatory policy. It has been perpetuated for over 40 years. A status quo that denies help to the low income, in this case, disproportionately denying women of color health services available to those who can afford this choice. The radical supermajority on the Supreme Court's ruling overturning Roe v. Wade was not about protecting life. It was all about stripping power, control, and dignity away from women. And that has been the result of the Hyde Amendment for decades. When Medicaid covers the cost of pregnancy-related care, including abortion, it means someone can make a decision based on what is best for their circumstances. Currently, 33 states in the District of Columbia, Columbia, though not by their choosing, deny state funding to women seeking access to abortion. As a result, the millions of women in these states are hostage to their geography. The radical court decision last week, it is more important than ever that we act to empower all women to be able to make deeply personal life decisions without politicians inserting themselves into the doctor's office. To ensure that regardless of where they live, all women are treated fairly and equally, and to improve women's health. This amendment also seeks to reinstate the Weldon Amendment that prioritizes a provider's beliefs over a patient's health needs. It gives the power to determine women's health choices to institutions, insurance companies, hospitals, or any kind of health care facility or organization, rather than leaving that decision to a woman. 
The Weldon Amendment has been invoked in the past in attempts to block policies to expand abortion coverage by threatening policymakers with the loss of critical federal health dollars. If this debate was truly about protecting life, then every member in this room would vote in favor of this bill. It invests in maternal health, child care, biomedical research, education, job training, and more. But it would appear that there's more of an interest um, uh, in, 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 in protecting life, but that doesn't seem to extend into childhood. I am proud that the bill we are considering today moves us forward in ensuring access to essential reproductive health care services. Arguing that these riders have been law for decades and therefore we are prevented from making changes is disingenuous. Just last week, the activist conservative Supreme Court disregarded science, decades, 50 years, half century of legal precedent and the will of the majority of the American people they thwarted to strip away a woman's fundamental and constitutional right to make her own decisions about her health care. In the wake of that ruling, this bill protects women's health. It empowers women and prevents politicians from inserting themselves into women's most personal health care decisions. The decision to get an abortion should be made by a woman and her family in consultation with her doctor and in accordance with her own faith. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Are there other members who wish to be heard? Mr. Mr. Adderholt? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to rise in support of the gentleman from Oklahoma's amendment. Uh, the Hyde Amendment, of course, uh, as we know, was first enacted back in uh, 1976. It's been uh, supported by both presidents. And the, the crux of the matter is that it simply prevents taxpayer funds from uh, for going to abortions that uh, so many Americans uh, uh, support this principle. Uh, of course, I'm disappointed that President Biden again abandoned the Hyde Amendment. As a senator, uh, he uh, always supported this, and uh, that's why it's very disconcerting to see what's going on now. Without the Hyde Amendment, uh, the bill is simply too extreme. It can't pass the Senate. We must come together in a bipartisan manner uh, and get the bills passed by both chambers in a timely manner. I know most of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will uh, vote against this, but uh, uh, I please know I greatly respect their decision, but unfortunately, a vote against Mr. Cole's amendment would uh, therefore just cause this uh, uh, bill to fail, and uh, I look forward to continue to fight for the unborn for the Hyde protection. It has been restored, and I would urge a yes, uh, urge a yes vote on this amendment. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Listen, I hear a lot of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are supporting this amendment because they care about fighting for America families. But when push comes to shove and these same colleagues actually have the opportunity to support American families, they don't. They vote against the expanded child tax credit to put money in parents' pockets. They vote against paid family leave so parents can stay home with those babies. They vote against access to affordable child care so parents can provide for those babies. And they vote against health care, public schools, early childhood education, gun violence prevention, and anything that will help these kids grow up and raise families of their own one day. And now, of course, most are silent about or even cheering the reversal of Roe v. Wade. And I find it a little hypocritical that today we have to support this Hyde, we're being asked to support the Hyde Amendment because it's been in place for 40 years, but at the same time, we're cheering the reversal of a precedent that was around for 50 years and supported by the vast majority of Americans. But now more than ever, it's absolutely crucial that women are able to access reprotective care that they need. And let's be very, very clear. This amendment has nothing to do with families. This amendment is not pro-life. This amendment is another piece of an out of touch partisan agenda to control women's bodies. Having a child is an important life decision. I think we all agree on that. 
but it is one that should be left to the woman and her doctors, not representatives in this room. This amendment dismantles that fundamental choice, and it's a, a vote against this amendment is a vote to protect women. A vote against this amendment is a vote to ensure that all women, no matter their means, their insurance policy, or their zip code, can access essential abortion care that they need. I urge my colleagues to consider the women whose lives that will be turned upside down by this amendment, the women who will lose the opportunity to pursue the American dream, and the women who will die because they cannot access the urgent care that they need. Vote against this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield. Ms. Herrera Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. And it's not because it's just precedent, and it's not just because, um, you know, our side does and your side doesn't when it comes to supporting Hyde. I, this is a very fundamental inflection point for us as appropriators. We are respecting the fact that at best, at best, the country is split on the issue of, tech, of, of, of abortion. You can go to different parts of the country where it's incredibly supported and different parts where it is absolutely opposed. We have to make a decision with other people's money. This isn't our money to use. And when we're talking about, you know, my, the, my friend from Nevada was talking about this being something, it's not about, you know, taxpayer dollars, it's about dismantling a choice. I would then also submit that we're, we're talking about the reason this is so important to some of us, I'm not going to speak for everybody, is because I also believe it's dismantling a life. You know, the extremes of abortion to where you can be near birth or in the late stages there's a lot of pain that's felt to a baby in the womb at very early ages. So we're not talking about this as like some weird, like this is something that should never be discussed um, as just a simple policy. This, we're literally talking about ending life in the womb. And whether or not you and I or we have the right to take other people's money and use it in that fashion. This is not talking about outlawing abortion. This is not talking about taking away states' rights. We're talking about whether we're going to use taxpayer money to end life in the womb. And I can tell you from personal experience and from experience with walking with many families that 24-week-old babies survive really well. They, 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 they're, in today's world, you wouldn't know one from a child who was carried to term. So there's a very, and, and they feel pain in utero. I, I've watched if a baby gets stuck with a needle in utero, they move away from the needle. They can be harmed and they can heal in utero. I mean, they're kind of magical. They're, they're, they're swimming in stem cells. It, it, the science today shows us that we know, is certainly with regard to late-term abortion, that this is, a, this is at best an ethical, <laughs> an ethical problem. But for us to be saying, gosh, somehow we're against families because this is what we're defending isn't accurate. So I wanted to go on record and say the reason I'm supporting this amendment is because we don't have the right to take taxpayer dollars to use it to end life. And I will also add that the Hyde Amendment has exceptions to save the life of the mother, which is consistent with protecting life. So it's not a radical or an extreme position. In fact, it's one that even Senator Manchin has said from the other side of the rotunda, he will not support a bill, an omnibus bill, unless it happens. So the reality is for this bill to become law, probably at the end of this year, this protection for tax, of taxpayer use to end life in utero is going to have to be in there. So with that, I urge its adoption. Yield back. Ms. Lee of California. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment uh, to insert this discriminatory hide, these discriminatory hide and Weldon amendments or riders into this bill. This amendment would prohibit abortion coverage for people insured through Medicaid and allow health entities to refuse to provide cover or refer for abortion services. Once again, the Republicans in this committee are trying to control people's lives rather than allowing them to have the freedom to make decisions about their bodies. Nobody should be denied access to have an abortion because of where they live, how much money they have in their bank, or where they get their health insurance. And let me tell you, and I guess, Mr. Cole, I'm one of those who you 
uh, characterized. Uh, but I want you to know that I was uh, here as a staffer when Henry Hyde in 1977 said, I certainly would like to prevent, if I could, legally, anybody having an abortion, a rich woman, a middle class woman, or a poor woman. Unfortunately, the only vehicle available is the Medicaid bill. Now that's what he said when I was a staffer and I heard him say that. So, Mr. Cole, I know what it's like to live with bipartisan unjust policies as an African American woman. It doesn't mean it's right. These are unjust policies which disproportionately affect black and brown people. Let me just tell you the facts. 25% of black women and 22% of Latinos are enrolled in Medicaid compared to 12% of white women. And so Henry Hyde wanted to get to everyone, but he stopped because he couldn't move any further, so he stopped with black and brown people. Ending the Hyde Amendment has been a priority of mine since I was a congressional staffer. It's a discriminatory, it's a dangerous policy whose impact falls hardest on women of color and low-income women, denying them access to a full spectrum of reproductive health care. And it's un-American to use public money, public money to discriminate against people regardless or based on their racial and economic status. That is just wrong. I thought discrimination supposedly ended, but it hasn't. Despite what my colleagues try to claim, the data shows the majority of voters in America do believe, they do believe that Medicaid insurance should cover abortion care just as it covers any other pregnancy-related care. This is a not about whether you agree or disagree with abortion, it's about making one's own personal decisions and allowing low-income women and women of color to do that. Each of us should be able to live, work, and make decisions about our health care and our future with dignity and respect. It's not our place to decide whether someone else should get an abortion. This is a deeply personal decision that every person should be able to make for themselves. It's really wrong, it's unconscionable for someone to uh, have to live and exercise their personal decisions based on what, what you are deciding for us. The Weldon Amendment is a harmful rider that has been tacked onto the Labor H Bill. It works alongside the Hyde Amendment to interfere with abortion coverage and care. The Weldon Amendment is one of several refusal of care provisions that prioritize a provider's preferences over a patient's health care needs. Together, they embolden several providers, hospitals, and insurance companies to impose their beliefs on patients and deny abortion care and coverage. It's been weaponized against states and local governments that want to protect access to abortion coverage or care, including policies that ensure a patient's access to care is not determined by the personal or religious beliefs of others. A patient's ability to access health care should never be restricted on the opinions and beliefs of others. And let me tell you, I know very well what it's like when access to health care is restricted by discriminatory beliefs. My mother almost died giving birth to me, to me, simply because the color of her skin. When she went into labor, the Catholic hospital would not admit her because she was black. Okay, that's what you call refusal of care. She nearly died as a result. So this is the real impact of refusal of care laws, and we must work to put an end to these type of harmful and discriminatory policies. Ms. Henson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to speak today in support of my colleague and friend's uh, amendment, ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Cole. Um, I'm speaking today in support of life, and I'm speaking today in support of taxpayers, not only from Iowa, but from across the country, who do not want to fund elective abortions with their paychecks. Since 1976, the Hyde Amendment has enjoyed broad bipartisan support, and that's because the Hyde Amendment is based on the fundamental principle that we should all be able to agree on here. Americans should not have to fund abortion against their will or in violation of deeply held religious beliefs. Beyond that principle, Hyde saves lives. In fact, since its enactment, it has saved more than two and a half million babies, babies who deserve a chance babies who deserve to grow up, so perhaps one day they can run for Congress too. 
I'm a mom to two boys. Max and Jax are my entire world. Um, I can't imagine my life without their smiles and laughter and their, their fun little jabs and gross boy jokes. Um, the issue of life is personal to me as a mom, and the Hyde Amendment is personal to me as an American taxpayer. The bottom line here is that we should not be forcing Americans to fund abortions against their will. As members of the House Appropriations Committee, it is our job to stand up for American taxpayers and be accountable to them. It is their money. It is not the government's money. Nearly 60 percent of Americans oppose taxpayer funding of elected abortion. And these taxpayers have entrusted us with those hard-earned paychecks. So today, I ask you in, uh, to stand with me in support of life. Let's stand with the overwhelming majority of our constituents and stand up for taxpayers by continuing to support the bipartisan provisions of this Hyde Amendment. And let's not forget right now, our constituents are sitting around their kitchen tables or their, at their coffee shops right now um, looking at how they're going to buy groceries. How are they going to fill up their gas tanks? struggling to make ends meet and pay the bills. How are they going to afford everyday necessities? And you want to tell American families right now who are struggling to make those ends meet, the millions of Americans who strongly oppose elective abortions, that the government is going to use their hard-earned tax dollars from their paychecks to pay for elective abortions that they don't support. It goes against who we are as Americans to force taxpayers to fund elective abortions against their will. So the Hyde Amendment is about respecting taxpayers, plain and simple. The Hyde Amendment is about respecting life. So please join me in doing the right thing for our constituents here today and for the countless numbers of unborn babies who will have a chance at life if we continue to protect the Hyde Amendment. I thank my good friend from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, for his leadership on this issue, and I urge a yes vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Ms. Frankel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will say that this amendment deserves a double my, 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 my. Now, before I get into the substance, I just, I just want to remind everybody that yesterday in the debate uh, about sending contraception overseas, that my colleague, the colleagues on the other side of the aisle determined that the only form of contraception that would be allowed is a condom. Everything else, it seems to me, they think is an abortion. An IUD is an abortion, a pill is an abortion, I will go on and on. So the reason I mention that is I, I really don't want to hear medical lessons from my colleagues. Don't take it personally. but it, And I, I also want to say that uh, I, I love life. We all love life. I'm a grandmother. I love my little grandchildren. But it, it, he, here's the thing. We watched yesterday, or last week, the United States of America taking away for the first time in the history of this country a fundamental right, and that is the right for people to make their own personal decisions as, uh, uh, on their reproductive health, their life, and their f futures. And uh, we're going to see probably very quickly 27 states ban abortion, but this amendment makes it even worse because the Supreme Court decision and this amendment disproportionately harms low-income women and women of color. Because uh, when you restrict Medicaid coverage of abortion, who gets hurt? The most vulnerable communities. And I, I just ask you this. I ask my colleague is this. How do you accept or how do we accept a premise that a woman who lacks a high income simply loses her ability to decide if it's a good time to bring a child into the world. How do we accept a policy that disproportionately hurts women of color? Uh, this, this amendment and the research shows that the Hyde Amendment, as you call it, forces one in four low-income individuals seeking abortion to carry a pregnancy to term. Why? Simply because they can't afford an abortion. Uh, and for those who are going to go ahead and get an abortion, just forcing them to self-finance it, that itself has implications on families. Think about it. One week's work to get an abortion. One week of what? Not eating or paying your rent. But, but he, here's the thing. Uh, the, the Hyde Amendment also causes people 
to, to delay abortions, it makes their health care much more complicated. So listen, I'm going to just end up by saying this. This amendment is blatantly unjust. Uh, and on top of it, we got this dangerous Weldon Amendment in it, which allows providers to ignore their health, the health their needs of their patients if they don't align with their own beliefs. Really? Is that what we're coming to in this country? And I'll just end by say, saying this. The decision to bring a child into this world is personal. Are you ready to love, to nurture, to take care of a child? It is something that a person has to decide for themselves, not some politician in some state who doesn't even know any these these people. This is a dark, dangerous, extreme, unjust amendment, and it should be defeated. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I rise to speak in opposition to this amendment. Something my colleagues on the other side of the aisle continually fail to grasp is it is a woman's right, and hers alone, to decide what is best for her future, her family, and her bodily autonomy. Fear-mongering these decisions is frankly vulgar and irresponsible. It is unconscionable to support government-mandated pregnancy, yet that's what the Hyde Amendment does for people who struggle paycheck to paycheck. I'm thankful that the Hyde Amendment for the second year in a row is once again absent from this bill. Since 1976, Republicans have inserted this rider into the spending bill, placing a decades-old ban on women's reproductive rights that disproportionately impacts women of color and low-income women who rely on Medicaid. Everyone should be able to live, work, and decide their own fate with dignity and economic security. That includes the ability to care for their bodies, affirm their identities, and raise their children. During, during a pandemic, the stakes are even higher. The same people who are most hurt by abortion coverage bans also bear the heavier brunt of this pandemic and systemic racism every day. I'm a mother of three. In fact, we tried very hard to make sure that I could have three children because at 29 years old, I was unable to conceive after a lengthy period of trying thanks to in vitro fertilization, which I might add, now might be in jeopardy with the recent Supreme Court Dobbs decision. Uh, so I can tell you very definitely that the decision to become a parent is not an easy one and is often a struggle to become one. It's one of the most important life choices that we make. And Congress should never interfere in that decision. I also stand in opposition to this amendment's attempt to reinsert the Weldon Amendment into this bill another misguided tactic that interferes with abortion coverage and care. Pregnant patients seeking health care services like counseling, medical information, and abortion should never be denied this critical care because of others' beliefs. Health and well-being should always come first, but the Weldon Amendment puts a pro provider's beliefs over a patient's health. This emboldens providers to refuse necessary and timely care. We must eliminate this harmful rider, as the bill does, if we want to truly protect full health care access. Let's put an end to the appropriations process being used as a backdoor to controlling women's bodies. With access to abortion being rapidly and chaotically stripped away around the nation after the Dobbs decision, we must do all we can to fight government-mandated pregnancy. I vigorously oppose this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you for um, uh, opposing this amendment. And Madam Chair, I rise in also in strong opposition to the amendment put forth uh, to prohibit the access of women to comprehensive uh, reproductive health care services, including abortion as a, a method of, of family planning. The right to choose has been slowly and systematically eroded for women across the country. Half of the people in this country are at risk of no longer having complete power over their own bodies. Imagine if we as men were told what to do with our bodies and their own lives uh, are being impacted uh, on a daily basis. We should support people's ability to make their own medical decisions we should support 
the black, Latinx, and immigrant people that may not want to give birth due to the significant higher likelihood of maternal and, and infant maternal mortality rates. And we should support bodily autonomy. Amendments like this one would not stop people from receiving abortion. They just would not. The data is out there. Low-income women have and will continue to postpone rent payments or buy food to cover the cost of an abortion. It will force people into the desperation, uh, seeking out dangerous means to terminate their pregnancy, whether by depriving themselves or a substance or receiving a back alley abortion. You're driving women back to the alleys again. And so instead of passing regulations that police the body of women, it is our responsibility as members of Congress to support women's health, access, access to, trans, to contraceptives, and gender-based violence prevention and response programs. For this reason, I oppose any amendment that bans a woman access to reproductive health services. Madam Chair, thank you, and I yield back my time. Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, as regards to men and their body autonomy, last I recall, that executive order from the President forced men to get COVID shots or be, or be released from the military. Oh, please get out of here. Oh, 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 I see. So, so a co getting the government forcing a COVID shot is not, is respecting body autonomy. Okay, the gentleman from New York and I are just going to disagree about that fundamentally. Fundamentally, for the government to tell someone that they have to get health care could easily be likened to the argument the gentleman makes about the government telling someone they can't get health care. The well, I'm not going to speak to Hyde because, look, the, the, Would public, the gentleman the yield? Public, no, no, sir. You had your opportunity to no, expound. No. I have my opportunity. You can ask another member on your side of the aisle to yield to you. The fact of the matter is, men were told they had to get COVID shots or they were going to be fired by the military. Just the facts. I'm not going to talk about Hyde because a clear majority of Americans agree that public tax dollars should not be used to pay for abortions. Look, if Planned Parenthood is so, so, believes so much in abortions, set up a C3 or a C4, oh, by the way, they have the C4, and pay for those abortions because women have a right to abortion and would be denied it without taxpayer dollars. The question in Hyde is public funding. That's what it is. Let's talk about Weldon. I resent the gentlelady from California suggesting that Catholics are racist. That's exactly what the gentlewoman suggested in her comment. We shouldn't have to go there in this argument. But if you want to go there, I'll go there because I am a Catholic. And I don't participate in abortions, and I didn't participate in abortions when I was on the faculty of a major hospital in Maryland. And I was criticized by my colleagues for not uh, forcing because they, they said, you're an anesthesiologist. You're not doing the abortion. Wow. So they were going to force me to participate in something that goes against my deeply held religious beliefs. So let's talk about why Weldon is poor. And let's talk about night in 2009, a New York nurse, Kathy DiCarlo, was forced by Mount Sinai Hospital to assist in a dismemberment abortion. And by the way, for those of you who haven't seen dismemberment abortion, because I was called to rescue a woman who, had, who is undergoing a dismemberment abortion who is about to die from the procedure, I've seen the results of it. She was required to witness the doctor removing the bloody arms and legs of the child from the mother's body with forceps. She had to account for the pieces of the unborn child to ensure none were left inside the mother. Now, Kathy DiCarlo had expressed her objection to the doctor and her nursing supervisor before the procedure. Though there were other nurses at the hospital willing to participate in abortions, her supervisor insisted that Kathy participate in the abortion at the risk of losing her job and her nursing license. Kathy had to wait for three years for the Office of Civil Rights at HHS to address her complaint that the hospital violated her rights. And in the end, as we know, the Obama administration did not, of course, enforce the Weldon Amendment, and were called to task by course for not doing it. So at minimum, we should have the Weldon Amendment to, to protect nurses like Kathy DiCarlo, who have a religious objection 
other people could provide that service who don't have a religious exemption, and the facility, federally funded, because that's what Weldon does, it withholds funds from facilities that do this to nurses, the facility could have provided someone who didn't have religious exception, uh, religious exception and didn't. That is a fit punishment for a, a health care facility that forces one of its employees to work against their religious beliefs. We should never, the First Amendment provides every American the right to religious beliefs. We should never, ever force a person to do something against their religious beliefs. So we need the Weldon Amendment. Now, the Weldon Amendment alone is not good enough because, the, uh, believe me, the Biden administration will not enforce the Weldon Amendment. Therefore, we do need to pass the Conscience Protection Act that provides for a private right of action when, an administ when a rogue administration like the Obama administration and now the Biden administration refuses to enforce the law of the land because the Weldon Amendment is currently in our funding bills and is the law of the land. I suggest we keep the Weldon Amendment in these bills. I support the, the, uh, the amendment in front of us, and I yield back. Ms. Watson Coleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I am really sorry about being part of the delay here and moving forward, but there's just no way in God's earth because I could just not speak to this issue. I am so opposed to not only this amendment going forth, but I'm really opposed to the absurd comments and the um, comments that were totally irrelevant that have been made in support Madam of Madam Chair, uh, I, I ask amendment. that the gentlelady's words be taken down. She commented uh, Madam my, Chair, that my comments were absurd. Gentlelady, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, the rules me, of the House allow you to rule Madam on Chair, the gentlelady's I words to be taken down. Madam Chair, the gentleman from Maryland has not been recognized. Madam Chair, yeah, you, you I can't have spoken just in out generalities. The gentlewoman continue? will continue. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. You know, abortion is essential health care, and everyone should be able to get abortion care, coverage, information, and referrals without interference. Abortion access is essential because every person should have the right to make decisions about how, when, and whether to have a child. Income and insurance coverage should not impact who can access work, abortion care. Black women, women in rural communities and low-income women's reproductive health and bodily autonomy have historically been targeted by racist coverage bans and medically unnecessary laws and restrictions. Black women are more likely to use federal insurance plans, including Medicaid, that don't allow for abortion coverage. These bans are inherently racist and target those that are economically vulnerable. In order for abortion care to be accessible, it must be affordable. We must ensure that anybody who needs abortion care has equal access to it, irrespective of their economic well being. Madam Chairwoman, thank you for uh, this opportunity. I strongly oppose this uh, amendment and I yield back. Mr. Case. Madam Chair, I yield my time to Mr. Espayat. Thank you, Mr. Case. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let's uh, come to grips with what's happening here. Uh, some of our colleagues are equating vaccine mandates to our egregious attempt to get into a woman's uterus. That's what's happening here. A, maxi, a vaccine mandate doesn't tell you you got to do it. What it says is, is get a vaccine, or if you don't get a vaccine, you really shouldn't hang around next to a senior that has diabetes because you may kill that senior, infecting her with the, with the virus. And, and other people have rights too. So if you're not going to get the vaccine, don't hang around a young child that has severe asthma or a senior that has diabetes or high blood pressure, these conditions are connected to the death rates in the pandemic. And so members of this uh, com committee, Madam Chair, are equating vaccines 
to an ill-advised effort to get, for men, to get into a woman's uterus and tell her what to do with it. That's incredible. And that's what's wrong in our nation. This lack of understanding of realities of a woman's right to choose what to do with her body. Egregious behavior, Madam Chair. And I'm certain that the, my colleague is not here to hear that, that he stormed out. But we will continue to fight, men and women of this, of this committee, will continue to fight for a woman's right to choose. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Mr. Case. Let me just, uh, uh, um, this is, I, I want to, so Mr. Case, if you will uh, uh, suspend, Ms. Letlow, I see your hand raised, uh, and there, there may be one or two others. What I'd like to do is to recess for the moment and then to have a look at what is being alleged, what was said, and keeping in mind that we don't uh, have a transcription of, of, of words uh, in this committee. So it's about whether or not words can be taken down. But we will pause, we will recess, and take a look at this and uh, resume after we have to come to a conclusion. Thank you very much. The committee is in recess.
The chair is prepared to rule in a review of the words, the gentlelady's remarks did not engage in personalities, and we will now continue and resume debate. Mr. Case is recognized. Ms. Lawrence, and then got you, Ms. Letlow. Ms. Lawrence is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. There has been so many words said, and the one thing I want to add to the debate is that eliminating the right to get an abortion does not stop women getting abortions. We all know the history of before. Abortions were illegal. They were in back alleys. Women, for numerous reasons, personal reasons, re received abortions. So what this activity does, it does not eliminate abortions. So for those of you who think, if I make it illegal, no one will get an abortion. What you're doing is creating a situation where the abortions will be in back alleys, it would be unsafe and even more of a threat to life. And the reality, like my, my colleague just mentioned, abortions has happened, but when you had money and resources, you received abortions where you weren't in danger of losing your life. This is too important. I do not support this amendment, and I recommend that we vote it down. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Letlow. Madam Chair, I rise in support of this amendment. And while we've had many vigorous debates over abortion, we have historically agreed that hard-earned taxpayer dollars should not be used to fund abortions. I'm disappointed that this majority continues to push a policy to remove the Hyde Amendment, which is supported by 60% of Americans. As a mother of two to Jeremiah and Jacqueline, I am uniquely appreciative of the precious gift of life and the special bond that forms between a mom and a child. And also speaking as a woman, I'd like to note that being pro-life is about more than saving a child's life. It's a commitment to supporting our mothers. As policymakers, we must work together to bring forward legislation that helps families build nurturing home environments where children thrive and build happy and healthy lives. We've spoken a lot over the last few days about rights, and I firmly believe in rights for every single human being. So what about the rights of a living soul who cannot object to their life being ended? Why are their rights of any less importance? We know that no appropriations bill will get to the president's desk without the Hyde Amendment. Let's include it now so we can get to work on helping American families sooner rather than later. Again, I want to reiterate my support for this amendment and urge all of my colleagues to please support it. Madam Chair, I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? If there's no further debate, the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized on the amendment to close. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the vote uh, we asked for today is the same vote that every member of the majority has cast before, most recently, less than four months ago. I remind my friends that the Hyde Amendment was actually passed by an overwhelmingly Democratic Congress. And while opinion within the Democratic Party may have changed, opinion within the country has not. The Hyde Amendment remains supported by over 60% the American people. Everyone on this committee recognizes what my colleagues have pointed out. The language must be reinserted before the fiscal year 2023 bill can be completed. It can happen now or where it would make it easier to move forward uh, or it can happen but it will have to happen to avoid a continuing resolution. Our country is facing serious threat of uh, both the uh, economic and uh, from a global perspective as well. The American people are counting on us to produce a spending package that will protect our borders, strengthen our national security, and reduce inflation and improve our standard of living. 
let's take the first step today we know needs to happen uh, to get to a final deal. Please support the amendment and reinstate this long-standing bipartisan common sense language. For that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Oklahoma. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. aye. All those opposed say no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is, is not adopted. Madam Chair, request to record a recorded vote. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. No. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick? No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence? No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California? No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada? No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow? Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum? McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng? No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar? Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse? Aye. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo? Ms. Pingree? No. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan? No. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler? Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard? Aye. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger? Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford? Aye. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan? No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson? Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart? Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres? No. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? The clerk will tell. Voted. Mr. Palazzo. Vote yes. Mr. Palazzo, Mr. Votes. Palazzo votes aye. Any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? The clerk will tell. On this vote, the yeas are 26, the nays are 31, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Ms. Lee? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. This is Lee number one. Okay. And I ask for unanimous consent for uh, it to be. Unanimous consent to dispend with the reading. The gentlewoman is. Uh, recognized to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before I uh, start with my amendment, I just want to uh, clarify something uh, in terms of some, some facts uh, that were uh, commented on earlier in terms of what I said 
in the previous debate. Um, first, I attended Catholic school for eight years and was, ra and was raised a Catholic. Now, these are the facts. My mother was denied admittance into a Catholic hospital, Hotel Du Hospital, because she was black. And because of the refusal of care, uh, she almost died during childbirth, and I almost did not get born. So thank you for letting me clarify that. Uh, as co-chair of the Congressional Pro-Choice Caucus, I want to thank you for the opportunity to offer this amendment. It would simply add language to urge the Department of Health and Human Services to ensure that medication abortion care is accessible, affordable, and covered, and convenient for patients, including through access to telehealth. Medication abortion, known as mifepristone, is safe and effective in terminating an early pregnancy. It has been FDA approved for more than 20 years. Leading medical organizations, including the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Medical Association, oppose restrictions on this medication because such restrictions create medically unnecessary obstacles to care. And yet anti-abortion politicians are ignoring evidence and imposing restrictions that push medication abortion out of the reach for many people. 19 states have banned the use of medication abortion through telehealth. There is no medical or scientific reason for these bans. They are purely political. Everyone deserves to have access to comprehensive health care, which includes abortion. People who decide to have an abortion should have the ability to decide the way to, for them to receive that care. Last Friday, the Supreme Court's decision, yes, it was very devastating for many of us uh, and our constituents and for at least 70% of the country. It was the first time in our memory that the court has taken away a right from people. The decision will lead to many states taking action to ban abortion and force people to travel hundreds or thousands of miles to access abortion care or to forcibly remain pregnant against their will. We know that the impacts of this decision and these bans fall hardest on young people, LGBTQ plus people, black, indigenous, and other people of color, as well as those working to make ends meet and people who live in rural communities. Everyone should be able to make their own decisions about their reproductive health care and their future. That is why it's even more important to urgently eliminate medically unnecessary barriers to prevent patients from safely accessing the care they need. And so I pre appreciate President Biden's recent announcement on actions that his administration is taking. We heard from Secretary Bracero earlier this week that the Department of Health and Human Services will work to ensure medication, remains, medication abortion remains available. This amendment is to demonstrate that we in Congress support these efforts and supports the administration as it looks to protect access to this critically important medication and address the dire consequences of this Supreme Court decision. I ask for a yes on the amendment. I rise in support of this amendment. Medication abortion is safe, effective. It has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for more than 20 years. As been said, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Medical Association oppose restrictions on medication abortion because they are not grounded in any medical basis. Instead, the restrictions create barriers time-sensitive health care. We'll also note that Attorney General Garland has made it clear that states may not ban uh, med uh, med sorry, um, med med medication abortions, and I quote, and this is a quote, based on disagreement with the FDA's expert judgment about its safety and efficacy. There is no medical or scientific reason for these bans. They are purely political and harmful. Women who are prescribed is safe and legal medication for either an abortion or for miscarriage care should be able to receive their prescription at their pharmacy of choice, at a health center, or delivered directly to their home. I urge a yes vote on this amendment. Madam Chair? Mr. Cole is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to the amendment. A woman experiencing a mail order clinical abortion, often alone, perhaps uh, miles from a hospital and potentially hundreds or even thousands of miles away from the prescriber. As many as one in five will suffer a complication. Some data show that the, these compl this complication rate is higher uh, for chemical abortion than it is for surgical abortion. 
and that's uh, in Scandinavian countries where women are being uh, screened at a, at a point uh, uh, as well. Uh, we can assume it will be even higher uh, in the uh, federal, if the federal government is sanctioning uh, this by mail and telehealth without uh, the person being mailed, uh, having screening or follow-up uh, procedures. Chemical abortions uh, are over 50% more likely than surgical abortions to result in an ER visit within 30 days. The federal government, uh, or excuse me, the federal government uh, should not become an arm of the abortion industry by encouraging the dispensing of chemical abortion drugs, uh, which is what this amendment would actually do. For that reason, I oppose the amendment. Go back. Anyone else who wishes to be heard on this amendment? Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of this amendment. Um, throughout the more than 20 years that it has been used in the United States, medication abortion has been proven to be overwhelming, overwhelmingly safe and effective. Many patients, particularly those who live in rural communities, must travel long distances to obtain abortion services. Telehealth can be used to expand access to health services in areas where the number of clinicians who provide abortion care is limited. Research has also demonstrated that direct-to-patient medication abortion provided via telemedicine, where the patient remotely consults with the provider and pills are shipped through the mail, is likewise safe and effective and works well for patients. In response to the SCOTUS ruling, we must work to promote abortion care access, which is an essential component of comprehensive health care. The impact of this decision will cause disproportionate harm for people of color, women who's living on, who are living on lower incomes, young women, immigrants, and members of the LGBT community. For that, Madam um, Chair, and for many other reasons, I support this amendment and, and hope that my colleagues do the same. I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Ms. Underwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly support Chairwoman Lee's amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Last week, an extremist Supreme Court majority overturned half a century of precedent to take away the fundamental right to abortion care. Millions of women no, now no longer have access to abortion in their home states, and more women will lose access in the months to come. The destruction that this court has wrought did not happen overnight or by chance. These attacks have been intentional and in public through decades of shameful work by extremists who will stop at nothing to control our reproductive choices. The American public supports access to abortion care, and we are fighting to get it enshrined into law. But this is a hard fight, and right now it's essential to preserve and expand access to medication abortion an FDA-approved option for ending an early pregnancy. Medication abortion is proven to be safe and effective. It's been used by over 5 million people in the U.S. over 20 years. And it is especially essential for the millions of women in America who lack easy in-person access to an abortion provider. That's why HHS and the entire Biden administration must do everything possible to protect and expand access to medication abortion. This amendment will help make sure that happens. When we say the administration must do everything, we really mean that. It means being creative, bold, and daring. This is an urgent health care crisis and requires an urgent whole of government response that meets the moment. The administration's action must also include working proactively to combat myths and disinformation about medication abortion being spread online and by extremists because medication abortion is safe, effective, and essential. When someone has made the decision to have an abortion, they should be able to get one as soon as they decide in the way that's best for them, without facing restrictions that force them to delay care, carry a pregnancy against their will, or face criminalization. That's what this amendment will help make possible. I urge my colleagues to support it, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There's no further debate. The gentlewoman from California is recognized on the amendment to close.
Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to reiterate that this amendment uh, adds report language that would protect access to a trusted and widely used form of medication. The administration has also announced it is taking actions in support of medication abortion access. I ask for an I vote. Thank you, and I yield. The gentlewoman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Womack. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk uh, seeking unanimous consent to consider the amendment as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized to speak on and this I, amendment. I thank the uh, chairwoman. I rise in support of my amendment, which would uh, prevent the Department of Labor from proposing new regulations unless those regulations increase job training or reduce the CPI. This limitation would remain in effect until the CPI returns to pre-pandemic levels. There's also an exception for the department to continue to take action to ensure employees' physical safety. Madam Chair, just yesterday, the Bureau of Economic Analysis reported that the GDP decreased over quarter one of this year confirming that we are at heightened risk for a recession. It's been said many times during this markup process that Americans are experiencing the highest inflation in 40 years, and many are wondering if their paychecks will continue to provide for their families. Instead of, addre instead of addressing the issue, the Labor Department is working to implement a disruptive regulatory agenda wholly unrelated to current labor shortages and economic tension. Recently proposed regulations include mandating environmental justice and retirement plans, ending flexibility for state workforce support services, and decreasing the availability of apprenticeship programs. The administration, quite frankly, has taken their eye off the ball. I think it's this committee's responsibility to help them refocus. Now, before you say that addressing inflation is a responsibility of the Federal Reserve, keep in mind that DOL administers 180 federal laws affecting over 150 million workers and 10 million workplaces. These regulations have a significant effect on the cost of labor and directly tied to the cost of food, fuel, and other expenses. The department should focus less on partisan priorities and more on their core mission to ensure that American workers can find good jobs and employers can create jobs without the threat of overregulation. So, with that in mind, I encourage a yes vote on my amendment. I rise in opposition to this amendment, and while I agree that wage increases for American workers are not keeping up with inflation, I do not believe this amendment would achieve its stated purpose of reducing inflationary pressures. The reality is that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have long opposed the Department of Labor's efforts to use its regulatory authority to the benefit of working people. During the Obama administration, they opposed the Department of Labor's efforts to ensure that financial advisors put their customers' interests ahead of their own, their own financial interests. They opposed efforts to ensure that low-wage workers received overtime pay they had earned and deserved. And they opposed regulations to protect workers from inhaling carcinogenic silica dust. The Department of Labor plays a critical role in protecting the rights of American workers, including the health and safety of workers in some of the nation's most dangerous industries, like meatpacking, poultry, and agriculture. This amendment would unnecessarily prohibit the Department of Labor from taking regulatory action in the next year across a huge swath of the Department's mission, leaving American workers to fend for themselves. For instance, this amendment would prohibit the Department from moving forward on a rule to reduce heat illness in indoor and outdoor work settings. And it would prohibit the department from moving forward on a rule to prevent workplace violence in healthcare settings. I'm willing to work with my colleagues on practical, effective solutions to address inflation. I think we all have to do that. But tying the hands of the department that is responsible for protecting the health, safety, and wages of working families is not the answer. I oppose the gentleman's amendment, and I urge a no vote. Congressman Cole. Madam Chair, I support the gentleman's amendment and urge an I vote. Yield back.
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I oppose this amendment uh, for a couple reasons. One, I think it takes a sledgehammer instead of maybe a set of pliers to uh, the rules process. And two, it's just getting it wrong on inflation. Uh, I've been a small business owner for 34 years, and I think you sometimes ignore that Department of Labor has rules that also uh, help businesses, not just helping workers. And by tying the hands around that, uh, we need some rules to be implemented in order to have BIF uh, go out there, the dollars that are going to support businesses and employees uh, in your and my district. Um, there's also other regulations. Uh, I think they've got a rule right now try to make it easier to file uh, paperwork electronically uh, so that you can get bids and procurement. That's important. And there's a number of other rules that uh, help, be help benefit businesses that the Department of Labor does. But secondly, I, I think it also gets it wrong on inflation. You know, I've uh, last year when we basically reopened uh, and everything opened up at once around the world, uh, we found a couple things. One, we don't make enough things in the United States, so we're reliant too much on things overseas. But there is a scarcity uh, across the planet. That's why we have inflation across the globe right now. So uh, when you went to buy things and everything opened up and there was scarcity, um, economics 101, probably economics 99, uh, that drives the price up and we're having you know a global COVID inflation that we're feeling across the globe. On top of it, some companies have unfortunately decided to start price gouging from oil companies to others. That's another issue around antitrust. But, but I don't think this would actually affect what you're trying to and actually would hurt many small businesses that are waiting for some of the rules uh, to be promulgated around BIF and other areas. So I just think uh, it gets it wrong on inflation. It gets it wrong on, I think, addressing what uh, the author would intend to. And I urge people to vote against the amendment. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There's no further debate. Um, there is no further debate. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized to close. Yeah, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I don't, I don't, think, it, uh, I, I don't think it unnecessarily punishes business. I think if you ask your businesses, they're going to say that uh, a hyper-regulatory burden uh, or mentality over at the Department of Labor is probably harmful to business, particularly during these very difficult times we find ourselves in. Regulations um, are not going to lower the cost of a loaf of bread, or it's, it's not going to lower the cost of a gallon of gasoline. These are the things that are affecting everyday citizens all across the board. And what my amendment simply does, um, with a carve-out exception for, for safety, is my amendment just simply says that until we see the CPI back down to pre-pandemic levels at 2.3 percent, uh, that we're just not going to allow these regulatory agencies to continue to prosecute a regulatory agenda that is inconsistent with uh, helping our business. So, so I encourage a yes vote on amendment. And I'll yield back my time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arkansas. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those, aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Ms. Clark is recognized. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will read the amendment. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts is recognized to speak on her amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Even before the decision last week in the Supreme Court that gutted the constitutional right to an abortion and demoted second class women to second class citizens, we passed a bill to protect Supreme Court justices and their families. And immediately after that decision, the Department of Homeland Security issued a warning to providers that they could expect an increase in violence from extremists emboldened by the passage and enforcement of abortion restrictions. But we still have yet to help these providers remain safe as they continue their work in reproductive health care. And these are the same providers that experienced an escalation in targeted violence even during the height of the pandemic. We already know that movements fueled by hate and misogyny put abortion providers and patients from communities of color in danger. But today, this committee, with this amendment, can help prevent and address this violence. 
This amendment will provide grants to providers to enhance the physical and cyber security of their facilities, personnel, and patients. This amendment will help protect all health care providers. We have had too many examples of violence targeting hospitals and doctors and other health care providers. And finally, I'd like to recognize the heroes who work day in and day out to provide abortion care at great risk to themselves and to their families. And I thank Congresswoman Escobar, who has been a champion on this security issue. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment to protect our providers. Thank you, and I yield back. To be heard on the amendment. If there is no further the debate, the gen oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Ms. Henson. Um, Madam Chair, I have an amendment to the amendment, please, and I would ask it for it to be read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. Oh, the amend okay. I would ask the amendment be read, Madam Chair. The amendment to Clark number one. The clerk will read the amendment. An amendment from Representative Hinson, amendment to Clark number one, insert the following. After health care providers insert, quote, comma, including pregnancy help centers, comma, end quote, both times it appears. After health care provider insert, quote, comma, including a pregnancy help center, comma, end quote. Thank you. Madam Chair, am I recognized for opening? Yes. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Iowa is recognized. Thank you. Speak on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank the gentlewoman from um, Massachusetts for raising this very important issue today. Um, and I, I want to know um, to members of this committee that I have really enjoyed working with many of you and your staff on um, maternal health and infant health initiatives in the past, um, including the Midwives for Moms Act and the Babies Act, which we also worked with uh, two other amazing women on this committee, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera-Butler and Lucille Royal, Roy Ball Allard, Madam Chair. So. Um, I truly believe we've built a foundation of trust and respect on these very important issues to help women um, access these uh, opportunities in our districts. And um, I know we don't agree on abortion in this committee, and that's okay. Uh, we have a lot of other opportunities to debate that clearly going forward. But I also know that what we do agree on is that we want expectant mothers and their babies to be safe, and we want to make sure that they have access to care no matter what their zip code is. So in that spirit, that's why I'm offering this amendment here today, the amendment to the amendment that I generally believe uh, will uh, improve the text of the amendment. It's very simple, as you heard, it's only three lines. Um, and what it does is it clarifies that these grant dollars should also be available for the safety and security of women who are visiting healthcare providers, including pregnancy help centers. I'm heartbroken we even have to have the conversation. Absolutely nobody should be worried about an attack like those that we have seen in recent weeks on either side of the aisle. Whoever's perpetrating it, it's wrong. And that's why I don't want to strike any portion of your amendment. I want to add to it. Um, attacks on crisis, crisis pregnancy centers and pregnancy resource centers have been on a steep incline. Vandalism, firebombs, uh, fire bombs, arson, and smashed windows are all acts of domestic terrorism, no matter where they happen and at least 37 pregnancy care centers and pro-life organizations have been victims of these serious attacks in recent weeks. This includes the Agape Pregnancy Center in my home state of Iowa. Others in my district are under threat and they are praying daily that they are not next. These centers provide important resources and care to expecting mothers who are choosing life. And according to the Charlotte Logier Institute, there are 2,700 pro-life pregnancy centers across the country. They serve more than 2 million people in 2019, providing women with needed support right in their communities. These women should not be fearful for their safety and for the safety of their unborn children when they are trying to access free medical and financial support. Let's talk a little bit more about the resources that all of these centers provide. They provide confidential, cost-free services, including adoption information and adoption agency referrals, parenting education and resources, pregnancy and infant loss support, including crucial help in processing the challenges associated with miscarriages and stillbirths, pregnancy <coughs> tests and ultrasounds, STD information, and more. They also provide maternity and infant supplies, like diapers, food, clothing, formula, and more. 
So there's a lot we need to do to help protect these centers as well from acts of violence. So let's work together to ensure that women are not in fear when they are trying to get help for their babies. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment to the amendment? Ms. Ms. Clark, I'll uh, recognize Ms. Clark and then you, Mr. Klein. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as much as we may uh, have our disagreements around abortion and as much as I have many concerns about these so-called pregnancy crisis centers, really being anti-abortion advocates who often victimize women who are in very vulnerable um, positions, we have to stand together against violence. We have to stand together against political violence. And so I plan to support your secondary amendment. Mr. Klein. Ms. Watson Coleman. Um, Madam Chair, I wanted to speak in support of the original amendment and I have no problems with the secondary amendment as well. Um, attacks on abortion, uh, abortion providers, including stalking, invasion of facilities, and battery and assault, have increased significantly since 2021, and they are anticipated to go up even more following the Supreme Court decision. Abortion is essential health care, and providers deserve to do their job without the kind of harassment any day, but especially during a public health crisis. Harassment has no place in health care. Violence has no place in this country, and no one should be afraid to seek or provide essential health care. We must strengthen these protections for health care providers. I support this amendment, and I encourage all of my uh, colleagues to do the same. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Underwood. Oh, no. oh. You're okay. 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 There's no further uh, uh, a debate. The gentleman from Iowa is recognized on the amendment to the amendment to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank my colleagues for their uh, remarks. Um, Congresswoman Clark, thank you so much for agreeing to accept this amendment or supporting the amendment. I think it does make the amendment better. Um, and I think this is important to note. Um, it, it only adds additional support for pregnant women and their babies, their families, and their chosen support system. Um, I know um, the Pregnancy Support Center in my district that um, I've had a number of conversations with. They've been under threat. Um, they also counsel women who have chosen abortion, and they have conversations with them afterward about it. Um, so they counsel those women as well as providing the services, trying to urge them to choose life in the first place. And I think that's really important work, that we give every woman um, the opportunity to choose life um, and support them in that choice. Now, as drafted, my um, friend's amendment um, does not ensure that those are included, so I think this will absolutely make this better. It will help protect women no matter where they're seeking those services. So I want to reiterate, um, I look forward to continuing to work with you in this manner, and I urge a yes vote on this secondary amendment. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Yeah. My, my only question is, does a pregnancy health center have a definition? Is it a 501c3? What is it? We're not an authorizing committee here. We're an appropriations committee. Ms. Captain, the, we have had, we've closed on the amendment. We're going to move, move to a vote. I think it's a reasonable question, but we need to get the question answered um, uh, uh, outside of this procedure here. So uh, the question is on the second degree amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Iowa. We are not yet voting on the underlying amendment to the report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the, opinion, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Having disposed of the second degree amendment, we will now return to consideration of the amendment to the report offered by the gentlewoman from Massachusetts as amended. The amendment we were debating before the second degree amendment was offered and adopted. Um, are there any members wishing to be heard on the amendment as amended? Ms. Underwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly support 
uh, Congresswoman Clark's amendment, which is based on legislation I introduced with my friend Res uh, Representative Escobar, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Last week's extremist Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade laid bare what is at stake this year for American families. And as a nurse myself, I can tell you that the safety and well-being of essential health care providers is also at stake because abortion is health care and abortion providers are health care providers. The anti-abortion movement has always been violent. Since 1977, there have been eight murders, 17 attempted murders, 42 bombings, and 186 arsons targeted at abortion clinics and providers across the United States. In recent years, as they've escalated their attacks on pro-choice, pro-science, pro-reproductive health care, these threats of violence have increased. We all remember the murder of Dr. George Tiller as he worshiped at his church in 2009. We remember the 2015 massacre at a Planned Parenthood in Colorado Springs. In 2020, death threats against abortion clinics more than doubled. With Roe gone, I believe reproductive health care providers face a greater threat than ever. Providers, their staff, and their families face intimidation, cyber stalking, and doxing. That's why this amendment is so critical to meet this moment. And I am here as a nurse to stand up for providers to ensure each healthcare worker who shows up every day to provide essential health care for their patients can do so safely without fear of physical or cyber threats. Because if this committee is willing to go the extra mile to protect the Supreme Court, as we saw earlier this week, we can get this done for healthcare workers on the front lines who face threats every day simply for doing their job. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and I yield back. Heard on the amendment as amended. Mr. Espia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm happy to support uh, this amended amendment. Um, as you know, uh, we have done tremendous work in this committee. Uh, in the Lech branch uh, subcommittee, we uh, substantially increased funding uh, to ensure that there is safety on this campus uh, after January 6th uh, and the growing numbers of threats. Uh, it is important that we assess the level of danger uh, here and we were uh, subsequently uh, diligent in, in increasing funding to make um, this uh, complex safe for visitors, for folks that work here, for our colleagues. Uh, uh, the same thing uh, hit the floor uh, a couple of weeks ago when we uh, took up legislation to increase the potential uh, security levels for members of the Supreme Court. And of course, um, these uh, clinics deserve to also have uh, increased security as a clinic saw an 80% an increase in bond threats com compared to previous years in reported 71 hoax devices or suspicious packages. In 2021, there was a dramatic increase in violence against abortion providers, stalking increased by 600% and invasions increased by 12, 129%. So the, uh, Madam Chair, I think that we have established uh, a strategy to address uh, and assess danger across the board, not just for one particular area, but here in Congress, for the, the U.S. Supreme Court, and of course, for providers across the nation. For that reason, uh, I will uh, vote favorably on this amended amendment. I yield back my time. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment as amended? If there is no further debate, the uh, gentlewoman from Massachusetts is recognized on the amendment to close. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. And I urge all my colleagues to support this amendment. It may be a small step uh, in helping the providers, a group of whom I spoke to recently in, in my home state of Massachusetts. The fear of going to their jobs every day for their patients, for themselves and their families is very real. 
and I hope by accepting this secondary amendment, we can begin to work together to reduce political violence in this country, to reject the idea that we promote what we want the outcome to be politically by violent means, by misrepresenting things to the American people, and that we can work together across our divide on opinions and on issues to bring our government back to one that stands for the rule of law, that appreciates the will of the people and the voters. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I urge support of this amendment. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Massachusetts as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments? Ms. Herrera Butler. Clerk will read the amendment. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The woman is recognized to speak on her Madam amendment. Chair, um, my amendment asks the Commissioner of Social Security, the Social Security Administration, to certify to the committee that all Social Security field offices are open, in fact, and for in person and walk up. The committee provided the Social Security Administration with a generous increase, but there also does need to be accountability. The SSA serves the U.S. taxpayer, and they should be providing top-tier service. It should be accessible and efficient. 69 million people receive Social Security benefits, and they should be able to get the help that they need when they need it. Now, I assume that many of my colleagues have heard from constituents, as I have, who have been impacted by the office closures, the delays, and the complications uh, from getting service from the SSA uh, during the pandemic. Now, this issue was brought to my attention by numerous constituents. Um, our seniors, those living in rural communities, and people with disabilities rely on Social Security field offices to be open and available to them. I, I can't tell you how much I have heard from individuals on this issue. While telework was necessary at the beginning of the pandemic, various agencies have proven that it can reopen safely and provide full services to those who need them. You know, I, I wish that I would have uh, had also offered this amendment with regard to um, the State Department um, those of us who watched what happened in Afghanistan found that it was frustrating to try and get a hold, and even with Ukraine, people who were out of the office. Um, and it is time that federal employees um, begin to come uh, and, and are at their offices, especially when it comes to Social Security, where most of the clients that the agency is serving may be very uncomfortable uh, navigating a virtual environment, or they just can't do it in a rural location. Maybe they don't have access to broadband. I have a lot of constituents who are in this boat. Um, so I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment. The goal is to continue with the increase that the majority put into the bill, is just to ask that in, as they're receiving this increase that they keep their offices open for the seniors that we all serve. With that, I yield back. I rise in opposition to this amendment while I agree that the Social Security Administration needs to be more available and accountable to the public. SSA offices have been reopening since March 30th in accordance with their reentry plan. SSA offers online services, and while they continue to encourage people to schedule appointments in advance to help mitigate long waits and crowds due to public health concerns, field offices resumed in-person services in early April including for people without appointments. That said, there is room for improvement, much improvement, and we know that in any given week, SSA field offices can be closed for a variety of reasons. But those reasons also existed pre-pandemic. Could have been for a construction or facility issues, insufficient guard coverage, or staff shortages. SSA has its challenges, but frankly, too many of them are financial which is something this committee is uniquely positioned to fix. 
In fact, to address those funding shortfalls, today's bill includes an increase of $1.1 billion for SSA's operating budget. Holding back funds that the SSA desperately needs to backfill and hire additional staff in field offices would be counterproductive to the problems our constituents want us to solve. I would like to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to provide the Social Security Administration with the funding that it desperately needs in fiscal year 2023 so that it can work to improve customer services and reopen with more employees in all parts of the country. But holding back funding from SSA would stop or slow the agency from hiring and backfilling staff and is not a productive way to support field offices or the American people. I oppose this amendment and I urge my colleagues to oppose it as well. Are there other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? I recognize the gentlewoman to close. Thank, I thank the Madam Chair. And, and let me be clear, this is in no way uh, trying to reduce the amount that the majority is giving to Social Security. I actually believe that we have to invest in this area um, because seniors and others across our nation rely on these offices. This is simply requiring not even that whole amount, but a piece of that amount as that money is given, this report is given back to Congress. Uh, again, I've said it a few times, we are the gatekeepers of the funds, and these are not our funds, they're taxpayer funds, and it is not unreasonable to say, provide us with this report as we're giving you this increase. And I would like to work with the gentlelady on this, um, assuming I don't win this vote, uh, because I really do believe that seniors, I mean, I, I heard it through the pandemic, one of the biggest issues I heard was, and this was on the phone, Seniors can't just get online and make an appointment. It just doesn't always work. Some maybe have the ability to, whether it's geographically possible, um, which is why they, they're, they're used to what they can do is get into a car and go. And so I think this has to be addressed for those in our communities. And I think the general lady urges adoption. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from uh, Washington. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. No, in the opinion of the chair, the no's have it, the amendment is not adopted. Further amendments, I would just say to the gentlelady that I would love to be able to work together with you on to see you know, what direction. I think these are a, a, a offices which people rely on and need to rely on, and it's very unnerving if they cannot get the kind of, 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 of response or support that they need, so thank you, thank you. Are there further amendments? Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk, Harris number one, and I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. What this amendment does, this amendment discusses the funding for the strategic uh, national stockpile, and it's a topic that the, this committee is obviously uh, very involved with and has been involved with for years. Uh, the, the importance of the strategic national stockpile gained significant prominence during COVID. This amendment would increase the le level of funding for the stockpile from the $855 million that's in the current bill by almost a billion dollars to $1.844 billion, which actually would be the amount of the professional judgment amount for FY22. Uh, you know, as I've said before, you know, if, uh, it's only a fraction of a fraction of what we spend on kinetic defense. Uh, we just uh, approved a uh, defense bill for $761 billion. Uh, and, but yet I think we continue to grossly underfund our health security medical countermeasures enterprise, which is an industry that's solely dependent upon the federal government. Without uh, the federal government partnership, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this industry makes no sense. I mean, you're producing a product that you hope you will never need and that no one will use until, you, until the time when you uh, hope you never need it. Uh, you know, as COVID and other potential bioweapons have shown us, the threats in the world are real and growing. You know, last year, uh, the committee uh, leadership did agree to a hearing, but because other issues like in infant formula and things like that arose, we haven't yet had a briefing on our SNS, and uh, let alone a classified briefing on these threats and how to protect against them, uh, again, including uh, the SNS. Uh, you know, the threats are real. Just Tuesday, the Biden administration announced mass distribution and acquisition of vaccine against the growing monkeypox outbreak. These products were developed and acquired through the medical countermeasure enterprise, and now they're at the front lines of the world effort to quell this growing outbreak. The war in Europe has demonstrated the need for not just our own medical countermeasures against chemical, biological, and radiological nuclear threats, but also for our allies 
plants. Russian aggression against Ukraine nuclear plants come to mind and the need to have, uh, have countermeasures against uh, radiological threats. Uh, the, uh, again, uh, there was uh, uh, last year, uh, Madam Chair, you know, you indicated that we could do a briefing. Again, other things came up. I would hope that the committee uh, will hold a briefing, preferably classified uh, as well, to help but to better understand the threat environment. Uh, again, suggesting, you know, the argument is made, well, you know, we, we provided a lot of money. Uh, So I, I do believe that we should have a discussion uh, of the importance of the SNS and funding it at the levels that, again, the uh, professional judgments uh, have indicated are necessary. But since there is no pay for, and obviously this would completely blow up our 302Bs, I will uh, move at the end, if there's, a, if there's any debate at the end, to I uh, will move to uh, withdraw the amendment. I yield back. While I strongly support our nation's preparedness efforts, I respectfully rise in, in opposition uh, to the amendment. We have dramatically increased our investment in the strategic national stockpile as part of a COVID response. Uh, for 2023, the bill includes $855 million for the stockpile. That's an increase of $10 million over 2022. With the funds included in the bill, the, na the strategic national stockpile would receive a total increase of $245 million since fiscal year 2019. That's about a 40% increase. In the meantime, in addition, the increase in the bill would be in addition to more than the $10 billion provided for the stockpile through COVID-19 emergency supplementals. So, uh, you know, early in the, in, the, in the COVID response, there was confusion about the role of the uh, Strategic National Stockpile, its inventory policies procedures. The GAO and HHS Inspector General conducted reviews of the SNS, and I, I personally, I asked the HHS Secretary at the time to undertake an internal re-envisioning what, what was there of the S SNS. I, 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 we are still awaiting the release of the plans for the path forward for the SNS. In addition, this amendment, as you pointed out, does not have an offset, so it causes the bill to exceed the subcommittee's 302B allocation. And I would respectfully urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment, and I would hope that the, the, the gentleman uh, would, would, would withdraw. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on, on the amendment? Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Again, to put it in perspective, you know, the President announced, uh, I think it was a $3 billion purchase of vaccines into the stockpile. Uh, but again, this COVID vaccine is only one thing that's necessary. Uh, Madam Chair, I hope we can work together to look at the next professional judgment and see, you know, how far behind we are. You know, the, the, uh, the budget is less than one-tenth of one percent of our kinetic defense budget. And uh, again, the threats that exist in the world uh, are significant threats for non-kinetic actions that could, have, that could adversely affect the nation. So uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I move to withdraw the amendment. And I'm more than happy to work with the gentleman on this area. It's an area of real concern to me. I would very much like to find out or have us all find out about in transparency what's there, what, what are we short of, where we need to go, and thinking about that in future terms. So thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Further amendments? Mr. Molinar, is this amendment? This amendment number one, Mr. Moore. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk and ask that this unanimous consent that we dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, my amendment will prohibit the Biden administration from enforcing the new rule on charter schools that it announced earlier this year. It's gathered more than 26,000 public comments. The rule that was announced goes too far and will make it harder for charter schools to provide the educational opportunities parents and students expect. It will also disadvantage the hardworking educators at charter schools who care about the well-being and success of their students. From 1995 through 2019, the federal government has made grants of more than $3.9 billion to charter schools during a school's first three years. 
This helps charter schools get started and provides more opportunities and choice for parents and students. The new rules deter new charter schools from opening, burdening them with more regulations and rules. They might also make it more difficult for new schools to open in areas where enrollment is declining. These are the areas where new schools are most needed and where a new school opening could save a neighborhood instead of families leaving that area entirely and moving somewhere else to provide their education for their children. These rules place an exceptional burden on new schools and they will hinder the opening of new opportunities for parents and students in their communities. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment and block funding for the implementation of the new rules. I yield back. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. For months, the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools has been peddling uncredible exaggerations and honestly misrepresentations about the Biden administration's modest proposals in the 2022 charter school program competition. Why? Why are they doing that? Because the organization is willing to take desperate measures to oppose any additional accountability and transparency in the program. For years, we have had serious concerns with the administration of the charter schools program, which is why I applaud the Biden administration for taking meaningful steps in the right direction. According to the department's own analysis, 15% of the charter schools receiving charter school program funding since 2001 have never opened or closed before their three-year grant period is complete, representing an unacceptable waste of at least $174 million in taxpayer funds. I reject the premise that grant failure and school closure is the cost of doing business in the charter schools program, which is why I welcome reasonable reforms. The administration's proposal merely asks applicants to demonstrate that there is adequate demand for new charter schools, which will increase the likelihood that funds will support schools that open and educate our children over time. In addition, we have known for years that charters run by for-profit educational management organizations, they're better known as EMOs, pose serious financial risks to the federal programs this committee oversees. The Biden administration protects students and taxpayers from these low-quality, risky institutions by preventing charter school programs from funding charters run by for-profit EMOs. The bill codifies this protection to establish a prohibition as precedent for fiscal year 2023 and for future years. The National Alliance, which represents charters run by risky for-profit EMOs, would like to maintain that status quo, which is why the organization, I believe this, is willing to mislead and misrepresent the facts to preserve the loose regula regulations around the for-profit EMO industry and that they have come to enjoy. So I urge my colleagues to really to disregard their false claims and to oppose the amendment. I won't go into it now, but there are many instances of criminal fraud with the, uh, uh, these EMOs and misappropriating millions of dollars in public funds and uh, 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 unbelievable conflicts of interest that they have. So obviously I urge a no vote on this amendment. Does anyone else wish to be heard on this amendment? Ms. Letlow. Thank you. I rise in support of this amendment. Charter schools are a vital part of the Louisiana educational system, and these schools provide innovative, supportive learning environments for students. My state hosts over 150 charter schools with 10 schools in my district alone. And while I'm delighted of the charter school growth in my state, it's very important these schools are given the flexibility and bandwidth to flourish. Unfortunately, we've seen instances of charter schools being singled out within this funding bill and through the DOE regulations. These changes are almost impossible standards to uphold and do not apply to other public schools. 
The Labor HHS Education Bill contains a harmful provision that unfairly targets charter schools and dictates who they can do business with to maintain their organization. I have concerns about this provision. The federal government should not be mandating to local schools on how to run their day-to-day -day operations. That is the job for locals to decide since one size does not fit all. Additionally, the department should not be limiting charter schools through regulations. Earlier this year, the, the department introduced a proposal that was so restrictive that it would fundamentally change the charter school grant program. These new regulations do not keep in the best interests of our students in mind. And while I'm thankful the department's proposal drew sharp bipartisan criticism, our committee should prevent the department from moving forward with the changes once and for all. And I thank the gentleman from Michi Michigan for sponsoring this amendment to address both issues. And I urge passage. Madam Chair, I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There's no further debate. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe the facts show that charter schools have been a vital lifeline for parents and students during this pandemic. In many cases, opening for in-person instruction while other schools were closed. Charter schools expand school choice and freedom for parents who want what is best for their children. The new rules that were introduced by the Biden administration earlier this year clearly would jeopardize the opening of new schools and burden them with costly regulations. This could prevent the opening of new schools just where they are needed most and see more parents move their families out of the areas where there are no good schools. We all want what's best, the educational opportunities to be available for this generation and future generations of American students. These new rules put that in jeopardy. We should stop these new rules from moving forward, and I urge a yes vote on the amendment. Thank you, and I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the, uh, the ayes, no, I'm sorry, the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Request recorded a re vote recorded vote. Is uh, requested. All those in favor, recorded vote, please. Raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amaday. Could you repeat that, sir? I think you're muted. I still can't hear you. I will come back to you. Mr. Bishop? Mr. Bishop? Mr. Bishop? Mrs. Bustos? Mr. Calvert? Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Christ. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Ms. Frankel. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Ms. Kaptur. Ms. Kaptur votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Lawrence. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. 
Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCullum. Ms. Meng. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. New to be an audio issue here, but we're trying to work out so our colleagues will be able to uh, will be able to vote. But we will continue reading, uh, t tallying, or just reading the, the roll. In order to be able to record the vote, you need the audio, and we need the visual with a person being seen on the screen. That is the. <clears throat> Those are the requirements in terms of uh, re remote voting. So we're trying to get address the problem uh, with the audio at the moment here. So, Mr. Newhouse. <laughs> Very good, Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Ms. Pingree. No. Ooh, yay. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford <coughs> votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Torres votes no. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Mr. Adderholt. This is Mr. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Cole, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I, I do. Okay, I would vote aye. I, I, I think what we're going to do is we go through the, 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 the roll again, just to make sure that we don't mm -hmm. miss anyone. Go ahead. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Amaday. Yes. Mr. Amaday votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Yeah. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes. Christ, no. Mr. Christ votes no. Uh, Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Mr. Joyce. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Palazzo. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree votes no. anyone who has not voted wishes to record their vote. The clerk will tally.
On this vote, the yeas are, oh, I'm sorry, I can't read your writing. This vote, the yeas are 22, the nays are 32, the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Molina? Mr. Mol no, Mr. Klein. Sorry, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, Klein one at the desk. I ask it to be considered as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman for Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Granger. This amendment would, in essence, continue funding for industry recognized apprenticeships as an alternative to the inefficient government run federal apprenticeships programs. In light of the unprecedented labor shortage and employers' reports of increasing gaps in workers' preparedness, this attempt by the Biden administration to eliminate industry-recognized apprenticeship programs is reckless. These programs were expanding valuable apprenticeship opportunities for workers and employers alike in fields that are disproportionately filled by women and min minorities. Seeing that the administration has no interest in pursuing this highly successful program, uh, Congress should act remove the language to preserve an important program our economy needs. Industry recognized apprenticeships play an important role in workforce development. Students should have the choice to participate in an industry recognized apprenticeship program, not just the government controlled model. If industry recognized apprenticeships are eliminated, then this will provide fewer opportunities for students. Industry recognized apprenticeships give employees more flexibility in training workers without the red tape of the federally run registered apprenticeship process. I urge the committee to adopt my amendment to enable industries to come together to offer skills and education to American students and workers. Thank you. I yield back. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Industry recognized apprenticeship programs were introduced by the previous administration and have caused confusion for employers, workers, and state and local partners ever since. These programs lack the rigor of registered apprenticeships and do not have the accountability needed to deliver results that both employers and workers want. We are committed to expanding the registered apprenticeship program that is currently in place at the Department of Labor. It is a proven, flexible model that works across industries and employers and provides workers with increasing wages, nationally recognized credentials, and promising career pathways. IRAPs are a duplicative and lower quality program, which is why the President issued an executive order asking the Department to rescind the industry recognized apprenticeship program regulations. The department is currently analyzing comments and working as quickly as possible to complete its analysis and draft the final rule, which will strengthen registered apprenticeships and continue to achieve the goal of building a demand driven registered apprenticeship system that advances economic security and opportunity for workers and for their families. I'm a strong supporter of registered apprenticeships, which is why today's bill includes a $303 million apprenticeship program, an increase of $68 million. But the, provi the provision prohibiting funding for IRAPs should remain in the bill. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment. Are there other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? Mr. Pocan is recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I agree with uh, all the remarks you just made. Um, one of the nice things about registered apprenticeship programs is their labor management joint run program. So it's uh, not just something about uh, unions that I think people try to say it is. It's actually labor management. And I'm one of those uh, management side uh, folks when it comes to labor management on apprenticeship programs. Uh, the IRAPs are, are really pale comparisons. It's like taking those Wisconsin cheese curds you had and comparing them to Velveeta. They may kind of look the same, but they're just not the same thing. Um, there, there's very lax standards, minimal oversight by the Department of Labor. There's no graduation or completion requirements. There's no training for safety and no wage guarantees. They're exempt from things like fair hiring practices. Uh, and the hallmark uh, of a registered apprenticeship are those standards. So if we're gonna put taxpayer dollars into something, we should be putting it into something, rightfully so, as our chair just described, the registered apprenticeship programs, but something that's a pale, pale comparison. As an employer, I know I don't trust, and I don't think we should put taxpayer dollars into such an untrusted program. I yield back. Ms. McCollum. Thank you. 
Um, I, I would like to associate with all my remark my remarks with what you said, Madam Chair, and everything that Mr. Pocan said, except about the cheese curds being from Minnesota and Velveeta. There is no comparison, but um, Wisconsin is not the only state that uh, produces cheese, high quality cheese. Um, I I come from a state. Uh, legislative background where we worked with the state of Minnesota, the federal government, businesses and unions to make sure we had top notch graduation programs that when people graduated from an apprenticeship, they knew they were going to be guaranteed a job. They knew they were going to be guaranteed a certificate that was transferable with them if they went to another state. In other words, it was high quality and it worked for um, the businesses, it worked for the state of Minnesota, which puts dollars into it. It has accountability for the federal government. And I thank you for the increase that you put into the program, Madam Chair. And um, so I, I wholeheartedly uh, object to this amendment and we'll be voting no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Protectionism of a failed model does nothing but hurts workers, hurts industry, and uh, competition encourages innovation. And what we've seen is a model of government-run apprenticeship programs suffer from inefficiencies and, and bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic failure. So I would urge my colleagues to accept this amendment and encourage innovation in our industry uh, apprenticeship programs. I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman for Virginia. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Further amendments? Ms. Hinson. Ms. Hinson, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk, Hinson Amendment Number 1, and I ask consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment would prohibit the administration from carrying out mass student loan debt cancellation. The Biden administration continues to ignore the boundaries of executive power. And without approval by Congress, President Biden is attempting to cancel hundreds of billions of dollars in student loan debt. But let me be clear here, there is no such thing as canceling this debt. The debt isn't going anywhere. All that this administration is proposing to do is to shift that debt onto the backs of hardworking Iowans and Americans. It will be paid for by those who choose not to go to college and those who worked hard to pay back their loans. Why should we make truck drivers, bartenders, electricians, and plumbers pay for somebody else's degree? Should a family farmer have to pay for somebody else's Harvard education? Should my constituents have, who have already paid off their student loans now have to pay off someone else's? Plain and simple, the answer is no, absolutely not, they should not. And I hear this concern from Iowans across my district. The Biden administration is stealing from their wallets and penalizing them for making responsible decisions by proposing this. The administration is failing these Americans by forcing them to pay for the debt of others that others consented to take on. They willingly made this decision. If President Biden's misguided idea moves forward, about 13% of the population will benefit at the expense of the other 87%. That's a pretty big slap in the face. Instead of supporting and promoting career pathways and good paying jobs and trades, the Biden administration is telling these hardworking Americans they made the wrong choice and that they have to pay for it. This will cost American taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars and in the middle of the highest inflationary period in four decades. American families are worried about paying for gas and groceries right now, but we wanna force them to pay off somebody else's degree this policy could not be more out of touch. Even while the economy is tanking due to wasteful federal spending and misguided policy, President Biden is drawing from a progressive wish list of ideas that assume taxpayer money is monopoly money. We can just print more, right? It's endless, grows on trees. Well, let me ask you this. What will this do to tuition, which is already skyrocketing? Why would a prospective college student give any thought to how much they will actually borrow if they know it's all going to be paid for by someone else anyway? This policy is a pipe dream not based on any economic reality. Report after report shows student loan forgiveness is a regressive policy that will harm our economy and it will benefit the wealthiest Americans at a disproportionate rate. We have better solutions, ones that will actually help working Americans and families 
support innovation, and help connect Americans with good paying jobs. So I ask you to join me today in standing firm and rejecting this policy that benefits the wealthiest Americans at the expense of our working families. This debt can't be canceled. It can only be transferred to taxpayers. So thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Before I rise in strong opposition, I want to make an announcement that the food is downstairs. So please, have, have people been partaking? Anyway, it's down there. <laughs> Go for it. Anyway, I, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. For, for years, too many borrowers participating in federal programs like the income-based repayment or the public service loan forgiveness have not received the loan forgiveness they have been promised. That is why I have pushed President Biden to correct these mistakes and provide the relief borrowers are entitled to. By fixing these issues, President Biden has already canceled more student loans, over $25 billion, than any president in our nation's history. With improvements to the public service loan forgiveness program, at least $7.3 billion in loan debt has been canceled for more than 127,000 public servants, such as our nation's teachers. And the administration's new waiver for borrowers in income-driven repayment will bring another 3.6 million Americans closer to loan forgiveness. The department is also working on new regulations that will permanently improve a variety of existing student loan relief programs, significantly reduce monthly payments, and provide greater protections for students and taxpayers against unaffordable debts. In contrast, this misguided amendment would tie the hands of the Department of Education to prevent the Biden administration from making continued improvements to existing loan forgiveness programs, while also blocking any other forms of student debt relief. That means teachers would no longer receive the relief they are entitled to through the Biden administration's public service loan forgiveness waiver program. I strongly believe we should be doing more to help borrowers reduce their student loan burdens, especially our nation's teachers. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly oppose this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Let's talk about what this amendment would really do. This amendment is sweeping. It would block critical relief the Biden administration has already extended to borrowers, pulling the rug out from under teachers, veterans, and hardworking families who have been struggling under the weight of student debt. The administration has already taken major steps to provide relief to student borrowers, including by extending the payment pause, addressing fundamental flaws in the public service loan forgiveness program, and making thousands of defrauded borrowers whole again through the borrower defense program. Just last week, my office received amazing news from an extremely relieved and grateful constituent, who after years of being unfairly denied relief, finally had her public service loan forgiveness application approved because of the Biden administration's waiver program. After decades of public service, she is finally having her loans forgiven as promised when Congress established the program 15 years ago. This amendment would deny this life-changing relief to millions of Americans, to veterans, farmers, teachers, it would also prevent the administration from taking further actions to improve the student loan system, including broader student debt forgiveness that is so desperately needed. The evidence is clear. Smart student debt relief is good for our economy. New business creation has surged in recent years, but as student loan payments restart, our nation's $1.6 trillion student debt burden threatens this trend, preventing our young people from starting small businesses and driving innovation. I appreciate the actions the administration has already taken, and I look forward to seeing the further steps they will take to provide broader and bolder debt relief to student borrowers. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Ms. Letlow. Madam Chair, I yield my time to my colleague, Mrs. Henson. Thank you. Um, I just want to clear up some misconceptions. Um, I would invite you all to pick up the amendment because we have spe specifically drafted this amendment 
um, to make sure that people who have already qualified for student loan forgiveness are not um, uh, subject to that. Um, it shall not apply to targeted federal student loan forgiveness. Um, any program that was in effect prior to March 12th of 2020 when the pandemic took place, so the very program my colleague from Illinois referenced from 15 years ago, uh, her student loan forgiveness is not in jeopardy. So I want to be very clear here. If you look at the text of the amendment, we have protected those who have entered into these agreements with the understanding that they would have their student loans forgiven as a part of the, the arrangement that they entered into. So I wanted to take a moment to just clarify that. So whether that's teachers or medical professionals or any other program that was already in effect before March 12th of 2020, um, what we just don't want to see is a massive cancellation of all student loan debt. And with that, I yield back to my colleague. Thank you, I yield back. Are there other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? If not, I, I recognize the gentlewoman to close. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the discussion from my colleagues, but again, with that clarification, I hope you understand this would be devastating to our economy. The very real effects are irresponsible policymaking, um, and, and this would have a very real impact on our eco economy. Um, we know budgets are being squeezed um, for our constituents, so I don't think it's a good idea to be taking resources from a small business owner who opted maybe not to go to college, a trucker who's been saving up his money to, um, to advance his career, buy his own tractor trailer, and is trying to enter the workforce. Uh, how about a recent community college graduate who worked through school, or a mom who's worked hard, to, worked a couple jobs to pay off her debt and is now worried that she can hardly pay her utility bills as it is. I don't think we should steal from them. Um, and I guarantee they, they don't want you picking their pockets for someone else's fancy degree either. So I urge a yes vote on this amendment. And again, this amendment is written in a way that protects people who have entered into those agreements already for student loan forgiveness. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield back and I urge a yes vote. The question is on the amendment offered by the, the gentle lady from Iowa. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Madam Chair, I ask for a recorded vote. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, please. Please raise your hands if you want for a recorded vote. Thank you. Sufficient. I see you, Mr. Molinar. Mr. Stewart, is your hand raised as well? Sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Quayar. Mr. Quayar no. votes no. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro votes no. Mr. Diaz Bellart. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Aye. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Henson. Mrs. Henson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Le Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse. Hey. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Quigley. 
Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Oh. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. diaz Bullard. Mr. diaz Bullard votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Clerk will tell. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Oh, Ruppersberger votes no. Thank you, Mr. Ruppersberger. vote the yeas are 24 the nays are 32 and the amendment is not adopted okay. further amendments Ms. Letlow Madam Chair I have an amendment at the desk and I ask unanimous consent that my amendment be considered as read it, it's considered as uh, considered as read without uh, without objection the gentlelady is recognized Madam Chair my district is rural Louisiana where we have some of the highest rates of poverty in America. Every day I see the challenges that so many of my constituents face as they confront the current economic uncertainty and have less dollars in their pockets. I firmly believe that the only way to take a region like mine from poverty to prosperity is through education. Research has shown us time and time again that our children have better life outcomes with solid education under their belts. And if we give a child an education, we give them a future. The charter school program, CSP, at the Department of Education plays an important role in providing those essential educational opportunities for our nation's children. Funding for the CSP helps states create promising new charters and allows them to replicate high quality public charter schools. After this pandemic, it's clear that the public demand for charter schools is strong. A Harris poll released this month found that three in four parents support expanding the number of slots in existing public charter schools in their area. Three in four would consider sending their child to a public charter school if one were available. The poll also found that 84% of American parents agree that although they may not choose a charter school for their child, charter schools should be available to families who would choose them. Unfortunately, the Labor HHS Education Funding Bill makes severe and unnecessary cuts to the CSP. This $40 million cut would not only hurt grantees, but ultimately harm students and teachers in rural and urban areas alike. 
My amendment is simple. It restores the CSP to FY22 enacted levels, which is also the same as the President's FY23 request for the program. The offset comes from the departmental management account, which received a 95.8 million increase. This increase would fund salary increases and travel at the department. Instead of funding more bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., let's use our taxpayer dollars to support a program that helps our nation's students. While I intend to withdraw this amendment, I wanted to highlight the role charter schools play in our communities and the importance of appropriately funding this program at the Department of Education. I would respectfully ask the chair to work with us as this bill goes forward in conference to address these critical educational needs. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back my time. I thank the gentlelady and I look forward to working together. In the meantime, I rise in, in opposition of the amendment. Uh, we've had a lot of spirited discussions about charter schools on the Labor HHS subcommittee, uh, and there are some differences of opinion uh, around the role that they should play in our public education system, and whether or not, really, quite honestly, they receive appropriate oversight by the Department of Education. Um, uh, for the charter school program, provides seed money to open new charter schools around the country. We should be in agreement on one point, that the program is far more money than the Department of Education really knows what to do with. In 2019, months after Secretary DeVos pleaded with the subcommittee um, for a $60 million increase to the charter school program, the department approached us at that time. Now, keep in mind that this is uh, uh, Secretary DeVos. This is a Republican administration. The department approached us with warnings that demand for funding was low. Sure enough, before the end of the year, the department was unable to use the full appropriation and transferred $12 million to other education accounts, almost about 3 percent of the program's appropriation. In addition, the committee has discussed issues raised by the inspector general, including findings that states mismanaged charter school closures and that the department failed to provide adequate guidance or oversight on the issue, which is why we need to continue the oversight of the charter school program uh, with respect to accountability and transparency. Finally, the offset, I'm troubled by the offset, which I find un, uh, unacceptable. The departments uh, of, uh, of education staff implement vital programs that improve the lives of our kids and families. They ensure schools are delivering, that's a nice ringtone, okay. <laughs> They ensure schools are delivering on their responsibilities to support the most vulnerable, including kids with disabilities, English learners, homeless youth. A cut of the magnitude, I think, would be, would be devastating to those efforts. So again, as I said, uh, I look forward to uh, working uh, with the gentlelady on, 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 on reviewing this and see where we need to go. But as I, as I so stated, I, I oppose the amendment. But uh, I, uh, I don't know if anyone else wishes to speak on it. I, I would, Mr. Molinar, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I do appreciate your offer to work with the uh, gentlelady from Louisiana uh, in support of the, what she's trying to accomplish. I, I do want to highlight that I, I think she has a very strong educational background, and and I believe that this is a very reasonable approach that would promote stability in the program. Just keeping the funding at the enacted levels or the president's uh, recommendation. Uh, I am concerned that some of the uh, proposals uh, really have an anti-charter schools uh, bent to them uh, in our, our subcommittee. And it's very disappointing because I have seen firsthand the benefits for children in charter schools and, and would hope that the committee would not, uh, you know, continue to chip away at the progress that's being made at charter schools. But I do appreciate very much your offer to work with uh, the sponsor of this amendment and uh, just wanted to support that. I would just say, Mr. Molinar, that I, I have, I believe charter schools have a, a, a role to play in our uh, a, 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 a education system. I, I don't b believe that they, our public education systems should be supplanted. And I think uh, that there are schools that, uh, charter schools that are doing very well and there are some that are just failing, and I think we have to have a, 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 some oversight as to what is working and what isn't working. And as I said in the earlier commentary, you know, some of these efforts that are run by these EMOs, et cetera, it really is basically a money-making 
uh, 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 effort, and it hasn't worked into the best interest of, of our kids. And I, I appreciate, and I appreciate the educational background of the gentle lady, and again, would look forward to working with her on, the, on this effort. It's all about providing the best opportunity uh, for our kids and their education. Uh, and I think that's the laudable goal that we all want to try to uh, uh, succeed at. So uh, I thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any further comments? If not, the gentlelady is recognized to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. I look forward to working with you to find consensus on that. Our children deserve it. And I ask unanimous consent to withdraw the amendment. Without objection. Further amendments? Mr. Molinar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk and ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, this amendment would prohibit the agencies covered by uh, the vaccine, by this act, from implementing and enforcing a vaccine mandate on the American people. Uh, last year, the Biden administration tried to impose a vaccine mandate on one, more than 100 million Americans at their workplace. The Biden administration's proposal tried to force private employers in the country to enforce a vaccine mandate on its employees or implement a rigorous and costly testing requirement. It was also arbitrary. The proposal applied only to businesses with 100 or more employees and there was no reason or scientific evidence for why that number was 100 instead of 10 or 200 or 500. There's simply nothing in the Constitution that allows the federal government to impose this mandate on private businesses. In fact, last July, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki was asked about a vaccine mandate on private citizens, and she said, and I quote, that is not the role of the federal government, end quote. Yet just two months later, the administration reversed course and started doing what it had said it was not the government's job to do. We've also seen the costly effects of vaccine mandates in healthcare, with thousands of healthcare workers leaving their jobs because of the CMS requirement the Biden administration implemented. These were our frontline heroes. Today, we can limit the size and role of the federal government in American life. We can ensure that the federal government will not force Americans to choose between a vaccine and their job. And I ask for a yes vote and yield back. We seem to be in opposition with one another here today, Mr. Mullen. <laughs> I rise in opposition to this amendment. Vaccines work and they are the most effective scientific tool we have in combating COVID-19. The best thing a person can do to protect themselves from COVID-19 is to get vaccinated and boosted. The vaccines have been determined to be safe and effective by scientific experts, and to date, nearly 600 million vaccine doses have been administered in the United States. The doomsday scenarios that those opposed to vaccine mandates predicted did not materialize. We did not see dramatic staff losses from mandates. Vaccinated workers are instead more likely to be available to work since they are less likely to get sick. Increasing the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccines, including the booster shot, is the most important tool against staffing shortages to keep our economy going. We should not be limiting the administration from working to get our nation out of this pandemic by limiting the use of our most effective public health tools. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. <clears throat> Are there any members wishing to be heard on this amendment? Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to what I believe is a short-sighted and frankly terribly ironic amendment. This amendment seeks to prevent the federal government from using funds to develop, implement, administer, or enforce any rule that requires COVID-19 vaccinations. It blocks a path out of the pandemic and back to a way of life that is normal. And at a time when we average over 300 daily COVID deaths with a vaccination rate that barely reaches herd immunity levels. Only vaccines lift us from this pandemic, yet for two plus years now, sound public health and science experts are questioned, ignored, and eroded by partisan politics. This pandemic is now a political weapon used to divide our ailing nation. It is unbelievable and utterly hypocritical that colleagues on the other side of the aisle 
especially the governor in my home state, rail against testing, masks, and vaccine requirements under the guise that it is government-mandated care, yet they demand women turn over their bodies to the state if they become pregnant. According to this inconsistent, hypocritical position, getting vaccinated for the public good of the nation is tyranny. Forcing women to forsake their bodies, health, and future, that's supposedly morality. Putting aside this rank hypocrisy, both positions pushed by the other side are erroneous, harmful, and contrary to basic public health principles and science. We are now in the third year of this pandemic, and only 65% of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccines are proven to be safe and effective with ample data showing a drastic, a drastic difference in mortality and hospitalization rates between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Yet because of misinformation fueled by Republican leaders, especially in my home state of Florida and here in Congress, we failed to reach critical vaccination levels to end this pandemic. We now annually suffer, suffer through surges in new variants because public health and science experts are ignored. Around and around we go, always fueling the spread, never moving forward the way we should. Aren't you tired of living in fear for your own and your loved one's health? Don't you think businesses are sick of this uncertainty? We have several colleagues who couldn't even be here today because COVID is still not in check the way it could be. We now have the tools we need to end this pandemic, but we just need forward thinking, pro-health policies. If we work together, rather than erect barriers, we can save, save lives and beat this virus, but this amendment does the opposite. Madam Chair, I rise in stark opposition to this amendment because it handcuffs the federal government from protecting public health and further mires us in this pandemic and all just to pander to an extremist, right-wing, anti-science political base. I urge my colleagues to vote against the amendment and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There's no further debate. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in closing, I would just say that the American people and businesses across the country want certainty that the Biden administration will not use a one-size-fits-all mandate to force Americans to choose between their jobs and a vaccine. Uh, these one-size-fits-all mandates don't even account for things such as infe infection-based immunities, uh, other factors. And uh, this amend amendment will ensure the Biden administration will not be allowed to use taxpayer funding to implement or enforce such a mandate. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The amendment is not adopted. Are there further uh, recorded votes? Gentlemen, ask for a recorded vote. All those in favor of a recorded vote, please raise your hands. Okay. S sufficient number being, uh, being in support of a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes cool. no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ and, votes uh, no. Mr. Cuellar. No. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Ms. Granger. Aye. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. 
No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Aye. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roy Allard. Ms. Roy Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Ms. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. So anyone wishes to change their vote or record their vote? Anybody else? Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 24, the nays are 32, and the amendment is not adopted. Mr. Klein is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have Klein, too, at the desk. Ask to be considered as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Speak Thank you, Madam speech. Chair and Ranking Member Granger. This amendment would ensure that no funds could be used by the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the purposes of gun control to declare a public health emergency. According to reports, the Biden administration has contemplated the idea of declaring gun violence as a public health emergency in order to take radical, extreme, and unconstitutional action to violate the Second Amendment rights of American citizens, something you find in uh, third world uh, dictatorships and among despots around the world. We do not need American tax dollars going toward restrictive gun laws that are detrimental to the rights of law-abiding citizens. We were all sent by our constituents to Washington to uphold and defend the Constitution. We should not stand by and allow taxpayer dollars to be used in contravention to the decisions of this body, the Congress, uh, decisions that waste time, money, and resources on efforts to undermine constitutional rights. The Second Amendment affirms the rights of Americans to self-defense and to protect their families, their homes, their property, Americans bought almost 20 million guns last year, the second highest year on record. These are individuals who are looking to defend themselves and their families after dramatic increases in crime and civil unrest across the country. That's why this amendment is critical for protecting the Second Amendment rights for all Americans. I urge my colleagues to adopt this amendment, uphold our Constitution, uphold the rights of Americans, and uphold the responsibility of this legislative body to make the laws, to make the decisions affecting those rights, not to leave it to an executive in a misreading of the Constitution. I yield back. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Section 319 of the Public Health Services Act gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the power to declare a public health emergency, which has been recently done for COVID, wildfires, and opioids. However, this amendment is not necessary, as this bill continues to include the Dickey Amendment, which states, and I quote, none of the funds made available in this title may be used in whole or in part to advocate or promote gun control, end quote. I would argue that the Secretary should review whether gun violence meets the criteria for a public health emergency given that firearm deaths continue to be a growing public health threat in the United States. In 2020, 53% of all suicides involved firearms, and 79% of all homicides involved firearms, 
a 35% increase from the prior year. In response to this crisis, I am proud that in fiscal year 2020, this bill provided the first funding in more than two decades to address firearm violence with a total of $25 million to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institutes of Health. The fiscal year 2023 bill before us today more than doubles the total funding to $60 million to support research to identify the most effective ways to prevent firearm-related injuries and deaths and to broaden firearm injury data collection. Gun violence is everywhere in our society. Our children are not safe at school. Shoppers are not safe at the grocery store. Worship, worshipers are not safe at church. This amendment is not necessary, as the bill already prohibits efforts related to the promotion or advocacy of gun control. Let's focus on comprehensive strategies that can help to prevent gun violence. I oppose this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to oppose it as well. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. I mean, my God, if gun violence hasn't become a public health in, in emergency, what other evidence do you need? Uh, Americans are dying in massive numbers from gun violence. The numbers are ghastly. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death for our children. More than 110 Americans die from a firearm every day. Basically, in, in the time it takes for us to have this debate, another American life will be snuffed out by a gun. Over one million Americans were shot in the last decade, and in 2020, gun deaths reached their highest level in at least 40 years, with 45,222 deaths that year alone. Communities victimized by mass shootings are all seared in our mind now. Uvalde, Buffalo, Tulsa, Parkland, Las Vegas, Orlando, the carnage never stops. What will it take to finally get my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to stop praying at the altar of the gun lobby, to finally reject this false idol? How many more children, parents, and friends must die before we can finally stop debating common sense gun reform? We are morally obligated to do all we can to keep our communities safer, and we must have every tool at our disposal. This amendment would prevent us from protecting American lives by prohibiting the declaration of a public health emergency, which should be left to public health experts. We need a whole of government effort to address this gun violence public health crisis and ensure the safety of all, of all American families. And we cannot do this if we are stymied by partisan measures that this amendment seeks to impose. The human and financial toll of gun violence is too enormous and too horrific to impose these really unsafe inappropriate regulations and limitations. And I urge my colleagues to vote no on this harmful amendment, and I yield back. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I find this amendment insidious. It continues a propaganda campaign that if we are trying to prevent and reduce the effects of gun violence in this country, that that translates into taking away Second Amendment rights. We can do both things, protect and responsible gun ownership and address the public health crisis that we have. And this intertwining, this propaganda campaign that if we try and do anything to move forward on reducing gun violence, this is the government coming for your guns, has wrought disaster and trauma on this country. People do not feel safe. We have seen our children and our neighbors massacred in their schools, at movie theaters, in, in their churches, their mosques, their synagogues, the nightclubs. When is it going to stop? If there was a virus that in a matter of minutes could be spread from child to child, from teacher to child in a classroom and would liquefy their organs and cause them to bleed to death, we would do everything in our power to address that public health crisis. How have we become this? We know that veterans, our veterans, are at high risk for dying from self-inflicted gunshots. 
one and a half times higher rate for veterans than anyone else. And using a firearm, 70% of male veteran suicide deaths. Yet one Republican appropriator on this committee voted for a bipartisan bill that would have helped us have red flag laws. The research has shown us that if we can delay someone who is suicidal from getting their hands on a firearm for 10 minutes, we can potentially save their lives. We have come together in this Congress around issues like opioids and say these are dangerous to people. Let's do something to help reduce them. Former Representative Dickey has said, scientific research should be conducted to reduce gun injuries and fatalities. Now is the time that we address that not only is this a national trauma, a national outrage, but it costs the U.S. more than $280 billion annually in medical care, criminal justice costs, employer costs, and work loss. We have to do better. We have to come together as a country and work on this issue as what it is, a public health crisis. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel, you wish to Ms. Flexible. Ms. Lawrence. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition. This year so far, we have had over 250,000 mass shootings. I'm sorry, 250 mass shootings. And this amendment is completely tone deaf. It ignores the crisis and the reality of what's happening in America. It just, it's just so amazing to me that every time we have a mass shooting, that my colleagues will stand up, bow their head, and have a moment of silence. I was told early on that prayer without deeds is void. You must give the, uh, the rights and freedoms to, to the people based on a constitution. But how dare you say, my thoughts and prayers are with you, now give me my gun. We know that nowhere in this proposal do we see any mention of taking away guns. It's studying the health crisis. And whether you live in, on a farm or you live in the, a major metropolitan city, guns are the number one killer in America. And we cannot be toned up. This is not a partisan issue. Let's look at some facts. In 2020, firearms were involved in 79% of homicides and 53% of suicides. Any of us who, have, who know someone who was killed in a gun accident and a gun violence know that it is so fatal. It is a gun, the whole purpose of a gun, because I, I smile when I hear people saying, I need ammunition because I like to shoot guns. The only reason for a gun is to kill something. It's a bullet. It's designed to have the, the force and the power to penetrate something to the point of death. And so what we're saying is that in 2020, firearms became the leading cause of death also among children. We're, if we've been debating to nauseam, I want to protect children, the life of a child. But here we are, we're always saying we want to study why are we having so many deaths, especially with our children, with the guns, and you're opposing that? And I'm standing here as a black woman and a mother of two beautiful children and an amazing granddaughter. I too understand the beauty of parenthood, of motherhood and of giving birth. 
black children are also four times more likely to be killed by firearms than a white child. So I'm speaking from a point of passion and reality. If our children are falling victim to gun violence, this is not, is this not a public health emergency? Then I don't know what is. The mass shooting that happened here in Michigan, a high school, Oxford High School, where a child, an 18 year old child, went into his school and killed children and then died as a result of gun violence himself. I urge his parents bought him the gun. That's a whole nother story. His parents bought him the gun and he used that gun to go to a school and to kill his classmates. Your thoughts and prayers are enough here and you're a sitting member of Congress. You have the power to invoke our government to study and find out how we can start saving lives. You don't want to do that, but you want to debate, oh, abortion is like the only thing that you care about in this world. These are children who are dying from gun violence. Guns, G-U-N-S. Your thoughts and prayers are not going to fix it. Let's get our job done. Let's allow our federal government to study this and give us a report. And then at least we can do more and tell the parents who are suffering right now and mourning the death of their children that did nothing but sent their child to school. And now that child is dead. Thank you. And I yield back. Ms. Lee of California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I rise in opposition to this amendment. Gun violence is a national public health crisis that endangers every single community in our nation, including all of yours, uh, also in my congressional district. As a result, our movie theaters, places of worship, schools, and streets are subject to senseless violence and bloodshed, resulting in more than 45,000 in deaths from gun-related injuries in 2020. This number excludes deaths in which gunshot injuries were involved but did not play a leading role. Alarmingly, a firearm was involved in almost eight out of 10 murders and over half of suicides in the United States. We are seeing the highest rates of increase since the mid-90s. When people die, Madam Chair and members, at these alarming rates, it's a public health crisis, a public health crisis. Gun violence impacts all Americans, and communities of color are especially devastated by our nation's lack of gun safety laws. African Americans are more than four times likely to be killed by a gun compared to its overall population, and 12 times more likely than a white individual. It is a public health crisis. This madness must end. It's time for Congress to get off of the sidelines and take action to prevent all of these too frequent and avoidable tragedies. And we've got to take a comprehensive approach to addressing the violence, including common sense gun reforms to ensure thorough background checks, close loopholes, get weapons of war off of our streets. And we need to analyze and respond to this crisis for what it is. It's a public health issue. It's a public health crisis that's taking the lives and the health of tens of thousands of people in our country each year. How can anyone say it's not a public health crisis? Anyone. No family in America has, should have to live in fear from gun violence. So I urge a no vote on this amendment. It's a common sense amendment. I don't know what would be considered a public health crisis if it were not gun violence. Thank you, and I yield the balance of my time. Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, what you've just heard is the best argument for the need for this amendment because there are calls to use a public health emergency to declare it for the purpose of gun control. Now, just to correct a misstatement, gun violence is not the leading cause of death in children. Motor vehicle accidents are. Just look it up. It's in New England Journal of Medicine. This is public information. Well, we haven't declared motor vehicle. Motor vehicles a public health emergency for the purpose of motor vehicle control. Well, that's interesting. It was mentioned that uh, you, know, we, we, you, you make it similar to opioids, but opioids are not mentioned as a right to keep and bear opioids in the Constitution. 
the right to keep and bear arms is mentioned in the Constitution. And the Supreme Court specifically says it's an individual's right to keep and bear arms to defend themselves and, them, and their families. Look, Uvalde is a tragedy. There's no question about it. But one of the simple answers to attempting to decrease the amount of gun violence is actually to enforce gun laws. What a novel thought. In Baltimore two days ago, a police sergeant was dragged two blocks when he attempted to, when he did a traffic stop on a car, which was driven by a 36-year-old gentleman who was wanted for attempted murder, who had had two previous plea bargains on attempted murder with use of a gun, plea bargain to less than two years in jail and released. And he, and he was on probation from that as he almost killed this police officer. Where in the world do we have a justice system where someone plea bargains down a gun or a public defender, we have a problem with our public defenders around the country, plea, plea bargain down a gun crime involving attempted murder to less than two years. I would suggest that if we want, we want to put an end to some of the gun violence, that instead of declaring a public health emergency for the purpose of gun control, maybe we declare a public defender emergency in this country for the purposes of prosecuting people who, convict, who, who should be convicted and sentenced and jailed for possession of a firearm. Don't go after law-abiding citizens. Every law-abiding citizen in this country has a right under the Second Amendment to keep and bear arms to defend themselves and their families. And yes, tragedies do occur, but more tragedies occur with children with motor vehicles than firearms, and yet I don't hear a call for a public health emergency to, for motor vehicle control to protect our children. Madam Chair, I support the amendment and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Quickly. So I'm reading from the New England Journal of Medicine. Quote, the previous analysis which examined data through 2016 showed that firearm-related deaths were second only to motor vehicle crashes, both traffic and non-traffic, and the leading cause of death among children and adolescents. Since 2016, that gap has narrowed and in 2020, firearm-related injuries became the leading cause of death in that age group. Thank you. Ms. Underwood? Madam Chair, I was going to raise that same citation from the May 19th, 2022 issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, which firmly establishes firearms as the leading cause of death for Americans' children and adolescents. We are meeting the moment that the American people are asking for by passing this bill today, and I thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership. I thank the gentlelady, I thank the chair for yielding, and I thank the gentlelady for her comments. I, my colleague from California and I um, don't agree on a lot, but uh, when it comes to the authorization of the use of the military force, we agree when it comes to um, the need to change our marijuana laws at the federal level, we agree. But when it comes to um, the issue of Second Amendment rights, we disagree. But we do agree that it is Congress's job to make those laws, not to cede responsibility to the executive branch, abandon our constitutional responsibilities, and give him the right to implement gun control under the guise of a public health emergency. Insidious, my colleague from Massachusetts called it insidious. I think the insidious action would be to, to push gun control uh, from the White House under the declaration of a public health emergency. That is something that you see in third world countries, the attempt to disarm the citizenry under emergency powers. We operate under the Constitution gives this body the responsibility to act with regard to Second Amendment rights. And I don't know that uh, 
the other side will ever stop trying to implement more and more gun control. The president just signed a law last week implementing additional gun control. I voted no, I objected to it, but uh, here we are again uh, with clamoring from the other side for additional gun control. I think that at the very least, this is the body it should be debated in, not the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. So I would ask you to support this amendment and protect the Constitution. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those, aye. Op all those opposed say no. 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 In, the <laughs> in the opinion of the chair, um, the no's have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Newhouse is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk and would ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment would require all COVID-19 related national states of emergency to be lifted before Title 42 is officially terminated. The bill, uh, the amendment would ensure the administration coordinates and communicates with border communities and puts a comprehensive workable plan in place before lifting Title 42. The amendment specifically delays the administration's planned end to Title 42 for at least 60 days. You know, after the end of the national emergency, the Department of Homeland Security, in consultation with border states, would have up to 30 days to submit to Congress a plan to address the impacts of the post-Title 42 migrant influx. I believe the Biden administration was wrong to set an end date on Title 42 without a comprehensive plan. I'm particularly glad that a federal judge agreed that ending Title 42 would place irreparable harm on our communities. The administration has declared the pandemic over, over at the border. It allows the entry of illegal immigrants and movement throughout the country. Still, Many federal restrictions remain in place for healthcare workers, for our military, for legal travelers that are trying to come into our country. Restrictions remain in place, including for critical H-2A visa holders, which creates huge headaches and challenges for our nation's farmers who are already hurting for labor. Let me give you an example. We're allowing illegal immigrants into the country and distributing them throughout the United States with little regard to testing or vaccine status. And yet, farmers are being challenged and not being allowed to help legal visa holders, legal H-2A visa holders, into the country and receive vaccines in the United States. It's something we did last year. It worked very successfully. We should be able to do it again. The administration, I don't think, can have it both ways. If, if they think it's safe to lift Title 42 at the border, then it should be safe to lift the COVID state of emergency for the entire country. I think we all agree on many things, and one of them is that our southern border is at a crisis point. Particularly looking at today's Supreme Court decision regarding the Remain in Mexico policy, which will now be up to the the administration has the ability to end that policy. If you add on top of that the removal of Title 42, Madam Chair, we may as well put up a large green light at our border, inviting people to come. Our communities, our country, will bear the brunt of this decision if Title 42 is lifted without a plan without a response, without an ability for the Border Patrol to do their job. So I believe it is up to us as a people's representatives to take action if the administration won't and to step up. And this amendment is one step in the right direction and I would urge a yes vote. Thank you and I'll yield back. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. 
This amendment inappropriately links the COVID-19 public health emergency declaration and CDC's Title 42 authority. The public health emergency is a necessary declaration that allows for <laughs> ongoing efforts to address COVID-19, including testing, treatments, and vaccines, and FDA emergency use authorizations. These factors may require the public health emergency declaration to remain in place long after the pandemic has subsided. The purpose of Title 42 is to prevent the introduction and spread of infectious diseases. On April 1, 2022, following a reassessment, CDC issued a termination of its Title 42 order, as it was no longer necessary given the status of the global pandemic and the increased availability of public health tools to limit the impact of COVID-19, such as highly effective vaccines and therapeutics. CDC determined that suspending the right to introduce non-citizens into the United States is no longer necessary to reduce the risk of COVID-19 introduction, transmission, and spread into the country. Title 42 is not and was never meant to be an immigration enforcement policy. As a nation, we need better managed borders. <laughs> But we also need serious proposals rather than political ploys. As, a, as an immigration enforcement policy, Title 42 is a failure. Individuals who are likely to be expelled under Title 42 taking, <clears throat> take increasingly dangerous paths to evade the Border Patrol, leading to injuries and deaths just this week. There was the deadliest human smuggling incident in U.S. history. 53 people have died so far in an abandoned tractor trailer outside of San Antonio. Some of the victims could be younger than 18 years old. Our nation's response to COVID-19 should not be hindered by being linked to Title 42. These declarations are separate in purpose and in effect and must not be tied together. Efforts such as this amendment have no public health justification, and thus this amendment is not appropriate for consideration in this bill. But I suspect that for many people, public health concerns are not the primary rationale for the continuation of Title 42. Immigration issues were considered by this committee during the Homeland Security markup. Today, we are focused on education, health, and labor, and the underlying purpose of this, amend, of this amendment is not intended to address any of those topics. I strongly oppose this amendment, and I urge my colleagues to oppose it as well. Are there other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? M Mr. Garcia? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd uh, like to speak in strong support of the gentleman from Washington's amendment. Title 42 is still a very critical uh, asset uh, in our fight against this virus that still, uh, in the words of uh, the folks in this room earlier, is, is plaguing our society, plaguing uh, our, our country, and still leading to deaths. We've talked about earlier the fact that we need to continue uh, from the colleagues across the aisle to, to mandate vaccines within private workforces for the sake of public health, uh, we, we still have the option to have Zoom calls. And as you stated earlier, Madam Chair, we have several members of this committee who have COVID right now, and uh, that poses a significant health risk. Uh, and we still allow members of Congress to have proxy votes on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and so you can't have it both ways. You can't say that uh, for the safety of members of Congress, we're willing to have these, uh, these policies in place. But for the safety and the security of our entire nation, we're not willing to enforce this policy on our own southern border. I, I don't know how many folks uh, across the aisle have actually been to the southern border. I know Mr. Cuellar has been uh, a, a proponent of taking all necessary steps to ensure our nation's security. Uh, I've been down there a few times, and, and I can tell you that the number one thing that, that we are told 
is, first of all, we, it would be nice to, to secure the border. This is what the Border Patrol agents say. If we can hire more people, get the technology, uh, but actually secure the border, that would be nice. But in the absence of these things that, that the Democrats uh, are, are, are uh, uh, just adamant and not supporting, uh, the least they can do is to ensure that Title 42 does not go away. This is literally the only uh, opportunity they have right now to not only secure the border and, and, and mitigate the, the, the humanitarian disaster at our southern border, uh, but also to ensure that COVID doesn't run rampant into our nation as a result of the poor southern border. Uh, this is a universal uh, feedback that we're hearing from almost every single Border Patrol agent down there. Uh, the revocation of Title 42 is an unnecessary risk to our nation's security uh, and to the nation's public health crisis that we uh, are still in to this day because of uh, the reasons that you have uh, also asserted earlier. Uh, so I, I recommend strong support for this. Uh, let's not take away levers to our national security. Uh, and I urge a uh, yes vote on the gentleman's amendment. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I rise against this amendment. Title 42, which was implemented by the previous administration is being used as an immigration tool, not a health tool. It blocks people in need of protection from seeking asylum indefinitely without so much as a screening for asylum eligibility. It sends asylum seekers back to Mexico where they are vulnerable to kidnapping and violent assault or back to the violence they fled in their countries of origin. In the last 18 months, there have been over 10,250 reported violent attacks, kidnapping, including kidnapping and rape against people expelled to Mexico under Title 42. Title 42 policy was never justified as a public health measure. Senior CDC experts objected to the policy at its inception. Epidemiologists and medical experts have repeatedly confirmed that the Title 42 policy undermines public health responses to COVID-19 and that the pandemic, including emerging variants, can be addressed through existing precautions, such as offering vaccinations, testing, masking, and avoiding the use of congregate detention. Epidemiologists and public health experts have repeatedly said that we can both protect public health and the lives of people seeking refuge from using the kind of public health measures we all now use. And finally, this committee voted on a similar amendment in last week's homeland bill. By passing this amendment, we are not only doubling down on this horrific policy, we're also causing a potential confusion in laws since such amendments are different in how long Title 42 must remain in place. This confusion will be felt at the border and by those that are seeking asylum. I urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment. Madam Chair, I uh, yield back. Mr. Aspayat. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong opposition to the proposed amendment. In April of this year, the CDC joined the broad consensus of other healthcare scientists and experts' uh, opinion in concluding that processing asylum applicant does not pose a threat to public health. As our scientific ex experts have noted time and time again, there is no public health justification for expelling asylum seekers from the U.S. This amendment dangerously ties asylum restrictions to the COVID emergency declaration, a declaration that bears no relationship whatsoever to an individual's legal right to seek asylum in this country. Furthermore, due to the gravity of the COVID pandemic, the emergency declaration may very well be in place long after the pandemic has totally subsided. This means that if we adopt this amendment, the U.S. will continue to deny pregnant women, children, and vulnerable populations asylum access for an indefinite period of time. That's un-American. That's not what America stands for. We are a beacon of hope, of opportunity. We allow people to come in from other countries if they feel their life is in danger, if they're war-torn, war if they experience a, a horrible natural disaster, if they feel the families are being persecuted unjustly by a ruthless government, they could come to these United States. That's what we stand for. And so this uh, amendment puts that in jeopardy. 
Recently, we all heard of the heart-wrenching tragedy of 50 migrants found dead in San Antonio. We must acknowledge that this tragedy was not only because of the human smugglers, but also because immigrants are turning to even more dangerous alternatives as the U.S. made it nearly impossible to seek asylum at our borders. Madam Chair, this amendment has nothing to do with public health and would only continue to expose asylum seekers to greater harm. I strongly oppose it and urge my colleagues to vote no. I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Seeing none. I just might say to Mr. Garcia, I think most members on this side of the aisle have been to the border uh, several times over. And particularly, we were there when the prior administration made it a policy to separate uh, children from their families. Uh, a very tragic situation, which in, in some instances, these parents have not been reunited with their families. There are still some cases where there has been no reunification. Let me recognize the gentleman uh, <clears throat> from Washington uh, to, to, to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and I do appreciate the varying opinions on, on this issue. <clears throat> um, but I do want to make people think about the inconsistency that I hear coming from particularly your side of the aisle. If, if the state of emergency and the COVID-19 restrictions have nothing to do with people coming across the border, which as just our previous speaker just said, then why? Why are we putting undue restrictions on legal visa holders coming into the United States, on legal travelers trying to enter, whether the southern, northern border, doesn't matter. Why are those restrictions in place? And yet, illegal travelers, as soon as they present themselves seeking asylum, we allow them to come in. Some, of them, some are being tested, some are being vaccinated. We don't have a, very good records on that. That just seems, and then they're being bused around the country, or flown around the country to your communities, to my community. Now, th this is, this isn't about anything except consistency. If we have an emergency, let's, let's acknowledge that. And like my friends talked about, we have protocols in place even in this very room that we are following. Shouldn't we follow those same kinds of protocols at our southern border consistently for all people? In my own state, my governor still holds emergency powers granted to him by the legislature because of the pandemic. We still have an emergency, at least according to some, but I think we need to be consistent here, and I'm asking you to, to, to look at this in a way that we, as, as a legislative body, can, can make sure that the rules that are in place apply equally to everyone. So with that, Madam Chair, I would ask a yes vote on this amendment and appreciate the discussion and the debate. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Washington. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Okay. Is there any further amendment or discussion? Bolinar. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? I rise to speak on the misclassification of independent workers in report language on page 25 of the bill report. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm concerned about language in the report accompanying this legislation regarding independent contractor status. The language in the report does not recognize that there are legitimate uses for independent contractor status that have had much success over generations, such as drivers, writers, and salespeople. In a time of flexible work policies and work from home, independent contractors are able to choose when, where, and how they want to work. This leads to incredible satisfaction with their jobs. In fact, a recent survey of over 600 independent contractors showed that about 90% of respondents were either somewhat or very satisfied with their independent work style. It also felt, found that they felt empowered 
and like they were no longer stuck in a bad economic situation. With their flexible status, they were able to pursue new opportunities, supplement their incomes, and find balance between their occupation and their family. The language clearly in this report requests a sense of Congress that the U.S. Department of Labor promulgate a rule regarding independent contractor status. This would be a step backward for workers, and it would create new burdensome regulations on workers who are enjoying unprecedented flexibility and satisfaction. The committee should continue to allow freedom and flexibility for American workers, especially as the role of work continues to change in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Comment, worker misclassification is one of the most pernicious forms of wage theft against American workers. By classifying employees as independent contractors, employers are able to escape responsibility for complying with basic federal wage and hour protections, such as overtime and minimum wage pay. Improperly classified contractors do not have access to unemployment insurance, leaving low-wage workers without access to unemployment benefits after becoming employed through no fault of their own. The Economic Policy Institute estimates wage theft, including wage theft through misclassification, costs workers $50 billion annually. This bill fights misclassification and wage theft by increasing wage and, the wage and hour division enforcement by 62 million dollars. Is there any further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, I want to take a moment now to thank and recognize our members uh, after completing their final Appropriations Committee markup this afternoon. You have been instrumental in shaping the work we have been able to do this Congress and over the past several decades. Our country is indebted to you for your years of service. I am personally grateful for your partnership and friendship. Chairman Price, Chairwoman Roy Allard, Chairman Ryan, Congresswoman Bustos, Congresswoman Lawrence, Congressman Christ, Congresswoman Kirkpatrick, and Congressman Palazzo, we thank you so much, and we will miss you all very dearly. A moment, if I might, to thank uh, uh, others completed the 12 bills, you are looking at a staff of all of these subcommittees who have been up day and night and night and day, the long day's journey into the night, to make sure we had what we needed to be able to get through uh, these, uh, th 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 this effort. So let me just take a second to the front office. Robin Giuliano, Matt Washington, Ryan Kinney, Adam Berg, Raquel Spencer, Adam Wilson, Jason Gray, Alex Swan, Caitlin Thorpe, Celine Wolf, Dana Roisman, Mal Malachi White, Tom Tucker, Sebastian Franco, Jim Cahill, Kathy Edwards, Kathy Little, Eric Jacobson, Lori Bias, Lonnie Johnson, Heather Nelson. From the minority, Anne Marie Schotvax, Johnny Caberly, Austin Agrella, Alyssa Hinman, uh, uh, Brennan Tijelmaland, Sarah Peters, Alex Atterbury, Sarah Flam, and Alec Davis. And a big thank you to the subcommittee clerks, Martha Foley with Ag, Bob Bonner with CJS, Chris Bigelow with Defense, Jamie Schimmick with Energy and Water, Matt Smith with Financial Services, Derek Newby with Homeland, Rita Culp with Interior, Stephen Steglider with Labor HHS, Faye Cobb with Ledge Branch, Jerry, Jenny Nuschler with Milcon, uh, VA, Aaron Kolodzewski with SFOPS, and Christina Monroe with THUD. Thanks to my personal staff, Becky Sale, Jack Rayburn, Marie Gualtieri, Caitlin Peruccio, Harper Wright, Victor Dolberg, King Green, John Nyrider, Jamie LaRue, Molly Opinski, and Marone Kahasai. And thank you to all of the personal offices and associate staff members. Thank you to Ledge Council for their drafting assistance and to the Congressional Budget Office the scorekeeping unit for their analysis. None of this would be there, would be possible without their hard work. On behalf of all of the members of this committee, we say thank you. And now I will recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio for a motion and ask for your support on this bill. 
Madam Chair, I move to favorably report the Departments of Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education and Related Agencies, Appropriations Act 2023 to the House. Questions on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call vote. The recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, please raise your hand. I have three people. <laughs> Do you want a roll call vote? I want a roll call. Let's go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar votes aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mrs. Bustos. Yes. Mrs. Bustos votes aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Case. Thank Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Christ. Aye. Mr. Christ votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Ms. Deloro. Aye. Ms. Deloro votes aye. Mr. Diaz Bellart. Mr. Diaz Bellart votes no. Mr. Espayat. Aye. Mr. Espayat votes aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman votes no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes aye. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger votes no. Mr. Harder. Aye. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mrs. Henson. Mrs. Henson votes no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor votes aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mr. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, you're muted. Aye. Mrs. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes aye. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes no. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes aye. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. Ms. Meng votes aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes no. Mr. Palazzo. No. Mr. Palazzo votes no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree votes aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes no. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan votes aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes no. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres votes aye. Mr. Trone. Aye. Mr. Trone votes aye. Ms. Underwood. Aye. Ms. Underwood votes aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Amade votes no. Mr. Amade votes no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? What you got, Debbie? What you got? Oh. Up like 10 pounds. Appropriations. So we don't ask any questions. are 32, the nays are 24, the bill is passed. Yay!
I ask unanimously the extent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the bill and report just approved. Seeing no objections, so ordered. Ms. Granger. Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call vote. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Madam Chairman, I ask for three days for the minority to file All public members. views. <laughs> All members of this one? All, no members. Without objection. This is about roads and bridges. of the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2023. I now recognize Mr. Quigley to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. In a moment, I'll talk about the mark itself, but first, I want to thank the staff on both sides. Suspend. Shh. I know people are anxious to move, so let's move. Okay. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Mr. Quigley. On the majority side, that includes Christina, Winnie, Josephine, Xavier, Rachel, and Samita. For the minority, Doug and Alyssa. I'd also like to thank Ranking Member Diaz Ballard for his collaboration throughout this process. Chair of the full committee, Ms. DeLauro, for her leadership and stewardship of the committee, <laughs> as well as the committee's distinguished ranking member, Ms. Granger. And finally, Chairman Price for a steady leadership of THUD subcommittee. It has been a tremendous honor to work alongside him, and I know his impact will be felt long after his retirement this year. I want to thank him for his service, and our thoughts are with him and his family at this time. In total, this bill includes $90.9 .9 billion in discretionary funding, an increase of $9.9 .9 billion over 2022. On the transportation side, the bill includes a total of $105.4 billion for DLT, reflecting our continued commitment to modernization and safety across all modes of transportation. In line with the historic investment Congress made in our nation's transportation infrastructure last year through IIJA, the bill fully funds authorized levels for transit, highway, and safety formula grant programs. The bill also provides $646 million for transit infrastructure grants to help transit agencies purchase low and no emission buses, improve urban and rural ferry system, adopt innovative approaches to mobility and carry out local projects funded by member request. The bill also includes $3 billion for capital investment grants. I know for my own city, Chicago, this program will be key to continuing to improve, transform and expand our train and bus services. The bill provides $100 million for the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, which will assist communities with developing their transportation networks to improve transportation access for all while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Along the same line, the bill provides $55 million for the Healthy Streets Program to reduce our carbon footprint and make roadways safer for low-income communities. The bill takes great strides to invest in our nation's housing stock, providing $62.7 billion for HUD, an increase of $8.9 billion above 2022, notably be the bill includes $600 million for housing opportunities for persons with AIDS program to protect housing and services for more than 75,000 low-income people living with HIV and AIDS. We have long advocated for greater funding to support people living with HIV or AIDS, and I am pleased to see this reflected in the bill. It also provides $1.7 billion for home investment partnership program to construct new affordable housing and includes $50 million for a new down payment assistance program for first time, first generation home buyers. The bill continues our commitment to reduce incidents and the scale of homelessness by making common sense investments, including $3.6 billion for homeless assistance grants and $1.1 billion to help more than 140,000 individuals and families get off lengthy wait lists and also into housing. Finally, the bill provides $3.69 billion over <coughs> for over 1,800 community projects requested by 331 members on both sides, directing funding to key transportation, housing, and community development priorities. I am uh, aware that people want to thank uh, principally the leadership of this committee. Uh, they'll get those opportunities, but as the chairwoman has said, if you want to go, uh, we don't necessarily all have to say the same thing. 
I am very pleased how this bill will improve the lives of countless individuals across the country. We are taking action to expand safe and affordable housing and build equitable transportation networks throughout the nation. I look forward to discussing these issues today. Thank you, and I yield back. I would like to recognize the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Diaz Ballard. Madam Chairman, thank you so much for presenting the THUD bill to our committee today. I also want to thank uh, Ranking Member Granger for her leadership, her stewardship. Uh, Mr. Quigley, Vice Chairman Quigley, for standing in today and doing such a great do job for our good uh, friend, <coughs> Chairman Price. And obviously, all of our hearts go out to Chairman Price as he mourns the loss of his wife, Lisa. David and Lisa were true partners, and one can just imagine the tremendous loss that he's feeling. Now, David Price and I have worked on this bill together for nearly eight years. Not only has he, has he been an honorable partner, but he's also been and has become a good friend in this effort through these years. I will miss David, and I know that all of us will miss him on this committee, and this institution will miss David Price. Evidence of his life of service can be found in this bill, and frankly, his smart policy approach will live on in this bill for years to come, and obviously David's impact uh, extends way beyond just the Tihad bill. We all thank him for his life of service, and I look forward to working with him in the weeks and months ahead to finalize the Tihad bill. There are some really good parts and good things in this bill, and of course there are also some issues with it. The chairman uh, considered thousands of member requests, as Mr. Quigley just said, and I appreciate that he accommodated so many of them. I especially thank Chairman Price for a new manufactured housing initiative that will revitalize communities across our nation, something that he spent a lot of time, a lot of effort thinking and working on. Chairman Price listened to stakeholders and developed this innovative program with his characteristic deep understanding of policy and of the country. I thank the chairman for including $300 million for port infrastructure grants. Obviously, this is something that's important not only to coastal states, but to the freight, net, net, freight network across the country. Uh, Chairman Price and I and this subcommittee have always made safety a priority for DOT programs, and this bill continues in that tradition. The bill modernizes air traffic control systems to ensure that our airwaves are the safest in the entire world, and it makes key investments also in road and in rail safety. We also share a priority of supporting American innovation from automated vehicles to unmanned aircraft to commercial space, and the bill makes key investments in each one of those key areas. For HUD, over $3 billion uh, above last year in, is provided just to maintain HUD's current rental assistance program. I continue to believe that it is our responsibility to renew housing assistance, especially for the elderly, for the disabled, and for our veterans. I, chairman, I, I share the Chairman's priority for homeless assistance grants. I have seen such a positive results uh, from this program, by the way, specifically in South Florida, where we have made great strides to reduce homelessness, especially among our heroes, among veterans. And while I agree with many of the investments and the decisions in this bill, we all know that these bills were written under, frankly, unrealistic top-line numbers, decided strictly on a partisan basis by the majority. So let me be clear, despite some of the really good things in this bill, I cannot support this bill at its current spending level. The bill is written, is, is just, again, it spends way too much, with an overall increase of 12 percent above last year and a 17 percent increase for HUD. This enables, for example, $1.1 billion increase for housing choice voucher program in this bill. Now, let me tell you the problem with that. This expansion of rental assistance will multiply over future years and ends up costing the taxpayer tens of billions of dollars in future years. It, in essence, is almost as if it were mandatory spending. Inflation, as you all know, is at a 40-year high. And families in this country are struggling. They're hurting. And contrary to talking points often used by the majority, we cannot address inflation by spending more, which just actually makes the problem worse. Every year, every year, however, this committee shows that we can get our work done once a bipartisan reasonable top-line agreement is in place. And this year, I am confident will be no different. Once we get that agreement, I am eager to work 
with the chairman, Chairman Price, so that this bill can, again, be a capstone to his, frankly, impressive career. Lastly, I'm not going to mention all the names, but I do want to thank the hardworking staff, as Mr. Quigley, the vice chairman, just mentioned, and the chairwoman mentioned before this, the hardworking staff on both sides of the aisle. Uh, Doug Disrude, by the way, who never lets me forget anything. The guy is always on top of every single issue. Alyssa, where are you, Alyssa, who, by the way, is amazing. She keeps us focused and she keeps us on, ta on task. Uh, from my personal staff, Chris Sweet, who's become an expert on planes, trains, and cranes, and everything having to do with infrastructure. And to Christina Monroe and to your entire team, thank you for the amazing job that you do for being accessible and open. Uh, I look forward to uh, this markup. Uh, and with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you. I recognize myself for opening remarks. I want to say a thank you to you, Chairman Quigley, and to Ranking Member diaz Um Again, like all of us, we want to express our condolences to Chairman Price and to the Price family and the loss of a very special woman, Lisa Price, uh, who I got to know very well when they, David and Lisa lived in New Haven, and she served on the New Haven Board of Aldermen uh, with, with my mom for a number of years. Uh, we thank Mr. Price for his years of service. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, quick points. Uh, Mr. Price joined the House Appropriations Committee in, in the 102nd Congress, getting his start on what was then known as the Transportation Subcommittee. And it's only fitting that he conclude his time with the committee as chair of the T-HUD uh, Subcommittee, um, uh, which he has led as chair or ranking member since 2015. Um, he worked tirelessly to create new affordable housing opportunities for seniors, for people with disabilities, improve living conditions in distressed communities through the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, and advance passenger rail projects through the Chrissy Grant Program. He takes seriously the feedback and needs of his constituents and colleagues on both sides of the aisle to create responsible solutions to complex problems. His and Lisa's commitment to this work has made our country and our world a better place. And we know we will dearly miss uh, David when he retires at the end of this Congress. And Vice Chair Quigley, thank you so much for stepping in for him uh, and, and, and taking the reins. Uh, the goals of the programs funded in the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill uh, that we consider today are critical. They ensure every American has access to reliable, efficient transportation and a safe, affordable place to call home. As mentioned, the bill before us advances these goals with $90.9 .9 billion, builds on the uh, 2022 funding package that was passed and the Historic Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in an effort to fight inflation, lower the cost of living for working and middle-class families, create good-paying jobs, American jobs. And as Chairman Price says, the T-HUD bill is an infrastructure bill, and we enact it. We enact one every year. It's not just one every five years or ten years. It's every single year. Um, uh, the, um, what, uh, what I want to do is, I, th th this bill, th th this bill looks at so many efforts, and uh, one of the things that's important uh, for, for me is, comes out of a direct experience that I had growing up, um, and that, that was at the age of nine, my parents and I went home, and we found our, uh, all of our personal goods on the street. We had been evicted, and uh, parents fell on hard times, and they financially struggled all of their lives and went to live with my grandmother till we get back on our feet. A searing experience, and one that really you're left, left with. And it's critical that we do have strong programs in place and that are in this uh, legislation to prevent evic evictions before they happen. This bill provides more than $61.5 billion in critical support for 5 million people through programs such as public housing, housing voucher program, um, addresses the homeless crisis across the country, expands affordable housing with over 140,000 new housing vouchers for individuals experiencing or at risk for homelessness, 5,600 new units for seniors and people with, um, with disabilities. Safety is at the forefront on, on the minds of the people in this country uh, today, uh, and uh, uh, this is why 
Uh, the bill recognizes that living without fear for your family's health and well-being is right for all and not a privilege for a few. It invests in public housing improvements, lead paint, radon re re remediation, the installation of energy and water efficient uh, systems. Uh, safe and affordable housing is not enough if American families cannot also travel safely and efficiently to work, to go to the grocery store or to school. Uh, we make our roads safer with a combined $2 billion in the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and the National Highway Traffic uh, Safety. Um, we, we strengthen and sustain the reliability and resiliency of our transportation and housing infrastructure. We support our most vulnerable. This bill includes over $2.6 billion to cut emissions, improve resiliency, address inequities while creating and sustaining tens of thousands of jobs in construction and related agencies. Um, and, it, it, and, indeed, and indeed works to, to combat the climate crisis uh, and generates economic opportunities for working and middle class families. Um, I finally, proud that the investments we're making through community projects. In this bill, we included an overwhelming majority of requests from Democrats and Republicans, over 1,800 uh, in, uh, in, in, in total, uh, uh, projects that will meet the needs of the, uh, 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 our constituents and our genuinely community uh, projects. Um, before I end, which I will, and I know Mr. Quigley says mercifully, please do, I want to say thank you uh, to the majority side, Christina Monroe, Javier uh, Arriaga, Winnie Chang, Josephine Eckert, Rachel Keyes, Samhita Subramanian, and on the minority side, Doug Disroot and Lisa Erdel. Again, I say a thank you to Chairman Price, to Vice Chair Quigley, and to the Ranking Member Diaz-Balart. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation. I yield back and recognize the Ranking Member, Ms. Granger, for her opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I start, I want to join uh, Mr. Diaz-Balart to pause and recognize the subcommittee chair, Mr. Price. Uh, I know I speak for all of you when I say we're praying for Pre Chairman Price and his family during this very difficult time. Chairman Price has also decided to retire after 30 years of serving North Carolina in Congress. Chairman Price has been a dedicated public servant, both as chair of this subcommittee and the Homeland Security Subcommittee. He will certainly be missed, but I wish him all the best, and I know you do too in his next chapter. <clears throat> now to the bill before us, I want to thank the chair and ranking member for their work on the fiscal year 2023 Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Bill. I also want to acknowledge the committee staff for their efforts. I appreciate that this bill addresses priorities of members on both sides of the aisle. This includes programs that will keep our roads and airways safe and invest in critical assets like ports and airports and highways. Some of the housing investments in the bill will provide crucial support to our most vulnerable citizens. This includes homeless veterans, the elderly, and the disabled. However, I'm deeply concerned by the dramatic funding increases in this bill that expand the reach of the federal government and could add to our record high inflation. The funding in the bill for rail and transit is in addition to the hundreds of billions already provided over the last year outside of the appropriations process. This bill gives HUD programs double-digit percentage increases. While I support programs that help our most vulnerable citizens, we can't afford a dramatic expansion of housing sub subsidies. American families are struggling to make ends meet due to record high inflation. We must find ways to rein in government spending so we don't make the problem worse. As we move forward with this year's appropriation bills, we must agree to set aside controversial policies, retain language from prior years, and get consensus on top line funding levels. Once that framework is in place, I'm confident that the chairman and ranking member can work to modify this bill so that we can responsibly meet the transportation and housing needs of the American people. I thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments on the bill? Ms. Kaptur. I have to say this for the Great Lakes. I want to thank Mr. Quigley uh, for taking the reins today. 
uh, in Mr. Price's absence and express uh, deep, deep condolences to his family uh, on the loss of their beloved, uh, his beloved wife, Lisa, and uh, to all, all the children and grandchildren. Um, Mr. Price has been a really steadfast champion here for the people of North Carolina and the country, and as he prepares to depart the halls of Congress after a remarkable life of service, we thank him and wish him well. Uh, think about his intelligence, his comportment, and his range. I will especially remember him for the work that he has done, which is a credit to this institution, in building uh, global ties to the democracies, the developing democracies of the world through international leadership programs. I'd like to um, also thank the chairman uh, today, uh, Chairman Quigley, for the work that went into this bill for critical investments in infrastructure and housing. And also, I'm so pleased to see the $300 million for port infrastructure development, uh, which is a $68 million increase over the last fiscal year. Uh, we have a shortage of pilots in this country. Uh, many air controllers uh, cannot be found to do the work the nation needs to do. We've got a lot of attention to pay there. But let me just say that America's railroads, uh, airports, and ports by sea are vital links in our supply chain, moving everything from food and consumer goods to agriculture products, manufactured products, construction materials, and energy. And our airport workers, our longshoremen, our railroad workers, uh, labor tirelessly to keep people and freight moving. Uh, the funding in this bill enables ports to upgrade their infrastructure, airports, and railroads, along with what we've passed in the Infrastructure and uh, Jobs Act. And I must say a word about Great Lakes ports, uh, which move 160 million tons of cargo each year. Our largest Great Lakes vessels haul as much cargo as 700 rail cars and 2,800 trucks. Investments in our ports and in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation empower the people who make, build, and grow what makes, builds, and grows America. Uh, I have to say a point also as co-chair of the Auto Caucus, as the automotive industry evolves, its workers must evolve with it. Tomorrow's workers need the training and tools to be ready for these highly skilled careers, and we cannot leave our mechanics and automotive workers behind. This bill, again, in conjunction with the infrastructure and jobs bill, will make a huge difference. Finally, I wanted to thank Chairman Price and Ranking Member diaz Ballard for including funding to help communities redevelop distressed properties and grow their land banks. NeighborWorks is truly an invaluable asset for communities working to build themselves up uh, and forward. And finally, the bill provides significant resources for supportive housing programs. In the cities that I represent and communities, we are so short on housing right now. Grandparents are raising grandchildren, veterans need housing, and neighbors who suffer from mental health and addiction issues would benefit from this bill. Job losses, the opioid epidemic, and rising housing costs hurt working people across America, and this bill is an investment in housing for every community. I thank the chairman again and ranking member for these important investments, and I yield back in support of the bill. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, you're, you're muted. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I am delighted to rise in support of, of this bill. I, I want to take a moment uh, and join uh, my colleagues in uh, condolences for Mr. Price. Um, our thoughts and prayers are with him and I certainly want to thank him uh, for his leadership, his friendship, his advice, his counsel, and his many years of service. Uh, I have uh, learned a great deal uh, and have enjoyed uh, my association with Mr. Price over the years, and we will miss him very deeply, and we certainly share uh, in his loss. Uh, let me thank uh, the chair, the ranking member of the full committee, uh, the vice chair, of the uh, subcommittee, Mr. Quigley, for stepping in uh, uh, in this uh, exigency. Uh, and let me thank all of uh, the, 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 the ranking member of the subcommittee uh, and all of the staff for a tremendous uh, job, a, a very well done work product. Uh, I'm certainly happy that uh, the Transportation, Housing and Urban Development Bill uh, is going to, to pass with such a tremendous investment in our country's infrastructure. But I wanted to highlight just 
four things that were included and expressed my, my strong gratitude. We're the Boys and Girls Clubs of Albany, Georgia. Uh, was able to get uh, $1.85 million to update and renovate uh, their facilities in uh, Macon County, Sumter County, uh, in Southwest Georgia, uh, three counties, uh, which will provide safe, positive, and innovative programs every day for kids when they're out of school. And that is a tremendous investment uh, in the well being and the quality of life. Uh, of our communities in middle and southwest Georgia. In the city of Bainbridge, uh, we were able to fund the infrastructure, the phase two of downrange, uh, downrange industrial park water and wastewater project for one and a half million dollars for the construction and labor costs for a $500,000 gallon uh, water tank, uh, which will uh, serve uh, for uh, job creation and uh, to expand economic development in a very, very uh, depressed region of the state. Uh, and Columbus State University, we were able to fund uh, the STEAM Collaboration Center, which is $4 million for engineering and design work, uh, in addition to start of construction costs for the Columbus State University and the Muskogee County School District uh, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math Collaboration Center in Columbus, Georgia. This will provide opportunities to Columbus State University and the Muskogee County School District students to learn more about robotics, engineering, coding, 3D design, fabrication technologies by creating a space specifically tailored to the needs of educating the community in the field of STEAM. And of course, in Albany, Georgia, the Mount Olive Affordable Housing Rehab Project was funded uh, at uh, 750,000 to help replenish the housing stock that was devastated by Hurricane Michael and two tornadoes. And this funding will enable them to renovate additional affording housing, affordable housing units. And of course, uh, the help for the Port of Savannah, uh, which will really, really enhance economic development throughout the Southeast of the United States uh, and the consolidated rail infrastructure and safety and provisions. Uh, it just does so much for helping us in Georgia, in Middle and Southwest Georgia, in the second congressional district. And I'm very much grateful. I'm thankful for uh, Mr. Price's leadership and the leadership of uh, the full committee uh, and the subcommittee uh, for the hard work. And I yield back with that uh, uh, with ultimate gratitude. Mr. Roper's brother. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I really wanted to speak uh, about Chairman Price. I, uh, I work with him for the many years that I've been here. Uh, he's, a, he's a class act. Uh, he works hard. He's very decent. Uh, and he's always willing to help. And I'm sorry that he lost his beloved wife. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing him when he comes back, because this is, as we know, this is his last time. Um, for, for Congress. Um, the, uh, I also want to thank the uh, ranking member, uh, uh, Diaz Ballard. You know, those two are an example of individuals that respected each other as in leadership. And as a result of that relationship, I think they've done an outstanding job throughout the years uh, in, the, in their roles. Um, thank, uh, also want to thank the uh, Rosa Delora, Kate Granger, for your leadership. And Mike Quigley, you, you stood in there. You're the substitute person. You did, you did a good job. Um, and in the end, you can't forget the staff. The staff makes us. They do such a great job. Thank you for your commitment and your hard hours of work. Um, I was also happy to see the debut 25 billion tranche of funding in the bill to carry out neighborhood rehabilitation in areas with concentrations of vacant properties. The uh, restoring this local assistance has been a pet project of mine for years, maybe because I came from local government as a county executive. Blighted and boarded up row houses in Baltimore are more than just an eyesore. They're unsafe, unsanitary, and unfriendly to communal spirit. Charm cities and residents deserve better. I also appreciate the bill's strong funding for high-speed rail and next-generation train systems. These projects have the potential to create hundreds of thousands of green jobs and revolutionize uh, travel from coast to coast. Lastly, I, I would want to acknowledge the $100 million down payment for the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program. This funding will go a long way 
to connect pedestrian and cyclists to key destinations within and between communities. The Baltimore Greenway Trails Network is a textbook example of the benefits of functional active transportation network. I'm hopeful that additional resources could be dedicated to this program in the future. Uh, once again, I thank everyone who had a hand in drafting this bill, and I yield back. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, too, want to express my deep sympathies to Chairman Price on the loss of his wife, Lisa, and to thank him for his leadership and steadfast commitment to improving the lives of Americans across the country. Whether it's his fight to restore funding to construct new housing for seniors, his support of housing survivors of domestic violence, or his commitment to funding new vouchers to house families in need, Chairman Price has led the fight to invest in our nation's affordable housing supply. Countless American families are better off because of his work, and he will be sorely missed. The bill before us today represents a significant investment in improving the lives of American families. It provides for more than 140,000 new housing vouchers, creates more than 5,600 new affordable housing units for seniors and the disabled, and invests more than $2.6 billion to reduce emissions, increase resiliency, and address historical inequities in transportation and housing programs. Finally, I want to thank Ranking Member Diaz Gallard for the subcom and the subcommittee staff for their hard work putting this bill together. And in particular, I want to thank the staff for their diligence in working through the thousands of community project requests the subcommittee received this year. Taken together, the FY23 T-HUD bill is a robust investment in our nation's housing and transportation and infrastructure. I thank our ranking member for uh, pitch hitting, and I urge my colleagues to support this bill. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. First of all, let me thank you and Ranking Member Granger for getting us to this point where we can discuss this final bill. Um, let me also thank uh, Rep Quigley for pinch hitting for Mr. Price. You've done a great job. Thank you. And to the Ranking Member for working with uh, Mr. Price to bring us to this point with this great bill. Let me extend my condolences um, to Mr. Price and to his entire family on the loss of his partner, his wife. I'm so sorry that he's had this experience. I pray God's uh, continued uh, blessings upon him with peace and comfort. I also want to say that I learned a lot in this um, subcommittee uh, working under uh, Mr. Price's leadership and he will be sorely missed. He is a very kind, compassionate, and brilliant leader, and he is very fair and just and cares about the least among us. I'd like to um, speak very quickly on what I think is a, a really good bill that I plan on definitely voting yes and hope that my colleagues would do the same. This HUD bill will provide $105.4 billion and budgetary, budgetary resources for our nation's infrastructure and transportation systems. And the funding will improve our nation's roads and mass transit systems, create thousands of good paying jobs, substantial jobs, sustainable jobs, help reduce the amount of emissions the transportation sector emits and support new initiatives created by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Under the transportation section of the legislation, the National Infrastructure Investment Program, known as RAISE, will be funded at $775 million. This includes $30 million for grants to assist areas of persistent poverty. These funds are vital for local and regional infrastructure projects that are critical to the local communities but wouldn't necessarily get funding. This bill is also a huge win for our nation's rail network. The Federal Railroad Administration will be funded at $3.8 billion, an increase of over $500 million from last year. This includes a large and welcome increase to the Federal-State Partnership for Intercity Rail at $555 million and $630 million for the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Grants Program. 
These two programs will be a tremendous help in repairing and modernizing our aging rail network. Amtrak will receive $2.3 billion in this bill, of which $88.2 million will be provided for the Northeast Corridor, the busiest stretch of passenger rail in the entire country. All these investments will help connect communities and ensure that they are able to be connected to good paying jobs, good education, and other services that have been literally out of reach. This bill also includes funding for brand new programs in the bipartisan infrastructure law that we passed last year. One that I'm happy to see funded is the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program, a $1 billion program which will be allocated to help reconnect neighborhoods that were broken apart due to racist policies of the 20th century. In the process, these communities will be better connected to the rest of the larger regions they were once isolated from, thus gaining economically and righting the wrongs of the past. Along with transportation, this funding bill makes tremendous investments into housing across the country. The legislation will expand housing choice vouchers to more than 140,000 low-income individuals and families, including those experiencing or at risk of homelessness. This includes survivors of domestic violence and our nation's veterans. Overall, this bill protect, protects housing assistance for more than 4.8 million individuals and families to ensure they continue to remain in safe, stable, and affordable housing. It is vitally important that we remember that housing is a right. At the bare minimum, everyone should be able to have a roof over their head access to clean water and not live in fear of being forced out of their homes. This is, of course, a reality harder to achieve if you are a person of color in this country. But fortunately, the funding and measures in this bill will move us in a more equitable direction. Finally, I'd also like to thank the chairman and the committee staff for the inclusion of funding for my district's community projects. Federal funds will go to help projects in Central Jersey like revitalizing a community recreational area in Trenton, improving road infrastructures in South Brunswick, and e creating memorial dedicating falling, dedication of fallen falling, um, heroes in Manville. I'd also like to again thank the chairman and the ranking member for their work on this incredible bill. I urge all of my colleagues to support it, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks to the staff who worked so hard on, on this bill. Um, like so many of my colleagues, I also want to offer my condolences to Congressman Price and, uh, and on the loss of his uh, wife, Lisa. Um, this is my last appropriations markup uh, that I'll be participating in, and I wanted to take a moment um, also to just express my gratitude for being able to work with uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, and just what an honor it's been to, to be able to serve on this committee under your leadership, Chairwoman DeLauro. Um, you have been um, uh, just a remarkable chair and especially how you brought back community project funding in a way that is bipartisan and in a way that has been so helpful to our communities back home. And, um, uh, you know, I, I just think about when you brought this back, um, I've been on, in Congress for going on 10 years and I'm thinking, gosh, if we had done this for the previous 10 years, just think about the difference that we could be making back home for all of those years. But we're doing that now. Um, this is a way that we can change lives for, for our, commu our communities, for our families. Um, I just want to give a couple examples that are so meaningful to, to the folks that I represent. $500,000, a half a million dollars, to demolish this old, worn down, deteriorating building in downtown Astoria. This is a small town in the most southern county in my congressional district. It will remove a huge barrier and allow for economic development there. One million dollars for a program called the XL Center run by Goodwill. And it will provide adult education in Rockford, Illinois, and give folks a chance to earn their GED um, or participating in targeted career training. Very, very important. One other example I want to give, $4 million for a, a child care uh, center uh, called Skip Along. Um, this will be an early childhood education campus in Rock Island, Illinois. Uh, really providing a much needed, uh, filling a much needed gap. So those are the kind of things that we're able to do back home because of this community project funding. I'm very proud again to be able to serve on, that, serve on this committee. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back to you. Thank you. We will miss you, my friend.
Are there any other members wishing to make general comments? Right here. Hello? Congresswoman Lawrence, I would like to. Okay, Congresswoman Lawrence. I wanna say um, thank you when I, many of you know that prior to coming to Congress, I was a member, I was a mayor of a city and had unique uh, platform of looking at the needs of the communities and looking to the federal government for help and support and served on a TNI commission um, committee when I first came. And so I'm very, um, I'm joining my uh, my colleagues, Ms. Bustos, we're in the Freedom Caucus. We are, uh, this is my last appropriations meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't tell you how defining it has been to serve with some amazing colleagues on both sides of the aisle um, to fight for what we believe in because, you know, I, I spoke before, if you wanna know if a person, where where their priorities are, or what they love, follow the money. And we've been entrusted by the people of this great country to appropriate the funds and to, um, to make sure that we are voting uh, in the right place to send the funding. So I am very excited that this bill um, includes some community uh, investments that I feel very strongly about, and um, I want to outline them. For the record, but I want you all to know that uh, what we do does make a difference. It's frustrating because we get to debate among ourselves more than we do in, on the floor, but. I just want to thank my chairwoman, who is just amazing. Um, your tenacity, your kindness, your inclusion has just been uh, of just a wonderful experience for me. I want to thank my uh, chair, Mr. Cartwright, uh, subcommittee I served on, who's just an amazing leader and uh, a great friend. And um, my chair of the committee is also the chair of the entire appropriations committee. So I wanna thank you all. And uh, as we move forward, let's get the job done. Thank you so much. I'm at home with COVID or else I'll be there mm -hmm. to eat lunch with you. But unfortunately I'm healing and I'm getting better. And uh, we look forward to seeing you as we continue this journey. Thank you. Take care, uh, take care of yourself. And thank you for serving as vice chair of the uh, of the Appropriations Committee, and thank you for your commitment. And you, very few people have the experience of being a mayor. That's where the rubber hits the road. So you know yes. what the needs of the communities are. So thank you so, so much. Seeing no other member wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recognize Mr. Quigley to offer a manager's amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise to offer an amendment. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading is dispensed with. Mr. Quigley is recognized. The amendment contains technical corrections to the bill and non-controversial bill and report language. I have worked on this amendment in a bipartisan way with my friend, Mr. diaz Ballard, and accommodated requests from both sides of the aisle. I ask my colleagues to support the amendment and yield back. Recognize Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I thank Ms., uh, Mr. Quigley and Mr. Price for uh, this good amendment, and I also ask for its favorable consideration. Recognize Mr. Quigley for a minute to close. Uh, no further. We ask a question. Is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, I apologize. Oh, Ms. Henson. Go ahead. I will be brief. Thank you very much to my colleagues for my uh, for hearing me here. Um, just wanted to thank the chairman for including some of my provisions in this manager's amendment, um, and they were very, very important to uh, my district. Um, the Kickstart Transportation Resilience and the Adaptation Centers for Excellence or TRACE program. Um, it includes my language as well on the FAA's treatment of unmanned air, aircraft systems type certification. Um, I think it's a good example of bipartisan productivity in this committee. Um, so I'd like to thank you for including these important provisions. Um, the TRACE program will help our local governments to develop and implement resilient infrastructure projects. This program also partners with our higher education institutions 
to help build communities that can withstand natural disasters and extreme weather. Extreme weather is a challenge we have a lot um, in eastern Iowa. Uh, I know many of my colleagues in this room can think of a natural disaster event in their district. Um, in northeast Iowa, we've had the um, ultimate misfortune of having a couple of very devastating weather events over the past couple of years. Um, in 2020, we had a derecho, which was uh, about 140 mile an hour winds. Um, it destroyed many homes, farms, and livelihoods across the state, the most costly thunderstorm in history. Um, in 2008, we experienced a 500-year uh, flood that wiped out many homes in our communities um, in the sixth largest FEMA disaster declaration ever. So um, this amendment will help to create a bipartisan program designed to take a proactive approach to disaster mitigation by partnering with our communities at a local level to help build resilient surface transportation infrastructure. It does this by, again, prioritizing partnerships with our community and technical colleges, including those in rural areas. And I'd also like to note an important provision in the amendment addressing an inefficiency at the FAA. Uh, the type certification process at the FAA is outdated and slow, and small unmanned aircraft systems or drones are disproportionately impacted by this. Um, in my district, drones are being used to save lives in searches, implement precision agriculture practices, respond to natural disasters, and more. So the language included in this amendment directs the FAA to prioritize the redefinition of small UAS type certifications. So this will help regulations keep pace with the um, continuous innovations that help our local economies, our communities, and agriculture. So thank you again, um, Acting Chairman Quigley, um, Ranking Member diaz Bellart, and of course, um, Chairman Price, and I am sorry, um, for Chairman Price's loss, and I'm grateful for his dedication and leadership to this committee. I've truly enjoyed serving on this subcommittee, and um, thank you again. I urge support of the manager's amendment. Questions on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? aye. Opposed? Say aye. no. Can you the chair? The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Womack is recognized. Thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman. I have an amendment at the desk, and I seek unanimous consent to consider. Without the objection, the reading of the amendment read. is dispensed with. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized. I thank the chairwoman. I rise today to highlight an important provision in my district and many others around the country, in hopes that we can work through this subcommittee and together in Congress uh, to bring some relief. The livestock haulers electronic logging device exemption is a common sense provision exempting livestock haulers from DOT's electronic logging device regulations. This exemption, which has been in this bill for five fiscal years, is supported by members on both sides of the aisle. And I expect a similar agreement here today. Our livestock haulers face unique challenges as they ensure motorist safety while tending to the health and welfare of the animals they're transporting. Current LE or ELD regulations provide little flexibility for those hauling live animals. This can result in sickness and death for the animals being hauled, especially in warm weather. Parts of our country also lack the infrastructure to load and unload livestock along major roadways, forcing livestock haulers to adhere to a one-size-fits-all ELD regulation would be hazardous to both livestock and the motoring public. The back-end 150 air mile exemption included in last year's transportation bill was a huge win to give livestock haulers more flexibility. But this exemption simply gives extra needed cushion during a time when we're seeing supply chain disruptions and driver shortages. We need to include the language included in my amendment to ensure full relief. Finally, the coronavirus epidemic has been a stark reminder that we cannot take our food supply chain for granted. This is the worst possible time to remove this common sense provision from the bill. It is my hope that we can find bipartisan agreement on this exemption and uh, pass this amendment. And with that, I'll uh, yield back. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Womack for introducing this. Uh, we respectfully oppose this uh, amendment. Like the years fiscal 21, 21, 2021, and 2022, House bills, there are no trucking riders in the fiscal year 2023 THUD bill. This is an authorizing issue and should continue to be addressed through that process. The THUD bill has, as written, helps reduce truck driver fatigue by protecting drivers from being asked to work outside of long-standing hours of service rules. The bill also prevents certain industries from overriding the hours of service rules, jeopardizing the safety of truck drivers 
the animals they carry, and the traveling public. This amendment would reduce safety on our high roadways at a time when injuries and fatalities to people involved in large truck crashes continues to increase, with fatalities up 13 percent in 2021. The National Transportation Safety Board has repeatedly cited fatigue as a major contributor to truck crashes and has recommended all trucks and buses be equipped with ELDs. Let me conclude with this. The American Trucking Association, also known as ATA, supports the use of ELDs. In fact, the ATA opposed efforts in 2017 to delay the implementation deadline for ELDs, stating the following in a letter to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Quote, using an electronic logging device to record hours of service is the right thing to do. It is using more accurate, easier to access, and more importantly, more difficult to falsify 21st century technology to demonstrate compliance with HOS rather than an easy to falsify, error prone, and 18th century technology of paper and pencil. And the data shows that these devices are working. According to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the percentage of driver inspections with hours of service violation has decreased significantly since the implementation of the rule. For these reasons, I urge my colleagues to reject the amendment. Mr. diaz Villar. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, let me first start by thanking Mr. Womack for his leadership on this issue. Members of both sides of the aisle support this provision, frankly, because it just makes sense. The provision is narrow. It, uh, it Keeping broader electronic logging devices requirements in place but look, livestock haulers have operated safely, safely under this exemption for five years. This year, however, there is more urgency to restore this provision because of truck drivers' shortages, supply chain uh, challenges, and rising food prices. So I urge a yes vote. I yield back. I strongly support Mr. Womack's amendment to exempt livestock haulers from electronic logging device requirements. This provision has been in the bill for the past five years and it should be continued. This exemption helps our livestock haulers maintain the food supply chain. This is especially important as American families are seeing rising food costs. The language also ensures that livestock are transported in a humane way. Truckers in Texas and across the nation rely on this exemption to do their job safely. I urge a yes vote and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Valadeo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank my colleague from Arkansas for offering this amendment. I think this is an easy one. Uh, when you look at transporting animals, it's a different situation. And uh, the driver doesn't have the luxury of having any truck stop or any side of the road stop that he can do because the animals are going to be stuck in the trailer uh, dealing with whatever the weather conditions are. So for the, um, for the sake of the animals, I think this is something we should all support. And I uh, ask for a high vote. Thank you. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There's no further debate. The gentleman from Arkansas is recognized to close. I, I thank the chairwoman. And uh, look, it's, it's pretty common sense. Uh, we've had bipartisan agreement on it in the past. With all due respect to uh, uh, the acting or ranking member here to, or the acting chairman today, uh, let's, uh, let's get this provision in the bill. And, uh, and I'll uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Question? Offered by the gentleman from Arkansas. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Oh. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Diaz Ballard. No. Yes. That's right. Yes. For what purpose is the gentleman rise? I have an amendment on the desk, Madam Chairman. I ask uh, unanimous consent to. Have without, it. without objection, Thank the you. reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Madam Chairman, this amendment clarifies congressional intent regarding a provision in the Disaster Response and Recovery Act, which passed in 2018. The provision instructed HUD uh, not to treat community development block grants, uh, disaster recovery grants, as duplicative. Uh, or duplicating small business administration loans. This provision enjoyed bipartisan support, actually. Um, now, even though it became law, unfortunately, HUD imposed an income test on individuals applying for relief, along with the requirements to provide hardship, something that was not in the law. These measures, again, 
I'm sure were well intended, but they imposed bureaucratic requirements on grantees that have left many families without needed relief. This amendment simply clarifies congressional intent and, and, and provides states with flexibility to implement uh, a duplication of benefits authorities without excessive bureaucratic uh, hurdles. Um, key is that this amendment would require no new funds. Uh, it would simply allow states to release dollars to qualifying disaster victims who would have otherwise been eligible for CDBG DR funds. And so again, as I said before, a similar amendment was approved unanimously by the TNI earlier this month. I've been, uh, Mr. Quigley and I have had multiple conversations on, on this issue. Um, and I know that there are some concerns that he has, um, but I'd like to, in essence, find out if he's had an opportunity to, uh, to look at it. I, I yield back. No. Uh, is it, my understanding is the intention to uh, withdraw this? Make sure we're on the same. If I may, Madam Chair, if, if, if the concern remains, because I can count votes, uh, then, uh, then I would respectfully ask to withdraw it, uh, and but continue to work with uh, with the chairman if that's uh, if that's something he'd be willing to do. No, well, we'd be delighted to continue to work with you on this issue, and I, and I appreciate your conversations and your interest on this issue. And as I uh, look, as I learned in Chicago politics, uh, if you have a deal and understanding, quit talking, and I, I yield back. As I, as do I. Thank you. I withdraw. Yes, ask to withdraw. Without objection. Are there further amendments? Ms. Herrera Butler is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. I ask unanimous consent to seek it. <coughs> uh, it consider as read. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And today I rise in support of my amendment to halt uh, Oregon's misguided plan to place congestion pricing tolling on I-5 and I-205 bridges. And why, you might ask, because I'm the congresswoman from Southwest Washington. Uh, it's because the folks in my district uh, right on the edge there, use both of those bridges. In fact, that's the only bridge they can use oftentimes to access, uh, for example, ch especially children's hospitals. Um, it's the one that's nearest to us. Roughly 75,000 Washington residents, many who reside in my district, work in Oregon and would be affected by Oregon's congestion pricing tolling scheme. And the I-205 and the I-5 bridges are the only routes for Washington commuters to cross the river into Oregon. And there are simply no other options. And here's the reality, Oregon's tolling plan and congestion pricing scheme would disproportionately harm Southwest Washington commuters or folks who aren't maybe even just commuting for work, like I mentioned, people who have to go there for specialty health care, cancer care, other issues. The tolling proposal uh, proposals seem to expressly target Southwest Washington residents while providing them with few, if any, benefits. These are not tolls designed to, to benefit the roadway they're driving on, it, it, which would make sense. Um, the people of Southwest Washington actually would be used as a piggy bank for Oregon's projects. This money would be spent elsewhere in the state on other uh, plans that these folks who are driving, so it's not a user fee, it's a straight, it's essentially a straight tax and it's on a federal highway. So my amendment um, is seeking to protect those who would be affected most hardworking residents who don't have the luxury of telling their boss when they're going to commute. These are not the people who own necessarily the companies. These are the people who have to show up on time at rush hour when their boss says, come or you lose your job. These are electricians. These are plumbers. These are service folks who travel back and forth to serve even the other side of the river. They're the ones who are going to pay the price. People who don't get to live in an, close to the metro area who have to live two hours or an hour north. Uh, just because of the cost of, 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 of homes. So this is who it's going to target, blue-collar families. And it bothers me that, they again, they can't choose when the shop opens or when the school bell rings. They just have to show up. So this should not be a partisan dispute. I will continue to defend Southwest Washington commuters uh, against any unfair tolling scheme that the state of Oregon may propose for I-5 and I-205 bridges. This money would, uh, or this bill, this is simply a, a withholding of that money until we come up with a plan that is agreed upon by both sides of the river. And with that, I, I urge my uh, colleagues' support. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in respectful opposition to this amendment. This amendment would prohibit the use of any new tolling on highways and bridges across the state of Oregon. It would preempt the state's authority to make decisions on this issue at the local level where the authority currently resides. 
Furthermore, the authority for states to impose tolls on federal aid highways under certain circumstances reside in authorizing statutes. This is an authorizing issue and outside the jurisdiction of this committee and it should be addressed to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Prohibiting any state from exercising its authority to toll roadways is outside the purview of the federal government and I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. When I rise in support of the amendment, Ms. Herrera, Herrera Butler has been working ferociously on this issue for her constituents for quite a long time now, and she raises an issue of basic fairness, and I frankly applaud her for looking out for her constituents. She does not let any of us forget this issue. Uh, I urge a, a yes vote and a yield back. Are there other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? If none, the gentlewoman is recognized to close. I, I think the chair and I just would reiterate that it, it, this is an issue of, of tax, it's essentially would be taxation without representation. Part of the reason the Oregon legislature crafted their language this way was because they knew they'd be taxing, you know, my 75,000 or so commuters and that those commuters would have no political recourse to say to their, to their, you know, their elected representatives have no ability at the local level to push back on this. So I would res respectfully disagree that the federal government has a responsibility to step in when it comes to interstate issues like this um, and make sure that all taxpayers are treated equally and that certain taxpayers are not essentially held as piggy banks for the whims of lawmakers who have no accountability. And with that, I, I yield back. Question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Washington. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no, no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The amendment is not adopted. Further amendments? Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk, Reschenthaler Amendment Number 1, and I'd ask for unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Mm -hmm. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment, which is identical to the one I offered last year, would prohibit Pennsylvania from utilizing federal funding to toll existing roads and bridges on, federal, on the federal highway system that are not currently tolled. I think it's important to emphasize right from the beginning, we're talking about not tolling existing roads or bridges on, fe on federal highways that are not currently tolled. Very limited scope. <clears throat> last year, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation proposed tolling nine existing bridges across the Commonwealth. These tolls would cost the average commuter an additional $1,000 per year. It was moved through the process without legislative or community input. Well I'm, well, I'm very glad that the Commonwealth Court just today blocked PennDOT's plan. It's still very possible that the governor will appeal this or that he will propose a similar plan. Now, thanks to the Biden administration's war on domestic energy, Americans are spending between $100 and $250 extra per month on gas. Given these out of control fuel costs, given Biden inflation hitting 8.6%, this is quite possibly the absolute worst time for Pennsylvania to levy a new tax on workers and families. And let's be very clear and very honest about something. This is nothing more than a new tax on the Republican base. This tax, targets blue collar workers. If you shower after work, if you have to drive to a job site, this affects you. It does not affect those in the Zoom class that have the luxury of staying at home on Zoom all day. This would also place additional burdens on America's small businesses, which already are struggling with historic inflation and a supply um, chain crisis. So I recognize the need to find us sustainable solution and a sustainable funding mechanism to fix Pennsylvania's roads and bridges. Here, PennDOT failed to consider stakeholder input, they failed to work with the state legislature, and they failed in crafting this disastrous proposal. Taxing Pennsylvanians in the form of new tolls is not the answer. I'd urge a yes vote on my amendment, I yield back. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I rise in opposition to this amendment. Uh, I believe the gentleman is saying that ask not for whom the toll tolls, it tolls for his constituents. I get that. 
but this amendment would prohibit the use of any new tolling on highways and bridges across the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It would preempt the Commonwealth's authority to make decisions on this issue at the local level, level where again the authority lies. Furthermore, the authority for states to impose tolls on federal aid highways under these circumstances reside in authorizing statutes. This again is an authorizing issue outside the jurisdiction of this committee and again should be addressed to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Prohibiting any state from exercising its authority to toll roadways is outside the purview of the federal government and a top-down approach without regard for local, regional, and state decision making. I respectfully urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Chairman yields back. Mr. Diaz Blard. Madam Chairman, thank you. I rise in support of Mr. Rushenthaler's amendment. Look, this gentleman has listened to his constituents and he speaks with great authority and passion and knowledge on this issue. His constituents, frankly, as he mentioned, do not need unfair and unnecessary tolls, especially at this time when gas, gas prices are, frankly, really hitting hard and hurting American families. So I urge a yes vote and I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There is no further debate. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Just quickly in closing, this amendment would only affect Pennsylvania. And it would ensure that at a time when gas prices are out of control and other costs are out of, out of control, that PennDOT cannot tax blue collar workers, seniors on a fixed income, and families that are struggling to make ends meet. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. I yield back. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, all, right. those, opposed, say, all those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. A roll call has been requested. All those in favor, sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call. Oh, the roll. I have to go Mr. With the team. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amaday. Yes. Mr. Amaday votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. <coughs> Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herr Butler. Ms. Herr Butler votes aye. Mrs. Henson. Mrs. Henson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roy Allard. Ms. Roy Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mrs. Torres. Torres is no. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. 
Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Quayer. Mr. Quayer votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Clerk will tally. On this vote, the yeas are 24, the nays are 32, and the amendment is not adopted. Further amendments? Mr. Garcia. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. I ask uh, unanimous consent for the Without reading Without objection, the, the dispense with the Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a straightforward amendment uh, that uh, is a uh, repeat of one I submitted last year. This prevents any funding in this act uh, from being used for California's high-speed rail. Uh, look, I'm not anti-trains. I think trains have a purpose in certain applications in certain areas, uh, like the metropolitan areas of uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, Metro Rail, BART, these, uh, these lines need to be expanded. This high-speed rail is different. It has really no destination. It's got no mission. It's got no ridership. It's got no vision. Uh, I'm not anti-union. I'm not anti-worker. Uh, if we're going to be spending this type of money, we should be doing it on meaningful infrastructure uh, uh, programs that are desperately needed in California that actually add capacity and decompress traffic uh, in, the, in the metropolitan areas. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't even a high-speed rail. This is a, what I call Franken rail. It doesn't know what it is. It's, it's a conglomeration of disparate parts. Some go fast, some go slow. Uh, it's meandering through the state without any uh, you know, awareness to what its destination actually is. It's going through these, uh, these towns and cities just scaring the hell out of the citizens. Uh, and it's going to end up uh, uh, basically consuming its master in the form of cost overruns and, and effectively not uh, operating the way it was advertised. Uh, this program was expected to cost uh, taxpayers $33 billion when it was initially proposed, and now they're saying it's going to be $105 billion. Uh, with just California taxpayers, that equates to roughly $5,000 per taxpayer on the hook to complete this uh, Franken rail. Uh, and I just don't want the federal government getting involved in this. We shouldn't be subsidizing this program, not at any level of government, and certainly not federal taxpayer money. Um, and I uh, uh, just believe that this is a, a, a problem. I'm not anti-train. I'm not anti-worker. I am anti-fraud, waste, and abuse, and I'm anti-bad ideas. Uh, and that's what this is. Um, so I urge uh, support to uh, prevent uh, federal uh, taxpayer money in this act from being used to support the high-speed rail. Uh, we've got to do what's right. We can spend this money on meaningful projects, uh, get people back to work, and uh, solve the infrastructure problems in California through other more meaningful projects. And with that, I urge support. I yield back. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. The bill before us does not provide funding for the California High-Speed Rail Project. In fact, the bill and report make no reference to this project. Similarly, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act does not provide funding for the California High-Speed Rail Project or any other individual project, although it should. The bill and the IIJA simply provide robust funding for competitive grant programs, something we have all expressed support for as our communities work to improve their infrastructure. These programs support projects that expand intercity passenger rail, improve safety at high 
highway, uh, highway rail grade crossings, and yes, assist with the planning, development, final design, and construction of high-speed rail projects. I support high-speed rail, which can reduce congestion, improve connectivity, while I'm providing a climate-friendly transportation alternative. And I support the funding included in this bill and other bills that could help advance high-speed rail projects across the country. This amendment simply singles out one project and prevents it from even having a chance to compete. I urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment. Mr. diaz Villar. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. I rise in strong support of Mr. Garcia's amendment. Well, we've had this debate before in this committee, but this year, frankly, the stakes are even higher. DLT has a staggering $66 billion for passenger rail, passenger rail through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So the pressures will be great to misdirect these funds to a failed, the failed, uh, California high-speed rail project. Look, I support, strongly support sensible investments in passenger rail, like Mr. Garcia does, but only where those investments make sense and the money isn't totally wasted. You know, California could swallow up these funds and take from other real high priorities, like the Northeast Corridor or freight capacity expansion or even potentially even safety. So let's not double down on a known failure Instead, frankly, we should be supporting real infrastructure for projects that actually work. This is not one of those. So I would urge a yes vote. I yield back. Are there any other members who wish to speak on this? Ms. Lee of California. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I rise to oppose this amendment and associate myself with the remarks of uh, Chairman Quigley. Uh, but I want to speak to the California High Speed Rail Project very briefly. Uh, I wish it were in this bill but it's not. The California High Speed Rail Project was endorsed by voters of my state and seeks to bring our transportation options simply in line with what people in other countries have done for decades. This project is a necessary investment to reduce congestion as well as to support our transition to a green economy. Now, the California High Speed Rail Authority is seeking $1.3 billion in federal funding, not as a directive, but as a federal competitive grant. California is pursuing a project that the voters of California choose, and they are seeking to gain federal funds on the merits through a regular, transparent, and competitive process. This committee should not short-circuit that process. Let this program, like so many in your states, stand on its merits. California high-speed rail won't get built in a day. The United States is decades, and mind you, decades behind other countries in building a modern passenger rail network. And I am confident that as this project continues, it will be delivering benefits to Californians for decades to come and providing a template for the whole nation. So I urge my colleagues to oppose the Garcia Amendment, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Madam Chair, I do. Mrs. Torres. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong opposition of this ill-conceived amendment targeting my home state of California. I want to pick up where Vice Chair Quigley left off. This amendment interferes with the competitive grant process. I'm sure that my colleagues would not um, would not want uh, California members to interfere with the competitive processes for projects in their districts. And while entities in California are certainly eligible to apply for competitive grants funded in this bill or any other bill, this bill does not specific, specify funds for the California High Speed Rail Project. It does not compel the California High Speed Rail Authority or any other eligible entity to apply for funding, nor does it require the Department of Transportation to fund this project or any other project. The competitive grant process is the same for all projects in our districts. The Department of Transportation issues a Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO. NOFO, <clears throat> eligible applicants submit applications for projects. The department evaluates all applications received, and then the department decides which projects to fund based on the legal requirements of the authorized grant programs and the information included in the NOFO. 
This is a fair and equitable process where the Department of Transportation has the final say on which projects are ultimately awarded funding. This is how it always works for competitive grants programs. That's why they are called competitive grant programs and how this is how it should continue to work. If my colleagues, my Republican colleagues don't like the California high speed rail, maybe they should stop gumming up their processes in the court system. I urge all my colleagues to vote against this ill-conceived amendment and support uh, this competitive grant process as it stands currently, and I yield back. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yeah, I stand by, behind uh, member uh, Norma Torres, and I also stand behind a ranking member uh, Diaz Ballard. Uh, these projects that are involved, some are some great projects, uh, some they've been around for 10 years going through the bureaucratic process, and they have good leadership. And, you know, there's, there's one thing to say, I'm conservative, I'm not going to spend anything, but you have to keep moving ahead. Uh, you have to have good infrastructure. And these, these projects that are out there now uh, are, are good because I can tell you, we're even behind Europe when it comes to rail. And we have got to change that, especially on the East Coast. So I would hope that we would all look at this and see what happens. It also will create, any project like this will create thousands and thousands of jobs, which will put our country in a good position there. All right. Any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? No further to debate. The gentleman is, is recognized to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I actually agree with a lot of what uh, uh, Chairman Quigley mentioned. It isn't specifically called out in this act, for sure. Uh, to that end, this should just be sleeves from the vest, and I am singling out a specific project, and uh, I am pro-infrastructure. I think all good projects that, that have meaningful impacts on our communities and, and improve, especially in Southern California, our traffic uh, should be funded, and we should be supporting those wholeheartedly. This is not one of those. This is a, this is a, a dying project that when the voters signed up for this and approved this in California, it was one-third of the estimated cost that it is right now, and it was about half of the time it was going to be uh, to, uh, to, to complete. So, so no, I don't agree that we should just keep throwing good money after bad. In, a, in an environment where we have record high inflation, record high debt now of $30 trillion at the federal level, we need to be paying attention to what the states are doing. And it does require sometimes to go in a little deeper than we would like to. So is there a fair and open competition uh, process to these grants? Yes. Uh, and I'm hopeful that in the end the Department of Transportation recognizes this as the unmitigated disaster that it is and they don't uh, fulfill the wishes of the uh, Sacramento politicians uh, trying to close on a pipe dream that should have never been imagined in the beginning. So uh, I urge uh, support. I urge that we not get on board this crazy train with Sacramento and I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, those aye. All those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, no. the, the no's have it. The amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Diaz Ballard is recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, Ch Madam Chairwoman, I have an amendment on the desk. You, you move uh, unanimous consent that the reading be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam Chairman, in my open remark, I mentioned that this bill can be a capstone to Mr. Uh, David Price's, Chairman Price's career. If you look at this bill and, and many others, his work, uh, his mark uh, will be felt for many, many years. And there's so many issues that he's been involved with. There's so many stories that, as one who's been working with him now again for eight years, as I mentioned before, that I could tell you about just how he has been instrumental in, in frankly, developing good policy, good programs, and good bills. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that, that his legacy was there in this bill in a way that we actually could see and that we would always remember. Uh, he and I have been working together on dealing with, among the issues, uh, issues with, 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 with mobile homes and, and how, you know, the challenges that people are facing as property prices are going up and, and mobile homes are being sold, et cetera. And 
that with also the challenges of affordable housing, et cetera. I don't want to get into the details, but what this amendment does, so thank you for allowing me to say all that. It changes the name of a new program to revitalize mobile home parks and help provide home ownership opportunities. Um, and so what we want to do is change that name or name that to the manufacturing, change the name of the Manufactured Housing Improvement and Financing Program to, the amendment just changes the name to the Preservation and Reinvestment Initiative for Community Enhancements. That spells price. Uh, I think it's a worthwhile reminder to all of us uh, from now on of what he has meant to this committee, particularly to this area when you're looking at T-HUD. Uh, for me, it's been a privilege to get to know him, to work with him. Uh, I think this is a program uh, that uh, I'm sure he would be happy to have his name associated with. Uh, by the way, it's a $500 million program with a with a $50 million other set aside, uh, something that, again, he and I worked on. And so uh, without further ado, I would love if the member of this committee uh, would change the name. It just happens to be that the new name is Price for a friend and a colleague and somebody that I know all of us respect and greatly admire. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong support of this amendment as the ranking member shared. Chairman Price has been a critical part of the House Appropriations Committee for countless markups, floor debates, and late night conference negotiation. He joined the committee in the 102nd Congress back in 1991. One of his first subcommittee assignments was the Transportation Subcommittee. Now, 31 years later, at the end of this year, Mr. Price will depart the committee as chairman of the Transportation and Housing and Urban Development Subcommittee. His leadership on this bill and this committee is not only a reflection of his commitment to the American people and to our nation's transportation and housing, but also a testament to those supporting him back in his district. He worked to increase funding to construct new affordable housing units for seniors and people with disabilities. He championed the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative helping it reach historic funding levels in 2022 so more communities can work to transform underserved neighborhoods. On the transportation side, he worked diligently to support passenger rail with the goal of getting the S-Line corridor from Raleigh to Richmond developed. More recently, he dove into a new issue, manufactured housing, home to more than 20 million low-income and working families across America. Like the true professor we know him to be, Chairman Price did the research, held a hearing, and crafted the Manufactured Housing Improvement Financing Program. It is only fitting to name this program after Chairman Price, so I want to thank the ranking member for offering this amendment. It's pretty cool. We miss having Chairman Price here with us today. We are thinking of him as family during this difficult time and extend our support to him, and I yield back. Are there any other me members wishing to be heard on the amendment? No further debate. The gentleman is recognized to close. I think we all know that this is a great name for a program named after somebody who seriously, seriously deserves it. I yield back. Beautiful. Question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. Um, is there any further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio for a motion, and I ask for your support on this bill. Madam Chair, I move to favorably report the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Related Agencies Appropriations Act 2023 to the House. Question is on the motion. I, let me just mention one, one more thing. We do have the last piece of business is we have to vote on the 302B allocations. We're going to move fast, Mr. Calvert, so you can make your plane, okay? <laughs> Question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. This is on the bill. Aye. Oh, aye. 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 Those opposed? No. 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 <laughs> the opinion? The ayes have it. On that, it's a recorded vote. All those in favor, raise your hand. Sufficient number. Recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar votes aye. Mr. Amade. No. Mr. Amade votes no. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes aye. Mr. Calvert. No. 
Mr. Calvert votes no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no, sir, Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Christ. Absolutely yes. Mr. Christ votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Ms. DeLauro. Aye. Ms. DeLauro votes aye. Mr. diaz Bellart. No. Mr. diaz Bellart votes no. Mr. Espayat. Aye. Mr. Espayat votes aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman votes no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes aye. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger votes no. Mr. Harder. Aye. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes no. Mr. Joyce. Ms. Captor. No. Uh, Mr. Joyce votes no. Ms. Captor. A big aye. Ms. Captor votes aye. Mr. Kilmer. Yeah. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Aye. Mrs. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Lee of California. Aye. Ms. Lee of California votes aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes aye. Ms. Letlow. Aye. Ms. Letlow votes no. Ms. McCullum. McCullum votes aye. Ms. McCullum votes aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. Ms. Meng votes aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes no. Mr. Palazzo. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree votes aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan votes aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Ruther Mr. Rutherford votes no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan votes aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes no. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres votes aye. Mr. Trone. Aye. Mr. Trone votes aye. Ms. Underwood. Aye. Ms. Underwood votes aye. Mr. Valadeo. Aye. Mr. Valadeo votes no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes no. Are we missing anything? Palazzo votes yes. Mr. Palazzo, I mean, no. Mr. Palazzo oh, votes no. Palazzo. No. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Okay, while the clerk is tallying here, uh, just two or three items. First of all, happy 4th of July to ev everyone. I just want you to know that in uh, 15 days, from June 15th to today, June 30th, we did 12 subcommittee markups, 12 full committee markups, and in the words of that philosopher, Dora the Explorer, we did it uh, and, and got it done. But we head into July, and I will just point you in the direction of the screen with uh, Betty Davis from the movie All About Eve, where she says, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy ride, and that's what July is going to be. Uh, all about. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you, uh, for the most extraordinary work that you have done uh, to get us through all of the appropriations bills. Thank you. And with that, the yeas are 32 and the nays are 24, and the uh, bill is um, uh, adopted. A last order of business, the approval. Oh, no, unanimous consent. For the I have to do that, in, uh, technical and conforming changes. Seeing no objections, so ordered. Mr. Diaz Villar. Madam Chair, I ask for three days for the minority to file views. With, uh, without objection. Last order of business approving the revised sub -all allocations for fiscal year 2023. There are no substantive changes in these revised sub allocations. They reflect the funding recommendations in the 12 bills we approved over the past couple of weeks. Proud of the investments, as I said before, we track uh, these allocations in total that track to the deeming resolution the House passed earlier this month, we secured transformative federal investments that help fight inflation, lower the cost of living, create jobs, support working families. I urge my colleagues to support them. Representative Granger. Madam Chair, 
Thank you for yielding. The revised allocations presented today do not change the spending levels that were adapt adopted on a party line vote last week. Because there is no substantive changes, I must once again oppose them. It is unacceptable to members on my side of the aisle to underfund our national defense while giving significant increases to the same social programs that received trillions of dollars over the last year. I hope we can find common ground as these bills move to the floor. We will need to restore important language from prior bills, agree to remove controversial policy writers and set responsible funding levels so that bills can get to the president's desk and be signed into law. I urge a no vote and yield back my time. Does any other member wish to, be, uh, to speak on the revised allocations? Are there any amendments to the report? If there are no amendments, no further discussion, I recognize Ms. Kaptur for a motion to approve the revised 302B allocations. Madam Chair, I move that the committee approve the report on the revised 302B allocations and suballocations for fiscal year 2023. Okay. Uh, I also ask that members voting remotely through Zoom remain on the platform, remain visible until the final vote result is announced. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of no. the chair. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That's it. Okay. Sufficient. <laughs> Woo! All right. Okay. Here we go. I, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the report. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Okay, technical changes, three days. Good. Done.